I am a huge soccer fan, have been for my entire life. I have fond memories of playing the game while growing up, excluding the one or two times I got kicked in the face with the ball directly off the kickoff. But even to this day, I still get a rush of adrenaline every time the whistle blows, whether it's a game I'm playing in or not. Over the years, you could say I've learned the primitives of the game. Passing, shooting, dribbling, defending, doing skill moves. Each concept is not very useful on its own, but piece them together and you've got a player's skill set. In a similar way, security for your Firebase app is composed of a bunch of different primitives or course concepts that individually don't do much, but when you compose them together, you can form very powerful rules and, and protect your data even for complex applications. And today, I'm gonna be your coach, so to speak, and I'll train you on these concepts. And if you haven't already guessed it, I'll be using the help of the sport that I love. My name is Jacob Wenger, and I've been on the Firebase team for over two years now, back since its startup days. So you could say I've become a bit of an expert on the real-time database. I'm hoping to share that knowledge with you today. And I know it's early, and I know I'm talking about security, a traditionally boring subject, so I thought I'd spice it up a little bit, and instead of just talking about the key to Firebase security, we'll talk about the key to Firebase security as told with emojis. So you'll be seeing a lot of that over the next half hour. Yesterday, you heard all about the next generation of Firebase and how Firebase is now a lot more than just a real-time database. It is a suite of integrated products to help you develop your app, grow your user base, and earn money. Today, I'm gonna bridge the gap a little bit between the old and the new world and talk to you about security in your Firebase apps across two different products. The first is the Firebase real-time database. This is the old, reliable, battle-tested, real-time database that excels at syncing arbitrary JSON data, such as a team schedule or the league standings. The second product is the brand shiny new Firebase storage. You'll use this to store, to store files, like video highlights from last night's match, or an audio clip of an announcer, a Spanish announcer screaming, "Go!" I do not know how they, they hold that for so long. I definitely could not do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in, order to, uh, in order to explain Firebase security, I first need to tell you about what exactly do I mean by security. The way I actually see it is that there are two sides of the security coin. On the one side, you have authentication, and on the other side, you have authorization. What exactly do these terms mean? Authentication is the process of verifying users are who they actually say they are. So this user is Sarah, and this user is Billy. Authorization, on the other hand, is the process of determining who has access to what data. So maybe Sarah has a ticket to the match and is going to be able to get in, whereas Billy is empty-handed and is going to be stuck watching the game from the pub. Traditionally, implementing both sides of the authentication, both sides of security took a lot of work. You had to manage your own servers, you had to set up your own databases, and you had to write a bunch of custom server-side code to actually protect your users. Thankfully, Firebase makes this really simple because we have products that do this out of the box. On the authentication side, we have a product called Firebase Authentication, very original, I know. Uh, but Firebase Authentication allows you to verify your users in a bunch of different ways. We have anonymous verification, which allows you to assign a random UID, a user, unique identifier, to every user. We have email password authentication, which allows you to verify a user using a combination of email and password. Then there's OAuth authentication, which uses a third-party provider, like Facebook or Google, to verify users on your behalf saving you a ton of time and a ton of anguish. Finally, there's custom authentication. When you need something a little extra or custom, and, or you need to integrate with an existing auth solution. I won't be focusing very much on Firebase authentication during this talk today, but if you're interested in it, tomorrow at 1 p.m. on this stage, there's a talk called Best Practices for a Great Sign-In Experience. And so if you want to learn more about the Firebase auth product, definitely go and check that out. What I will be focusing on today, though, is authorization. And the way we do authorization in Firebase is we use what we call Firebase rules for both the real-time database and for Firebase storage. 
I think the best way to learn this stuff is to actually go through a ton of different examples. And we're going to start with learning the primitives of the Firebase real-time database rules language. Before we can actually protect data, we need to know what data we're going to protect. So kicking things off, we'll start with some example data for a real-time database. The real-time database stores JSON data. So here we have an empty JSON object so far. We can go ahead and say, let's put a top-level games node. And this is where we're going to store all of the game information, including the schedule for the current team. Within the games node, we're going to have a bunch of random IDs, which we call push IDs in the Firebase real-time database. And these are going to uniquely identify every game in our list. So within each game, we'll have a bunch of different content about that game. We'll have the date of the game, who the opponent is, and whether or not the game is open to the public. There'll also be a game content node. And this is the data that we actually want to protect to ticketed customers only. So people who actually have bought ticket to the game should be able to see stuff in game content. Lastly, we'll have a tickets node. And this is just going to be a list of users who have tickets to the current game. So the best place to start with security is with what the defaults are. Traditionally, our default rules looked a little bit like this. Just like the data you store in your real-time database, your rules are also a JSON object. It always has a top-level rules node. And then within that, by default, we have read true, write true. So this is the first primitive that we're going to learn, is dot read and dot write. Dot read determines who has read access, and dot write determines who has write access. So as I'm sure you can tell from this, this means everyone and anyone has access to all of your data, both to read it and to write it. This is pretty great for getting started, because you can go ahead and create a new Firebase database, and then start writing and reading from it right away. But it also allows people like this guy, a malicious attacker, to steal all of your data. How would they do that? They can easily circumvent them by writing just a few lines of code. So this is using the, the brand new Firebase 3.0 SDK. And what we're going to do, we used, for those who are familiar with the real-time database, you used to do new Firebase and pass your database URL. Now you're going to go ahead and call firebase.initializeapp. You pass your API key, an auth domain to do authentication, and the database URL, which is where you're going to store your data. Once you have an instance of an app, you can get a database instance and then call .ref on that. And that's actually going to give you a reference, a pointer to your data stored in your Firebase real-time database. We won't actually pull any data down yet, but we can go ahead and do that by doing a once value. This essentially is going to do a get on our data. This will return a promise fulfilled with the snapshot of that data. This is an immutable snapshot, and we can extract the data from that by calling .val on the snapshot. And now I have taken all of your data. So this is definitely not great. So as of yesterday, we've actually updated what our default rules are when you create a new Firebase real-time database. So we still have the rules node. And instead of read true, write true, we're going to see off does not equal null for both of those. So this is the next concept, this off variable. This is a top-level variable populated by the rules language itself. And it, it, it represents the authentication state of the client making the request. So if I'm making a request from a laptop that is not authenticated with Firebase, this auth variable will be null, and I will not be able to read or write any data. If I'm making it from a phone that is authenticated with Facebook, the auth variable will not be null, and it'll actually contain a UID, which is a unique identifier for that user. Every time that specific user signs them in via Facebook, they will be given the same UID. And if I'm authenticated, I'll go ahead and be able to read. So this is better because, by default, no authentication providers are enabled for your Firebase database when you create it. So by default, no one can read or write data, and you actually need to add, uh, add authentication. So let's say you want to add anonymous authentication, which is a common use case for many apps. And now a guy who can see these rules says, hey, you know, I can, I can work with this, because they're still a bit too open. Let's look at, our, look at some code again. We'll initialize the app in the same exact way. And now we'll just call auth.signin anonymously. So now we will be authenticated. And any request we make from this client will have a non-null auth variable in the rules. So we go ahead, and after that promise is fulfilled, we will get a reference to our root of our database. We will this time remove all of the data. And 
then we'll log that the data was removed. So this is kind of terrifying, um, and not what we want by the time we release our application to production. So I know exactly what you're thinking. You're saying, this is really easy, Jacob. Like, all you need to do is lock this thing down. And so we can go ahead and do that. We can say, let's go ahead and just say, no one can read and no one can write anything at all. 100 points. My app is entirely secure. No one is going to be touching any of my data. And this is, this is very true, but it also kind of renders your app pointless, kind of like the face massage emoji, which I legitimately have never had a reason to use before, I guess until today. Before I move on beyond this obviously pointless uh, rule set, I want to introduce an important concept. And that is that in the rules language, doing read and write false is equivalent to not putting those rules at all. And the default value is actually false. So this is a kind of a contrived example, but these two rule sets are actually the same. And this will come into play in some of our later examples. So we don't want to just not allow anyone to read or write. So let's say we'll grant public access to all of the games node. How can we actually do that? We'll go ahead and create a games node within our rules, and then we'll just say read true. So now everyone can read all of the different games and see the entire schedule. This is not exactly what we want, because we know that some games we want to have only ticketed customers or only people who are authenticated, and in other games we, we, we allow them to be public. So we can go ahead and make a semi-public schedule by, instead of just doing read true, actually specifying the game ID for every single game. And for the top game, we know the is public flag is set to true, so we'll just put read true. And for the other game, we know that it's not public, so we need to be authenticated. So this, has, this works, although it has a couple issues. The first is that this read true rule is hard coded. And the only reason we put it read true is because we know the data we started with, the is public field, was actually set to true. But what we want to look at is we actually want to look at that is public field itself and use that existing data to determine our rule. Thankfully, we can go ahead and do this by uh, changing both of these rules to the same rule. And the rule is going to say, am I authenticated or is the is public field set to true? So we start with our auth does not equal null. And then we say, we use this data variable. And this is another top level variable like auth, which represents the existing data in your Firebase real time database. So we say at the current location, which is games slash that long UID, is the is public child set? And is its value true? If so, allow the people, allow anyone to read this node. So this is getting us closer, but we still have another problem. Uh, these game IDs are randomly generated push IDs, and we actually won't know what they are before our app is sent to production, so we can't hard code them into our rules. And also, we don't want to have to specify the same rule over and over for all these different games. So we can go ahead and get rid of all of that and replace them with what we call wildcard locations. That's what this dollar represents. So dollar game ID is a wildcard character, kind of like a variable, that will match all strings. So it'll match all of those game IDs that we previously saw. And now, instead of specifying this rule that we saw earlier for every single game, we only need to specify it one time. So this is, this is good, um, except for the fact that the data we store in the games node is actually at, we want different access levels for different pieces of data. For this top field, uh, the date, the opponent, and the is public flags, that should always be publicly readable by everybody. There's no reason that people shouldn't be able to look at the date, the opponent, and the is public flag. Whereas the game content, we know we only want ticketed customers to actually be able to see this or see it if it is public. And then finally, the tickets node, we're probably going to want to lock down on a per user basis, where I can go ahead and buy a ticket myself, or I can remove my ticket, but a random person can't write to my ticket node. So if we look at how to do this with the rules, let's start with, let's just put a read rule on our game. And then underneath that, we'll say, you can only read the game content given that rule we determined earlier. And then for tickets, we do want to do it on a per user basis. But for now, we'll just say, do you have a ticket? If so, you can read all tickets. So this seems like it would work, um, except it actually won't. 
And that's because of what we call the rules cascade, which is another one of our core concepts of the rules language. The rules cascade essentially says that in order to read data at A slash B slash C, you just need a read rule that evaluates the true at any level in that parent hierarchy. So in order to read uh, the, the data at games, game ID, game content, we actually would start at the top and look at the games node, and we would say, do we have a read rule here? And we don't, but we know that that just implies that we have a read false. And so we know that the read won't be allowed at that level because we don't, because it, it, we don't have a read true. So then we move down to the next level in the parent hierarchy, and we go to game ID. Game ID does have a read rule which evaluates the read true, and so the read will be allowed. And so we actually will completely ignore this game content read rule. And that's because if we are allowing people to read games slash game ID, then they certainly are going to be able to read games slash game ID slash game content. So in, in addition, this tickets rule won't even be included either. So we need to work around this a little bit. And the way we can do that is one option is just copying these two rules that we had previously and then just specifying read true for every field we want to be publicly readable. This definitely works, but it involves a bunch of different read rules. And now every time we want to add another public field, we're going to have to add it to our rules. So if we want to add a time to let people know when the time of the game is, we now need to add a rule, which is time read true. So we can actually get around this by restructuring our data a little bit. Instead of putting date, opponent, and is public at the top level of the game, we can get rid of it, add a new metadata node, and then throw those things in the metadata node. And we can go ahead and refactor our rules in a very similar way, get rid of those three rules, replace them with a single metadata rule, which is read true. And now our rules are simpler. We have fewer of them. And if we ever want to add that time node, we don't have to do anything with our rules. We can just add it to metadata, and it will be publicly accessible. So we're getting close. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is this rule right here. So we're currently, we're allowing people to read the game content node if they're authenticated at all. And in our soccer example, this essentially would be, I have a ticket. But I have a ticket to some game, not I have a ticket to this game. So we actually want to lock it down to only people who have tickets to this game, not just a ticket in general. So in order to do that, let's take a look at what our tickets node looks like. We're going to have it keyed by unique identifiers. These are those UIDs I was talking about earlier when user authenticates. So it's a long, you can assume it's a random string. And we're going to go ahead and create a hash map of those, um, of those UIDs. And so we can go ahead and change our rules now and say our tickets node is going to be keyed by UID. So we'll use a wildcard location to match all of those random strings. And we're going to go ahead and say read and write if auth.uid triple equals dollar UID. So let's break this down a little bit. We know the auth variable has our user's authentication state. So it's the currently logged in user. And if their UID is the same as the location we're writing to, which is that dollar UID, will allow them to write to that node and read from it. This is what we call user-based security. So we've locked down the tickets node. The next thing we want to do is lock down this game content node. And essentially what we want to say is if the tickets node has the currently logged in user's UID as a key, then go ahead and allow the, write, or allow the read. We can do that by using a parent reference. So we take data, which again is the current data at that location. We call parent. Then we go to the tickets node. We see if it has the currently logged in user as a child. So the last thing in this example I want to talk through is actually being able to edit the schedule itself. Here we can add an admins node at the same level as our games node in our data structure. And we'll key it again by UID of all of the admins of the app. And then you can throw a bunch of profile information. For here, I'm just going to put the name. So we want to lock down that metadata node, which actually determines the schedule, so that only admins can write to it. The way we can do that is by using this root reference. So we say root, which is going to take us to the root of our Firebase. We go to the admin's child, and we see if the currently logged in user is in that node. So that works. We've now locked down our data so that the people who should be able to read it can read it, and the people who should be able to write it can write it. 
But we need to validate that the write is actually correct. Because you could write wrong data that, it, you know, write a date that is not a date at all. Uh, but that's not really what we want. So we copy our rules from the previous slide. And then we say, let's add rules to date and opponent, which say the new data must be a string. So what's going on here? We are referencing the new data that we're about to be written. Whereas data talks about the data that's currently stored before the write, new data is going to be the data that's about to be written to that node. So we want to say, when we write a date and an opponent, it must be a string. So this seems like it should work, but again, we're going to run into issues with our rules cascade. Because just like the read rules, the write rules follow the rules cascade. So in this example, let's say we try and write a number to metadata slash date as an, as an authenticated admin. We would first touch that top rule, which says, are you an admin? And it would say, yes, I am. And at that point, this date rule would be completely ignored. This is not what we want. So uh, we can go ahead and also look at it the other direction. Let's say we want to write a string, but we are not an admin. We first would go to that top right rule. We'd say, are you an admin? It would say, nope, not an admin. So then we'd go down to the next right rule, which says, are you writing a string? We'd say, yeah, I'm writing a string. And we would allow that write to happen, completely ignoring this admin rule, which is definitely not what we want, because we want to lock down writes to admins. So how can we solve this? It's actually really simple. All we need to do is change these write rules to what we call validate rules. Validate rules are different than read and write rules. And the way I like to think about it is that in order for a write to succeed, all you need is one write rule in that hierarchy to be true. So all of the write rules are ORed together. If any one is true, then the write will succeed. Whereas with validate rules, you need all validate rules to be true. So validate rules are ANDed together. So with validation, you can actually do some pretty complex stuff. So taking our previous example, we can actually require nodes. So we can say, the new data that we're about to write to metadata must have a date and must have an opponent. We can also say uh, more complex things than just, is it a string? We can use regular expressions to verify that the date has the proper format. We can use contains queries, which is, this is kind of an arbitrary example, but we can say the opponent must contain an S in their name. We can say more things like, is this a Boolean or is this a number? And then one trick I really like is this dollar other field. Uh, this is kind of a, uh, a little trick which says, don't allow any other nodes to be written to this field. So dollar other will match all other strings that aren't date, opponent, and is public. And we're just going to put validate false, which means if those are there, just completely fail the write. So these are really just a few examples of what you can do with our validation rules. You can actually combine them in a bunch of different ways and do some pretty complex schema validation, including implementing things like counters, time expiring data, and even user rate limiting. So we've seen a bunch of different examples um, of how to actually do security rules. But I'm going to head over to my laptop. Uh, and there's one thing to actually see code on slide, and it's completely another to actually play with it. So I'll come over here. And this is the brand new Firebase dashboard. How many people have already played around with this thing? All right, cool. A little over, over half the group. Uh, so it looks a lot more beautiful than our old dashboard. Over here on the left, you can see all of the products that are now a part of Firebase. And we're going to be playing with database. So we'll head over to the database data viewer. And that's what we see right away. We see all of the data that's currently stored in our Firebase database. I've already prepared some example data. And I will go ahead and load that. And it's going to have the same format as all of the examples we've been playing with. So we have a bunch of different admins, which are keyed by UID and include the name of the admin. And then we have a bunch of different games, which include game content, which we're going to lock down to ticketed customers. We have our metadata, which includes our is public field, and our tickets, which again is keyed by UID. So we can actually play with these rules by going to the rules simulator. And so the first thing we're going to want to do is click this little button over here, and that's actually going to open up our simulator. So by default, again, our rules are you just need to be authenticated to write, to write or to read. So the first thing we can do is just say, hey, I'm going to try and read from slash games even though I'm not authenticated. 
and we'll see that the simulated read was denied. And cool thing is you can actually come in here and see which rule caused the failure. So we see on line three, a little arrow pops up that says the read was denied here. So we can go ahead and we know we can work around this. We can say, let's just put games.read is going to be true. And we go ahead and run this again. And we can see our rules cascade at work. So we're going to start by this top rule. The read is not going to be allowed. But then we'll head down to this rule on line, seven, or on line six, and we'll see that the read is actually going to be allowed. And because read rules are ORed together, the write overall will be allowed. And then if we look at just reading from the root again, we'll see that, again, we're not going to be able to do anything. So we can go ahead and see this a little bit more if we swap the read rules here. So if we say, put our read rule at the top, move this read rule down here within games, and then try and read from slash games again, we'll see our rules cascade where we hit that read rule at the top, and we don't even need to check the second read rule because it's already going to be allowed. And similarly, when we just read at root, it's also going to be allowed. So let's go ahead and add the rules that we came up with during our slides and copy them here. This is exactly the full set that we talked through. And we have our rules for the metadata node, for the game content node, and for the ticket node. So we'll go ahead and publish these rules, which is actually going to upload those to Firebase servers and put them live in your app. And then we're going to try doing some writes. The first thing we'll do is we will write to games. And then we're going to want to grab one of our game IDs. So we'll head over here and just grab this first game ID and head back to write games slash that game ID slash metadata. And what we're going to want to write is we'll start with just foo. So we click run, and we see that we're not going to pass because we're not actually authenticated. So this auth variable is not, even, is not even set. So let's go ahead and authenticate. Here you can see the authenticated section where we can choose a bunch of different providers that we want to pretend to authenticate with. And we can actually override the UID that we use in the authentication. For now, we'll just use the randomly assigned UID. And we'll click Run. And we'll see that, oh uh, man, we still, we still failed the same rule. Even though we have an auth.uid now, but we're not actually an admin. So we head back over to the admin section. We grab the admin UID. And we throw it in here. And now we run. And all right, so we passed the rule on line eight, but now we're failing one of our validate rules. It says, new data must have date and opponent. OK, we can work with that. We'll go ahead and change this to have a date, which will be tomorrow. And we're going to intentionally have a mistake in there where we only put three characters for the year. And then for the opponent, we'll go ahead and say, we're going to be playing Arsenal tomorrow. If we run that, we'll see we now pass the first validate rule, but that still doesn't allow the write to happen. We fail this regular expression. So we can fix that by making that 2016, click Run, and now we see all of the different rules succeed and our overall simulated write was allowed. You can also go to this details section to get a ton more details about why the write was allowed. You can see the type, where it was written to, what data, what authentication state was, whether or not you were an admin, and then a bunch of different data for each line that was executed in the write. So if we head back over to the slides, uh, you've kind of gotten a whirlwind tour so far of both the rules language itself and the uh, and the actual simulator. So if we head back over to the slides, hopefully you guys are not feeling too overwhelmed at this point. Uh, and hopefully you're realizing the breadth of security, the options that you have available to you. But I kind of realize that a lot of you, I've gone through a bunch of stuff already, and you may be feeling a bit stressed, or you may be feeling more scared, or you may even possibly be feeling like this and be completely lost. And like, we realize that. Like, security is not easy. There's no, there's no getting around that. Firebase has also taken a different approach to security than many of you are familiar with. So in fact, we found that security rules were consistently one of the hardest things for new Firebase developers to figure out. So we, we heard that feedback, and we actually were playing around with improving this situation by creating what we called rules compilers. So first came a compiler called Blaze, which introduced some, some stuff like types, 
and functions and inline tests. And then came Bolt, which built on the work of Blaze and also included types, including generic types. It included a cleaner syntax to write less code, and it also included match paths to make your rules easier to read and write. But there was still a problem. And the problem was that all of our rules, languages, and compilers were all very database specific. And now Firebase is much more than a real-time database. It's now an integrated suite of products. And that's kind of where this next product comes in, Firebase Storage. We needed a rules language for Firebase Storage, and we felt like the existing rules language just left a little bit too much to be desired. So we kind of went back to the drawing board, and we built a new rules language from the ground up. One that borrowed heavily from the real-time database rules, the things that we liked from that and that our users were able to pick up very quickly, and also included the different learnings that we got from our Blaze and Bolt compilers. So it's still early days for the Firebase storage. There's lots of stuff that we still have planned and that is still going to be coming out. But I do want to give you a walkthrough of the existing features and show you how you can use it to protect your files stored in, in Firebase storage. Again, before we actually look at any data, I'm sorry, before we look at any rules, we need to look at the data we're going to be protecting. We already know the real-time database stores data like this. We have a user's node, we have it keyed by UID, and we have a bunch of profile information. This is JSON data. Firebase storage, on the other hand, is going to be protecting data like this. This is a directory structure like you'd have on your local file system. Instead of a user's node, you'd have a user's directory. And within that, you'd have a directory for each user. And for each user, you'd have a bunch of different images and audio files, movies, and text files. And this is the kind of stuff that we're going to want to protect. So what do the rules actually look like? The syntax is going to be very different from the real-time database rules, but the concepts are still very much the same. So we start with the default storage rules. And the default rules say, we first are going to specify what, what uh, service we are using to, to write rules. So we're going to say we're using the storage, the Firebase.storage service. Within that, we need to specify what bucket. This is our Google Cloud Storage bucket we're going to be reading and writing files to. And then we're going to use match paths. And the way to interpret this, this syntax, is that the curly braces are actually kind of equivalent to the dollar, in the dollar wildcard locations in the real-time database rules. And so what's saying here is we're going to match all paths, a wildcard, all strings, and the equals dollar dollar essentially says allow it to be many levels deep. So by default, if you just had all paths with no equals dollar dollar, it would only match one level deep. This will match as far down as we want to go. And within that, we'll go ahead and say allow read and write. You see we have a more compact syntax because we're allowed to do read and write rules on the same line. And we'll say if request.off is not null, allow the read and write to happen. So these rules are equivalent to the default rules for the real-time database. There are a few differences in the actual conditional. So like off has moved from a top level variable into this request variable. And the request is going to contain all of the information about the request that is being made, the read or the write. So Let's look at a few more examples. We, maybe we don't want to actually do uh, read, write only if you're authenticated. What if we want to make all the stuff public? We can do that by just doing allow read, write with no conditional. Again, much more compact syntax than the database rules. Similarly, for to do private, we can go ahead and just add in conditional, which says if false, which will, always allow, which will always evaluate to false. So this would not allow anyone to read anything. Finally, we can do user-based security. So instead of doing that all paths match, we're going to go ahead and do a match path which looks like this. We're going to say, go to the user's directory, and then do match any string, which is going to be our UID, the unique identifier for that user, and then match all files. This time, we're not using equal star star, so we're not going to do multi-level match paths. And we'll go ahead and say, you're allowed to read and write, if you are the currently authenticated user. So we say request.off.uid equals the UID. And that, that second UID comes from the match path itself. So let's head to a soccer example. And let's talk about actually storing some game highlights. Like we had in the real-time database, we'll have a top-level games directory instead of a games node. We will again key that directory 
by the game ID. So the data between the two is actually looking pretty similar, the structure. And then within each game, we'll have a highlight reel. We will have a recording of the audio. And we will have a bunch of different fan images. These fan images will be keyed by the unique identifier of those fans. And within that, we will have a bunch of different images. So we want to go ahead and write some rules to protect this data. First thing we'll do is we'll write a top level match path which says slash games slash game ID. So this is exactly the kind of thing we did with the rules language, except we're doing it much more compactly. And then we'll nest match paths, like we were able to nest rules in the, in the database rules. And we'll say, if in game slash game ID we have a highlights movie, let's go ahead and allow everyone to read it. And let's allow you to write to it if you are authenticated as an admin. And so here we're using a new concept, and this is actually using our custom authentication. So that auth variable that specifies a UID in the rules language, you can actually make any, you can make any variable with net auth variable. So you can say auth.isAdmin. And so in the storage rules, that data is stored in request.auth.token. And then we store a bunch of custom attributes that we want to write. And in this case, we'll store whether or not the user is an admin. Next, we need to do uh, rules for the recording audio file. And those rules are actually going to be identical to the highlights reel. Finally, we need to protect our user's data. So within fan images UID file name, we will allow all of those to be read. It's a public view. But we'll only allow you to write it if you are that logged in user. So we can go ahead and clean up some of these rules and make these even more compact. The first thing we'll do is we'll notice that the rules for highlight reel and the recording are actually identical. So let's go ahead and get rid of one, slightly change our match path to say just match on any file name, and then update our write rule from which currently just checks if we're an admin to also check that the file name itself is either highlights.move or recording.mp3. So we've gotten rid of a bunch of different lines. Next thing we can do is actually extract this read rule from these two rules, because we know that everything is publicly readable. So if we pull that out, we go ahead and squish those two guys down. And then we create a match path for all paths, as many levels deep as we want, and just put in allow read. We've now taken what was initially six rules and made it down to three, which is much easier to read and much easier to understand, less to keep in your head. So one thing you're definitely going to want to do with your, your files is validate that they are of the correct type and the correct size and things like that. So the validation for the storage language is actually quite different from what we have in the rules language. We start with our rule which just says you need to be the logged in user. And then we'll go ahead and add a rule which says the size of the resource that we're about to write has to be less than five megabytes. We can also do things like check the content type and verify the content type of the resource we're writing is an image. Even more so, we can actually determine which kind of writes we're going to allow. So we can disable deletes by doing a request.resource does not equal null. And if you think about this, this is saying if I ever try and write a resource to this location that is null, which means that I'm obliterating what is existingly there, then I won't be able to do that. And then finally, we can verify that the file name itself is less than 32 characters. So one of the big things I'm very excited about with storage that we don't have in the, in the database rules language is functions. This is something that people love from Blaze and the Bolt compilers. So let's go ahead and take some of a subset of the rules that we had in the last slide and turn them into functions. First, we'll start with, is this the current user? We'll go ahead and create a function called isCurrentUser, which takes a UID, and we will just return that same rule set, verifying that the logged in user is the same as the UID the function takes. And if that is true, we can go ahead and replace this rule down here with a much shorter rule, which is just isCurrentUser and pass the UID. Similarly, we can do the same with the resource.size rule. We'll go ahead and create a less than n megabytes rule or function, pass it the size of the number of megabytes we want to limit to, and then we can replace the rule down here with a call to less than n megabytes, five. Finally, we can take the rule that checks whether or not the file is an image, 
create a function called isImage, which just returns the same exact rule, and replace the call down here with isImage. So we've taken what was a pretty long and hard to read write rule and turned it into something which is actually pretty clear and easy to understand. Even if you didn't write these rules yourself, you could read this and understand who is going to have access and what type of files will be written here. It's even short enough that you can fit it all in a single line of code. So this is a huge improvement uh, over the existing rules language, and I think you guys are going to find that it's going to clean up a lot of your code. So that is the new Firebase storage rules language. As with the database rules language, it's composed of a dozen or so primitives, which you can compose together to actually form really complex file access rules and validation. It includes a bunch of things from the database rules language itself, but also all the new improvements that we got from things like Blaze and Bolt. And it is better situated for the new multi-product world that Firebase now occupies. At this point, I think congratulations are in order. You all just made it through my 9 AM talk on security. You now know the tools you have at your disposal to protect your Firebase data in both the real-time database and in, the, and in storage. Hopefully, you use these primitives and put them into either an existing app or, if you're new to Firebase, a brand new app, and make sure you actually are protecting your data. If you're interested in learning more, you can find more in our documentation head on over to firebase.google.com. We have documentation for all of the different products. You also can find out about all of the other parts of Firebase, all of the new things that were announced yesterday by heading to our features page. And lastly, support is, is a huge part of what has made Firebase successful so far. And it's something that we continue to try and strive and do our best at. And that's not going to be changing anytime soon. So please head on over to the support page, join our Slack community, join our Google groups, join our Stack Overflow community, and be a part of the conversation. Let us know what features you want, whether it's with the rules language, whether it's with the actual database rules or storage or any other product. We definitely value your feedback. And a lot of what we released yesterday is based on feedback from customers like you. Also, brand new YouTube channel with a bunch of really cool intro videos for all of the new features. And you can always find us on Firebase on Twitter for all of the up-to-date news. There's still a lot of cool stuff happening at I.O. We've still got two full days left. Uh, half the office hours are over, but you should definitely check out the one that's at, at 5 PM today or one of the ones tomorrow. Also, if you're interested in seeing more Firebase sessions, I think there's still double-digit talks left that are just about Firebase. So two that you may be interested in if you thought this was a good talk. One would be Zero to App, Develop with Firebase. That's going to be tomorrow at 10 AM on the main amphitheater. And this is actually a really cool talk where they're going to be building an Android, an iOS, and a web app, all that communicate with each other, all from scratch. That includes storage, database rules, and authentication, all in 45 minutes. So it's going to be exciting whether or not they're able to do it. So you should definitely check it out. The other talk you may be interested in is the one I mentioned earlier, which is about Firebase authentication. That one is on this stage tomorrow at 1 PM. Lastly, if you're interested in talking more about Firebase, come join us right over at the Sandbox right next door. Uh, and we can take a look at one of your existing apps, talk through rules in your app, or talk about any of the new features. So thank you, everyone, for, for coming this morning and learning about the key to Firebase security. My name has been Jacob Wanger. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of uh, information, you can find more on my Twitter at underscore jwanger. Thank you very much. Peace out. And do not forget to protect your Firebase data. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah, and it's super nice when it comes to, like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has, like, really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might, like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show, like, a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. 
And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly, um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance with service worker to then use the AppShell model. And if you are using the AppShell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good, we've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paint on repeat visits. Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server-side rendering has on this, uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the App Shell model in mind, with server-side rendering in mind, you will get like, a really good first paint, even in like, Safari and um, like, mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have Service Worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, OK, well, should I be using the application shell model on all of my applications? Um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This, this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know, a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox. and It's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know, we, we way too much to explain in just one video. But we wrote up. Uh, a pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up, and I just read it. So you you just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how I pretty roll. Pretty much. <laughs> Impact. Um, that's worth checking out. That's the format of this It's a mediocre idea. article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out, yep. learn more about AppShell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yep. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like, really quickly um, that yeah. we're working on. So go check that out. Yeah, build a weather app. So what if I told you there was a way you could compress nearly any stream of data by a factor of 10x or more? Wouldn't that be something you'd be interested in? Yeah, I thought so. Let's find out more on this episode of Route 85. So I want you to take a look at this array of numbers here. Imagine that we wanted to send this array of integers from a server to your user's device. Looks like just a bunch of random numbers, right? Well, that word random is actually the key to compressing these in an incredibly efficient manner. As you probably know, a random number generator isn't truly random. Supply a random number generator with the same seed, and you'll get the same results out every time. And we can take advantage of that fact to recreate that list of integers using a random number generator. You see, all I need to do to regenerate that array on a device is to supply three parameters. The seed for an agreed upon random number generator, an upper bound to apply to these results, and the length of the list. I simply supply those numbers to a method that looks a little like this and I can recreate that original number stream. Just like that, I've built my array of 30 integers using just two integers and an int 32. That's a 92% compression rate. Now granted, finding that initial seed did take some work, but you know what? That work can happen in the cloud, so it doesn't really matter. What's important is that on the device, I'm able to decompress that number stream in order and time. And then, of course, once you start looking around, you can see that there's a ton of data you can compress this way. I mean, need to compress a text string? Well, what's a string but a stream of encoded integers? Once I have my stream of integers, I simply figure out what seed I need to generate them, and voila, I've compressed my string down into just three numbers. It's a pretty amazing savings, right? Anybody with the username of Stidjexmisdizixgudquibpubpa will be singing your praises in their reviews. 
And uh, my gosh, if you think about it, an image is really just a stream of numbers broken out into uh, several channels. Take a look at this image here, and you can see how, using our random number generator, I've been able to replace it with just three sets of integers for the red, green, and blue channels, respectively. Now, once again, finding the right seed can take some time, and I haven't found the perfect seed just yet. So if you look at the results carefully, you can see that this is not quite a lossless compression scheme. But I think you'll agree that for this kind of savings, these trade-offs just might be worth it. Anyway, I hope you consider using this technique the next time you have data that needs to be compressed. Remember, the more efficient you are with your user's data, the more they'll love you. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to check out other episodes of Route 85. And uh, remember that, as my coworkers on the Android team like to say, perf matters. All right, thanks guys. I think we're done. Uh, who let him into the studio again? I just, I couldn't say no to Elijah Wood. But that's... Elijah Wood. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables one for training, and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. 
We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the pedal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. So it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see,
true. Hey, thank you for coming. I'm Todd. I work on Google Cloud Messaging, now called Firebase Cloud Messaging. Um, I focus on performance, specifically um, reducing battery consumption, improving reliability, and reducing latency. With me on stage is Kieran. Hi, I'm Kieran, and I work with Todd on the Cloud Messaging Performance team. Today, we're here to discuss some of the details of cloud messaging performance, including how we measure it, some typical latency numbers that we see, some of the factors that can affect that performance, and finally, a few of the cool projects we've been working on lately to help make the service even more robust, especially in the face of unreliable networks. But first, we've had kind of a busy morning, Todd, and I haven't had a chance to talk to you. Um, I saw yesterday that Firebase cloud messaging is the new Google cloud messaging. Does, does that mean this whole presentation is out of date? No, I'm glad you asked. So as you all heard yesterday, we launched a combined suite of services called Firebase. Um, Firebase Cloud Messaging is the Google Cloud Messaging under that suite. Um, the data that we're going to talk about today applies to both services. Um, before we get started, I'd like to review a couple basics real quick so we're on the same page. So first, let's look at how a downstream message flows from your servers to the devices. So when it flows from your servers, the first hop is the uh, Firebase Cloud Messaging front end. From there, it's timestamped and persisted to storage. If the device is connected, it's sent immediately to the back end server, where it is then forwarded to the device. So let's take another closer look at the interaction from back end to the device. It's not a simple arrow. Um, the first hop is that it leaves the Firebase, Firebase Cloud Messaging back end and goes through the internet towards your wireless network or your carrier's infrastructure. Within that point, there's going to be a network address translation device, NAT for short. That allows us to deal with uh, the shortness of IPv4 space. And this is a carrier-provided feature or a wireless network router-provided feature. And from there, would, oh, OK. From there, it um, travels to the device. One of the key aspects of this network address translation device is it keeps track of connections. And let's look more closely at how that works. So the connection list is a list of connections and the external IP and ports, along with a timeout. When the timeout expires for, for the connection being inactive, the connection is removed, and no more communication can happen over that connection. So the devices must reestablish the connection. If that NAT device is really busy, we can run out of space, and we have to evict the least recently used entry before it times out. Most NAT devices are well behaved in that they'll send a TCP reset when they remove an entry from the NAT table, and that will allow the devices to know to reconnect. But some NAT devices don't send a TCP reset. That leaves the connection closed, but the devices are unaware. We call that a silent close. Um, in this scenario, the device must figure out a way to detect that the connection is broken and to reestablish it. Um, one solution for this is to send heartbeats over the connection from the device to our servers. We do this to keep the connections active um, so that they don't time out and to detect more readily when the connections fail. Another aspect I wanted to review real quick was latency percentiles. As you all know, 50 percentile latency is 50% um, of latency less than, or 50 percent of users experience latency less than this metric, and 50 percent of users experience more latency than this metric. Um, there's also the 80 percentile latency. This is useful for situations where we have a long tail distribution, such as if we're looking at the performance of carrier or Wi-Fi networks, um, where the performance of individual carriers, carriers could vary significantly. Um, in situations where we control more of the infrastructure, such as within our own FCM infrastructure, we can look at 95 percentile latency, which is 19 out of 20 users experiencing less latency than that. So enough review. Let's start with some of the stats. Um, we'll start by looking at latency first. This is the same diagram that you've seen before. We're going to look at, in this next slide, latency from the um, FCM path, so as the message flows through the FCM servers for both mobile and Wi-Fi. So 50 percentile latency is a small 64 milliseconds. 
95 percentile latency is 161 milliseconds. Again, we chose 95 percentile latency here because we control the infrastructure, and so we're, we're able to provide tighter latency bounds. If we're careful, we can estimate the latency. Um, if we're careful, we can estimate the latency from the FCM, from the point the message enters the FCM infrastructure to the point that it's delivered to the device. To do this, we'll use Google Hangouts data, and we'll use the ACK traveling back from the device to estimate the one-way latency. So 50 percentile latency from the front end of FCM to the client is 160 milliseconds, which is pretty low. Um, 80 percentile latency is 348 milliseconds. We chose 80 percentile here because wireless and mobile networks tend to have a long tail or tend to have a lot of variability in performance, and we felt that 80 percentile latency was representative of a well-behaved network's performance. Um, oh, sorry. Before I hand off, the data that we've talked about now is for connected devices. Um, connectivity is an important factor, and Kieran is going to talk about that. Right. So to give the audience some context, when the team started looking at these numbers, we obviously high-fived ourselves, gave ourselves a pat on the back, et cetera. These are pretty good numbers. But then we took another look, and we realized, like Todd just said, that these are only for devices that already have an active connection with the FCM servers. But there's an entire category of devices that don't have an active connection. And so then the next logical question we asked ourselves was, why? Why don't these devices have an active connection? And is there anything that we can do to make sure that that connection stays open longer and is there more often? And so we didn't really know the answer to that question. Um, so we did what we usually do when we're faced with a question we don't know, which is we looked at the data. And more specifically, we looked at the connection close events that we were seeing. And we roughly categorized them into one of two buckets. And the first bucket is user-initiated connection close events. So these are actions that the user has taken that has influenced their connectivity in some way. So some typical examples that we see here are if the user is worried about their battery or they're not going to see a charger for a while, they might turn off background data. Another example is if the user is going someplace that has poor or limited network connectivity. So that might be the park, the mountains, my parents' house, hi, dad. Um, another example that we see is if the user has turned off data by enabling airplane mode. And they could do this for legal reasons, like if they're actually on an airplane. Um, they could also do it for financial reasons or just because they want the noises to stop. So that's an entire category of user-influenced event, events that can affect somebody's connectivity. And there's a limit to what we can do about those. On the other hand, there's an entire category of external factors that can affect connectivity. Now, the truly pedantic among you may note that this category of external factors is technically pretty close to infinity, right? Like, there's a whole bunch of things that can stop a connection between your client and the FCM servers. But that's not really a useful paradigm for us. So instead, we decided to subdivide it into two sections. The first is NAT device issues. So as Todd pointed out, NAT means network address translation. And that's a device that sits between the FCM client, typically an Android device, and the FCM server, and doles out IPv4 addresses and maintains an internal mapping. And typically, the sort of issues that we see from NAT devices are capacity issues or timeout issues. There's also another section here, which is random failures. And these are events that can happen anywhere in the network infrastructure, um, including power surges and operator failures. And these are things that are difficult for us to account for. There are some steps we can take, but in general, we're pretty limited in what we can do here. So we decided to focus specifically on network address translation issues and see what sort of changes that we could make to make the experience better for more users. But first, we wanted to see how often people were actually affected by NAT issues. So we started to look at the sort of connection close events that we're seeing out in the wild for real mobile operators. And so one of the operators that we looked at had 98.6% of their connection close events being explicit. That is, not silent. Another operator that we looked at had 99.4% of their connection close events being explicit. These are great stats, and we're really happy to see these, because it means that most users, their connections are staying open, or if they're actually being closed, they're being closed explicitly. So both parties know that the connection has been closed, and they can work to reestablish a new one, which means that your connectivity is very high, and you're very likely to get messages very quickly. 
On the other hand, not all operators are performing the same, at the same level. So here's an example of a small, poor performing operator that we saw that had almost 40% of their connection closes being silent. That's a huge difference from the other two operators that we saw. So we wanted to kind of dig into what was making this happen and what we could do about it. But first, it may help to go over what exactly a silent connection is and why it's so harmful for us. So here's an example of an explicit close, or what we call a polite disconnect. In this scenario, the device on the left already has an active connection to the FCM servers. So when a message is required to be delivered to the device, FCM sends the message down. It travels through the network infrastructure, the NAT device, and then arrives at the phone in a timely manner. Then the NAT device decides to close the connection, but it sends out an explicit TCP reset or FIN packet to both parties. So now both parties know that that connection has been closed. After a short duration, the Android device attempts to reestablish that connection. It does so, and there's a new connection that is used to transfer data between the Android device and the FCM servers. Then, later, when the FCM servers need to send a new notification down to the device, it does so on the new connection, just like before, and the message is delivered promptly. This is a great scenario because, again, the Android device realizes that the network connection has been closed, so it can reestablish a new one. On the other hand, the silent close events that we see uh, are pretty harmful. So here's an example of one. Again, in this scenario, the phone already has an active connection with the FCM servers. When a, network, or when a message is delivered to the device, it travels through the network infrastructure just like before and arrives at the device. Then, when the router or NAT device decides to close the connection, it does so silently. It doesn't send an explicit packet to either party, so now neither party knows that that connection has been closed. Later, when FCM wants to send a notification down to the phone, it tries to write to that connection. And only then does it realize that the connection has been closed and is unusable. A short time later, the phone will attempt to send a heartbeat back up to FCM, and it will attempt to do so on the old, now dead connection. When it does that, then it will realize that the connection has been closed. It will reestablish a new connection, and FCM will send any messages that have been queued in the meantime back down to the phone. The key takeaway here is that this scenario causes a period of disconnection that can range for up to a couple of minutes until the phone's, between the point of disconnect and until the phone sends a new heartbeat. This isn't a great experience for our users because they can be silently disconnected with no awareness. So if they receive an urgent message, it may not get to them for many minutes. So obviously this isn't a great opportunity, or this is a great opportunity for us to make some changes and see what we can do to fix this. So this is kind of a one weird trick sort of thing. Here's the same per poor performing operator. You've already seen this data. Before, almost 40% of their connection close events were silent. After making this small adjustment, almost over 90% of their connection close events were explicit. That's a huge reduction in the number of silent closes that we were seeing. So how did we do this? How did we make this happen? The answer is that we reduced the heartbeat interval to below what we thought their NAT timeout interval was. And so what that means is that when a NAT device typically, typically closes a connection due to timeout issues, it's because it thinks that no data is going to be passed on that connection anymore. An FCM connection, on the other hand, is always active. We're always expecting to receive data on that. That's how you receive your messages so quickly. So the trick here was to make sure that we're sending packets frequently enough that the NAT device realized that the connection was still open and that it shouldn't close it. So here's that same data in a different form. As you can see, for the first three quarters of the graph, the, harp, the silent closes over time hover pretty steadily between 1.5 million and just over 2 million. On the other hand, when we initiated the heartbeat interval, or when we adjusted the heartbeat interval, which is that blue dotted line you see, you see the number of silent closes dropped dramatically. In fact, they dropped 88% down to just around 250,000. That's a huge, huge improvement, and we're very happy that we got to make that. Now, this approach of taking the whole team and looking at mobile operator data and coming up with a plan and then implementing that plan is great for mobile operators, especially larger ones, where the amount of impact that we can have is dramatic for just that small amount of work. On the other hand, 
that approach doesn't really scale well with Wi-Fi networks. It's not like I can go in and record each Wi-Fi network and whether or not it's a good quality one. So we had to come up with a different solution. And Todd, I know you have a lot of practice here. Can you give us a, an example of what we did to make that better? Yeah. Um, Wi-Fi Adaptive Heartbeat was a really exciting project for me to work on. Um, we started out with a constant heartbeat interval of 15 minutes. Um, and it was great for most operators, or for most Wi-Fi networks. But there were a few that would be disconnected because they had shorter NAT timeouts than that or more active devices. A simple solution could be to just reduce the static heartbeat to four minutes. But we might consume a little bit more battery as a result. Um, and so what we really wanted was something to develop an algorithm that would balance battery consumption with connectivity. And so we brainstormed on that for a bit and came up with a number of candidates. We took those candidate algorithms and we simulated them against um, modeled NAT devices. So here's an example. The modeled NAT device varies its timeout in the yellow line. Um, and then the red line shows the uh, heartbeats as they adjust an interval to match that. And that's the Wi-Fi adaptive heartbeat. Um, this simulation here shows that the device was connected over 97% of the time. Um, in comparison, if this same simulation was run with a static heartbeat of 15 minutes, the device only would have been connected 66% of the time. After we refined our algorithm and came up with a, what we thought was a good solution, we took it to the lab. There we had four Nexus 6 devices. We divided them into two groups, control group and experiment group. The control group kept the 15-minute static heartbeat, and the experiment group got our new um, Wi-Fi adaptive heartbeat algorithm. We connected them to monsoon power meters so we could measure the current consumption of all the devices, and a, a Wi-Fi network that we controlled. This allowed us to emulate the various NAT behaviors that we had experienced. Um, we also took a TCP dump to verify that the algorithm was operating as expected. From this lab experiment, we came up with some interesting numbers that I'd like to share. First, we could compare the cost of doing a heartbeat versus the cost of doing a reconnect. We found that a heartbeat saved 36% battery. Um, it could, or sorry, a heartbeat consumed 36% less battery than a reconnect. In addition, if we look at a 10-minute NAT timeout device, again, that's one we've talked about before, in the experiment group, it would simply have two nine-minute heartbeats. In the control group, it would have a 15-minute heartbeat followed by a reconnect. The experiment group, of course, would achieve the 97% connectivity that we had simulated. And the control group would only achieve 66% connectivity. Um, but more interesting is the experiment group would actually consume 3% less battery. And so by increasing the heartbeat interval in certain situations, we're actually able to save battery in addition to improving connectivity. We started rolling this feature out. And along the way, we collected data. I'd love to share with you some of the data we got when we got to the 50% of production users. First, we saw 34% fewer silent closes and 1% more TTL0 messages delivered. If you remember the GCM spec, time to live zero messages are messages that are delivered immediately if the device is online, but otherwise they're discarded because they aren't stored to be delivered later. Their time to live is zero. So by delivering more of those messages, that shows that we're connected more of the time. In addition, we improved battery for 54% of users. Whoa, 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 whoa. We improved battery for 54% of users? That's yeah. huge. Yeah, 54%. <laughs> Thank wow. you. Um, and, and there's a small caveat to that. For a very small portion of users, users that were only connected 33% of the time or less, we did spend a little bit of battery. 0.3% more battery consumed for an idle device. So you wouldn't even notice it. But it allowed us to improve the connectivity for, those sm for that small subset of, of users three times. So times. in the end, I feel like the battery numbers really paid out. And then the improved connectivity, we improved connectivity for 72% of users. Um, so as a result, this feature is live. Um, everybody's phone should have it. Um, and we're continuing to think about how to improve it further. In addition to looking at our own data when we rolled out, we also felt it was important to look at data from services that depend on us. So I'd like to look at Google Hangouts 99 percentile latency data. Um, the blue line represents my, or <laughs> Wi Fi and mobile users combined. So it's, the same, it's, the, it's both sets of users in one, in one line. And the Wi Fi line is red. So it's just the Wi Fi users. So what we can see here is that at the 50% rollout point, the 99 percentile latency for Wi Fi users dropped. When we got to 100% rollout, the Wi Fi users continued to drop. 
but also the Wi-Fi plus mobile 99 percentile users drop. That means that we've changed what problem is causing the 99 percentile latency for Wi-Fi plus mobile users. Um, in the end, the re remaining lat latency, in, eh, the remaining latency for the blue line was caused by 3G mobile networks, which we focused on later. But that's a talk for another time. If you look just at the Wi-Fi line, we reduced the 99 percentile latency for Hangouts 55 percent. So we've gone through and looked at how GCM performs, and we've looked at some interesting projects that we really enjoyed working on. Um, I want to take a brief second to talk about what can we learn about the users of GCM from the data that we have. So we're going to look at user-influenced disconnection events, so events where the users decided to be disconnected for a sustained period of time. So we're going to look at events where the user has been disconnected for 30 minutes or more, where they have made the decision not to be reconnected. Um, this is a heat map that I'm going to talk about. One thing I wanted to point out before I started that, though, was that most messages are delivered in well under 30 minutes. But we're only talking about the long tail here. We're only talking about messages that are delivered longer than, longer than 30 minutes, or to devices that have been offline for more than 30 minutes. This heat map is color coded. So red means that more, a higher percentage of messages are delivered to devices that have been offline. And green represents a lower percentage of messages. We will post on the Spaces app the full set of data for this grid. So you can check it out online. So for example, 4% of Indian users are seeing their messages delivered to devices that have been offline between two and four hours. In the US, that's only 0.8%. As you can see, this varies from country to country significantly. Let's take another look at this data in a slightly different representation. This is a cumulative graph. So for example, you can see here that 15% of users um, in India, or 15% of messages in India are delivered to devices that have been offline two hours or more. 15%. So that means that if you're developing an app for you know, the world, you need to take into account that device connectivity may not be a ubiquitous thing. And so you have to make your app work in a situation where connectivity may go away. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. One other data set that I thought we could pull that was interesting is to look at day of the week. This is the global. Um, data, so it's not any particular country. But you can clearly see that Saturday and Sunday are days in which the users are less likely to be available on their devices. Um, maybe they work on the weekdays, or maybe they have phone-free Saturday, Sundays. Um, Kieran, what are some things we can do for users that, or for apps that want to work in an environment where connectivity is not ubiquitous? I am both glad you asked that question and totally surprised by it. Um, no, I'm joking. So we just released a new uh, open source library. It's called the Firebase Job Dispatcher. And this is a library for scheduling jobs, discrete units of work, on Android and coming soon, iOS, um, that let you set constraints and triggers for these jobs. So you can say something like, I'd like to do this download, but only when the user has an unmetered Wi-Fi network. Or I'd like to run this task every week, but only while the device is charging. This helps make sure that your app remains a good app citizen on both iOS and Android. And ultimately, ultimately, it means that you're respecting your user by making sure you're only using the bandwidth when you absolutely need to. And you're waiting for the most opportune time to initiate downloads or do any maintenance tasks that you need to. This is available right now, and you can check out those links there. The iOS version is absolutely coming soon. Um, we also have a code lab for you called Removing Dependencies on Background Services, and that's available at the link there, g.co slash code lab slash job scheduler. We encourage you to check it out. Um, in there, we go over a sample app, and we talk about move, removing dependencies on background services and converting to this new job-centric world. Um, this is a great way to make sure that your app is more battery efficient and works even better on newer versions of Android and iOS. So, this has been us. We've been talking about GCM performance. Um, we'd love to hear your comments and feedback. Please leave us a note in the Spaces app. And I guess we have some time for Q&A right now. Yeah, we have time for questions if you want. And then go, go ahead, find a mic, please. Oh, yeah. I guess we're allowed yeah. to clap. Hi, my name is Mas.
what can actually scale, what doesn't, what needs to go away, what new things need to be added in. You know, for me, it was starting ModCloth, like deciding to work on it full time once I graduated from CMU, because I did it part time while I was at school. You know, I was at the stage where I was like, man, if I can just like do this and I can support myself and maybe, you know, hire a few people to do the stuff that I don't enjoy doing so much, like packing boxes is really fun, but you don't necessarily want to spend four hours a day doing it, which is kind of what I was doing when I hired my first employee. Yeah, you know, like I was like, man, if I can just support myself and like create this job and like, you know, let's let's see where it goes. And it's just like continued to continue to go and grow. And yeah, I feel really fortunate to be able to do it. Okay, so here's a question based on kind of what you were saying about having like this job for 14 years. I, I can't imagine it's the same job. And I have some data to back that up. Uh, in 2012, 50% growth to 100 million in sales. And in 2015, 150 million in sales. There's no way that you can get that growth and still be doing the same thing every day. But I'm curious like, what the rate of innovation is. How often does your job change? And how often do you have to find new strategies to grow even bigger or to deal with that growth? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I think um, there, I mean, there's been so many phases. And I, I used to feel like my job was changing almost every quarter. Mm -hmm. um, because honestly, it was just like we were growing so quickly. I want to say in 2010, we hired, uh, we had 100 people at the beginning of the year, and we hired 150 that year. So we went from like 100 to like, I think 225 ish by the time the year was out. But it's so different and like there's no way that you can hit the level of scale that we've gotten to or hit any scale at all without being able to let other people in and you know empower them to do the things that they do really well mm -hmm. um, so part of the process for me has been learning like how to be a leader as much as we've gone from nothing to where we're at today with like 350 full-time people across three locations you know the sales numbers that you that you referenced we're still a small fish in the big fashion sea like it's a huge industry um, and one that is ripe for innovation. And we're doing mm. things differently and very, in a very cool way, I think. Okay, so clearly you've been at this a long time and you've used a number of different ways to, to really help keep the spirit of the company alive. Um, let me just kind of like tag a few of them that I think I heard. Uh, one is that um, you had to be really innovative and you approached it with like this beginner's mind, like that's such a cool idea that it's like, what's the company we want to work at? And you put that into mod cloth from the beginning. And I think the other big thing that I heard is that you built that into the culture so that throughout it wasn't just like a list of rules but something people carried with them as part of mod cloth yeah. does that sound right yeah that's really definitely. cool okay i have one more question for you and this is an advice question there's somebody out there who was where you were in 2002 they have a passion for something that uh, they think they can make into a successful startup where do they start I think, you know, the first thing that I would say would be to ask for help mm. and do it all the time and be very concise and know what you're looking for at all times, right? You know, if you're doing something for the first time, if you get better, your taste is going to get better and you're going to look back on that stuff that you did early and you're going to cringe at it, you know? Like I look back at the first logo that I designed for ModCloth at our first website, you know, at our first photo shoots and I'm just like, oh my God. God, you know, it looks so bad to me now. <laughs> and it's, I didn't think that when we launched it, uh, you know, obviously, like I cared very deeply about it. But it was the best I could do. So I think that sometimes we get scared to just put something out there because, you know, it's, it's scary. It's vulnerable. You're putting something out there. People might like it. They might not. It's like, oh, my God. But here's the thing. You like if you're going to succeed, you're going to get better. So you got to start somewhere. OK, so don't be afraid to ask for help. And you just got to get out there. Yep. You got to get out there and put something out into the world. And you know what? It's probably going to suck and that's okay. Or it'll be great. And then you'll look back at it five years from now and you'll say, wow, that kind of sucked. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. Every like, you know, and then you'll look back at it and you'll be like, oh, this is actually kind of cute and retro. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. For more information about ModCloth and uh, some of, maybe we can put some of your favorite blogs and blog posts in the notes as well. Amazing. Check out the show notes below. See you next time. What's more fun than pair programming? Asynchronous, remote, massive scale pair programming. In 2011, I presented an I.O. session, pro tips for building context-aware apps. 
Those tips went into a sample app that targets Android Honeycomb and supports Cupcake. That's Android 1.6 if you're keeping track. That covered 98% of active devices in 2011. Today, it's less than 3.2%. Clearly, it's time to do an update. I asked if you'd like to watch me go through the process of updating the app, and you said yes. So, despite some skepticism... You know they're just trolling you, right? Nobody wants to watch you write code on YouTube. I don't know, there's like the Facebook movie, Silicon Valley, CSI Cyber, Scorpion, these are all really, really popular, and this is a lot like them. This is nothing like them. Well, wait, you haven't been telling people that this is like them, right? Because this is nothing like them. This would be boring. Strong skepticism. I'm giving it a shot. The result is pivotal. It's a lot like Serial. It's not like that either. Each episode is part of a larger story. Having an app targeting an API that's fallen off the sliding scale of relevancy is a great opportunity to replace tricks, hacks, and deprecated APIs with a robust modern architecture. That means integrating the Android support library, the fuse location provider, the job schedule, the material design, enhanced notifications, Android Wear, and all the features of ice cream sandwich, jelly bean, Kit Kat, lollipop, and marshmallow. And everything else I don't yet realize needs to be updated. You won't see much of me, but imagine me here, dressed neatly at a tidy desk, with a warm cup of tea. Definitely do not picture me with my feet up on a messy desk, and absolutely not me at home in my pajamas. Picture me here, in my happy place. Fredo, we're gonna need you to clear out of here. We've got another shoot. Can't you do this at your desk? I'm Reda Meyer. Join me on the Android Developers YouTube channel as I bring an old app back to the future, here in my office. Welcome to Pivotal. There's something really satisfying about getting your app to look great on your device. But just because there's over 11,000 other Android devices out there doesn't mean you need to build 11,000 other layouts to make a great looking app. Not if you're using responsive UI principles. You may have noticed that I'm not Ian or Joanna. My name is Mike Denny, a design advocate on the Google design team. First things first, thinking about specific phones and tablets is only going to get you into trouble. There's a wide spectrum of devices and not that much difference between the largest phone and the smallest tablet. Instead, think more generally about how much space you have to work with. This can come in three different flavors, width, height, and smallest width. Width is super important and should be the basis for breakpoints in designing and building your UI. For example, 600 dp in width is the first point where you could consider having a side-by-side -side summary and detail level view any lower and you won't be giving each level of full attention it deserves. Height is less common when designing a responsive UI, but keep in mind that something like a vertically scrolling container is going to be difficult to use if you can only see one or two elements at a time due to a constrained height. Smallest width, unlike height or width, is designed to be rotation insensitive as it's just the smaller of the two values. This gives you a better idea of how much space is available and is an easy way to ensure that your app remains consistent as the device is rotated. You don't want to force your user to relearn your navigation structure every time they rotate their device. This is particularly important in the multi-window world. When your app is resized, your width, height, and smallest width are going to be updated. You might be going from full screen on a tablet down to what amounts to a portrait-oriented phone worth of space. Here's where a good responsive UI can make for a smooth transition. There are a number of common patterns you might consider when building that responsive UI, such as revealing previously hidden content as the screen size grows, transforming your navigation pattern or switching from a list to a grid, dividing your screen into multiple sections side by side, reflowing specific elements, expanding the size or margins of individual elements, or even changing the position of specific elements like a floating action button. Check out the blog post for more details on designing a responsive UI and specific patterns you can use to build better apps. Hey gang, did you know you can send notifications to iOS devices using Google Cloud Messaging? Well you can! Why would you ever want to do that? Maybe that's a better question. Let's find out the answer on this episode of Route 85. So notifications, they're a great way for you to engage with your users. 
They let your customers know you have important new information for them. And when used responsibly, they can be a great way to keep users coming back to your app. But they're not super fun to implement. There's a lot of steps required to set up notifications in the first place. You need logic on both the client and the server. And if you're developing a cross-platform mobile app, and most of you are these days, you have to do this for Android and for iOS. And uh, I'm not just talking about two sets of client logic either. It turns out sending notifications to iOS and Android devices requires different logic on the server too. See, if you've done any notifications work in the past, you're probably used to talking to APNS, that's the Apple Push Notification Service, to deliver notifications to iOS devices, and to GCM, that's Google Cloud Messaging, to deliver notifications to Android devices. And while sending notifications through these two services is similar, they each have slightly different features, use different protocols, accept different message payloads, and return different responses, all of which means that you gotta keep track of what kind of device each of your users has and use two completely different code paths to send a notification. Or do you? Well, well, no, no you don't. You see, one pretty great feature about Google Cloud Messaging that a lot of people don't know about is that GCM can relay to APNS any notifications you wanna to send to an iOS device. Now granted, you'll need to do some setup work like upload your APNS certificate to GCM and make sure your client sends its device token to the GCM service. But once you've done that, you can use GCM to send all of your notifications, no matter what platform your target device is, and GCM will deliver your notifications to the correct device using the appropriate service. What all this means is that you don't need to care about what device your user has anymore. You just, has, you just have to write and maintain one code path, and as we all know, less code means less room for mistakes. But it's not just about using less code. By using GCM to handle your messaging for you, you can take advantage of some of the other nice features that GCM offers to developers, like topics. Topics allow your app to subscribe to notifications about any particular topic that you or your users want to. For example, let's say you've got a weather app and I, as a loyal weather fan, want to be notified whenever there's extreme weather happening in my zip code. Well, in the old way of doing this, you'd probably need to set up a database where you keep track of each one of your users and their devices and their zip codes and do this whole select users where blah 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 query, then loop through the results and send notifications to each device that you get back from this database query. But with topics, none of that's necessary. Instead, your app simply tells GCM that you're interested in subscribing to, say, the weather 94043 topic. Then, next time there's rain in California, for us that, that counts as extreme weather. Oh my gosh, there's something coming down from the sky! I don't know if it's water, if it's acid! I can't go out! I don't know how to drive anymore! Yeah, that seems about right. So yeah, with topics, your server simply tells GCM to send notifications to all devices subscribed to the weather 94043 topic. And I will get notified along with all other devices subscribed to that topic. So there's no database required. Go ahead and throw it out. Oh, uh, as long as you weren't using it for anything else, I guess. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. GCM has other useful features too, like upstream messaging, which allows your app to communicate to your server through GCM. This can be helpful in cases where you might want some lightweight communication from your clients to your server, but don't feel like dealing with the hassle of setting up and maintaining a full-blown server open to the entire world. Or read receipts, where in some, but not all, situations, you can be notified that a user has received your message, something you can't normally do through APNS alone. Oh, and in case you're wondering, all this is free, as in, please send us zero dollars, uh, and it's using much of the same infrastructure that Google uses for its own apps, so it'll probably scale for yours. So there's a lot to learn when it comes to notifications, and I encourage you to get started here with our Google Cloud Messaging documentation for iOS. We also have a couple of sample applications for you to look at. There's Friendly Ping, our cross-platform chat app powered entirely through Google Cloud Messaging, as well as the GCM Playground, which lets you easily experiment with sending calls through the GCM service. And keep watching Route 85. Maybe you'll see another Google Cloud Messaging video pop up in the future. If only we had, we had some way of letting you know when that happened. Well, I'm stumped. Consider the simple URL. A few years ago, these were pretty straightforward. You clicked on one and nine times out of 10, you went to a web page. Then things changed. People started using their mobile devices for, well, everything. And these devices in turn started supporting the idea of deep links. Click on one of these deep links and it could take you not just anywhere on the web, but anywhere in an app as well. So you could use a deep link to point directly to a specific restaurant inside a reservation app, or give your new customers a personalized welcome based on the link that brought them to your app in the first place. At least, that's how they worked in theory. In practice, deep linking had issues. 
The same link wouldn't necessarily work on an iOS or Android device, and they behave very differently, or didn't work at all, for users who didn't have your app installed. And for people who did install your app through a deep link, all of that great link info was typically lost during the installation process, leaving your personalized warm welcome out in the cold. So while deep links were great in theory, their uses were a little more limited in practice. Enter Firebase Dynamic Links. Firebase Dynamic Links are deep links that work the way you want them to. So you can create one single link that behaves one way on iOS, another on Android, and even a third on a desktop browser, and it will take you to a place that's appropriate to that platform. You can also set up dynamic links to change their behavior depending on whether or not your user has your app installed. For users who don't have your app installed, maybe you send them to your website, maybe you take them to the Play Store, or maybe you show them an interstitial describing the benefits of your app before you take them to the App Store for a smoother transition. More importantly, these links can survive the App Store installation process. So if your user installs your app when clicking on a dynamic link, all of that information is still available to you when your user opens up your app for the first time. So what does this mean? It means you can use dynamic links the way you've always wanted to use deep links. You can use them in marketing campaigns, from email to social media to banner ads to, heck, even QR codes. And in addition to install attribution tracking, you know, the kind that lets you know which campaigns are getting you the highest quality users, you can also give your users a customized first-time experience based on the campaign that brought them there. So if a user installs your music app because you showed them an ad for classical music, you can make sure your app takes them right to Chopin's latest hits when they first open it up. Dynamic links are great for sharing, too. Your users can use them to share recipes, links to their favorite level in your game, or even coupon codes. In fact, dynamic links are the technology that powers Firebase invites. And because dynamic links are a Firebase product, you can see their stats directly through the Firebase console. Find out how many people clicked on a link, or use Firebase Analytics to find out which of your users first opened your app through a particular link. To find out more about dynamic links, check out the documentation here and give them a try. And deep link away. Bitcoin represents a way to transfer money anonymously and at almost no cost. And since it's an arbitrary currency with no nationality attached to it, you're free to exchange it with anyone in the world. What is money? Resources are limited and they hold explicit value to people. Most resources are physical and such needed to be traded in a physical form. Diamonds, gold coins, chickens or bikes. At some point, it becomes too difficult to physically transact those objects, and it's easier to agree, collectively, on the value of cash instead of gold. As we know today, this has many advantages. Credit cards and the modern banking basically gave us another abstraction layer on top of cash. There is a centralized system which defines who owns what resources. All of these trades are made virtually. This is the backbone of why Bitcoin is a valid idea. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the centralized, anonymous, digital-only currency that recently received public attention. Bitcoin was originally developed in 2008. Like in any good mystery, someone using the alias Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper describing how Bitcoin could work. There's a very interesting story about this guy too. He must be very smart, but he never came forward to claim ownership or any part of the revenue. Just one year later, in 2009, Bitcoin started being traded. Where do they come from? Think about gold. You could buy it or mine it, and it's the same concept with Bitcoin. You do this by using your computer to hunt for 64 digit numbers. By having your computer repeatedly solve complex mathematical puzzles, you're competing with other miners to generate the number that the Bitcoin network is looking for. If your computer generates it first, you receive Bitcoins. The Bitcoin system is programmed to generate a fixed number of Bitcoins per unit of computing time. It is also self-sustaining, coded to prevent inflation, and encrypted to prevent anyone from disrupting its code. In the year 2140, the total number of Bitcoins in circulation will be capped at 21 million. So how much is a Bitcoin worth today? You'll need to Google it. Just type Bitcoin in US dollar, for example. You could also check it out at Priv.com. Why are they anonymous? 
Bitcoin are pseudo-anonymous because they are built upon this centralized system. The Bitcoins themselves are anonymous, the wallets are not. Here is why. The base algorithm creates anonymity, but as the recent court cases show, if your Bitcoin wallet is identified and attached to a person, then someone can go through and track every transaction you've made. Bitcoins exist entirely on their own because there's no central infrastructure to shut down. You are identified by nothing more than your Bitcoin wallet address, a string of randomized letters and numbers. There are absolutely no identifying characteristic beyond that. For the paranoid dude, you can simply create a new wallet for each transaction. Here are some interesting startups that push the technology forward. We are still in the initial phase of Bitcoins, and there are many challenges and opportunities ahead. Exchanges, wallets, merchant services, security, and more. But this is something for another episode. Until next time, eat your vegetables and listen to your partners. One word that's the bane of both the novice and expert programmer alike, threads. I'm Joanna Smith, and threading can be one of the greatest perf improvements you make, but it will also likely drive you crazy. Tom Sawyer illustrated threading perfectly a long time ago when he needed to paint that fence, because when you've got a large chunk of work to do and it's the same work over and over again, you call in some friends to get it done quickly. So for computations that are taking a long time, consider calling in reinforcements with threads. By allowing multiple threads of execution to operate on your dataset in parallel, you reduce the overall time required to complete the task. With Android, threading becomes especially important because the entire app runs on the main thread, which is also called the UI thread because it updates the UI. And when the UI stops responding, users stop using your app. So, when you want to perform some complex action in response to a button being pushed, for example, you'll want to move that off the main thread until it is finished so that the user can continue to interact with your app. Because there are a few things worse than the dreaded application not responding dialogue. However, integrating threads into your system is not for the faint of heart. You're going to have to rethink your entire approach to computational complexity and to your memory model in order to properly integrate threads. So, to avoid the rabbit hole, take advantage of the Android framework, which has been built to help you out. Careful thought and planning about your app's structure and flow will enable you to determine whether a thread should affect the UI or be entirely hidden. APIs like Async Task and Thread both help you manage the work and keep your app from hanging, but Async Task will also allow you to affect the UI, like when you want to display a progress dialog. So take a walk through your own app and see if there are places where it stops responding or gets exceptionally slow in response to a user action, and then move all of that extra work off the main thread. But, you know, thoughtfully. Don't just change things willy-nilly. Because while threading may be intimidating, it shouldn't scare you. What is scary, though, is bad performance, which is why you should check out the rest of our Android Performance Patterns content and consider joining our G Plus community for tips, tricks, and help. But most importantly, keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. And welcome to Supercharged. Now, this is a kind of TLDW. Last week, I did a live stream with Surma where we made some swipeable cards. Now, you probably recognize swipeable cards from things like Google Now, where you just kind of take a card and you dismiss it. And you can actually see what I've got on screen. This is what we ended up making. There you go, you see? Dismiss it and all that kind of good stuff. Now, the idea is, if you've not got an hour to watch that live stream back, although if you can, I would recommend it, and you can find the link to that below. If you can't, that's exactly what this is for. I want to step through the things that we learned, the things that we did, um, and just so you can get an insight into what actually went into it. So, before we actually get started, what I want to do is I want to step over to the Theory Corner. Oh yeah, Theory. Love Theory. And what we can do in Theory Corner is discuss what we need to do. Join me. Welcome to Theory Corner. You can tell it's Theory Corner because there's some theory in a corner. Now, this is what we have. We've got the cards. You can tell it's a card because it says card. The cards have will change transform on it. The idea I, I have here is that we want each card to be transformed around the screen. And so we want to give each card its own layer. The compositor then can move those around with the help of the GPU. So long as we stick to transform, opacity, and we set will change, we should be good. 
So we move the card as you touch and swipe, but as you get across to this side, we have this marker of like 0 0.35. Now I picked that at random. You could pick a different number. 0 0.35, if you go past that point, we basically say, well, this card is being dismissed. So we slide it off to the side. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to change the opacity. So the further you go across, the lower the opacity in both directions. So that works there. OK, so we're going to put each card on its own layer, and shift it side to side, and fade it out. Let's go back to reality. What we're going to do here is we're going to step into the code so you can actually see bit by bit what we actually did. Here's the cards. And what we do, first of all, is we basically create an array from the cards that we've got in the document. So we'd have to have some kind of code that adds and removes those cards later on. But don't worry about that. We'll just get on with what we've got here. The next thing to notice is that I've got these named functions on start, on move, on end, and update. Now, the first three are our input events. And I choose to do it this way. What I do is I take a copy of it by calling dot bind on this. And that takes it from the prototype into the actual instance. But it does another thing for me as well. It means that it's bound to the instance so that in those functions, when I say this dot whatever, it's actually applying to the instance and not to the target's event. No, wait, the event's target. Oh, one of those two. So it also does something else for me. It means that I can do add event listener and remove event listener. And I can call it by name. I can say like this dot on start, for example. You can see that down here in the add event listener. So I do add event listener for touch start, touch move, touch end, mouse down, mouse move, and mouse up. All of them. Yay. And I can just basically say on start, on move, on end, and so on. And if I wanted to do the remove event listeners, I could do that. And that would just work out fine for me. So. We've got our event listeners, and we have a bunch of variables here that are just sort of housekeeping, things that we need to keep a track on. The other thing I do is I start a request animation frame where I busily sort of kind of do an update. Now, if you're doing this in production, I would suggest you don't do it quite like this. I would start the request animation frame when the user starts interacting, and then when the animation's finished, I would stop doing the request animation frame loop. But for the case of this, just to keep things simple, I just start it right at the start, and I do a kind of busy loop through. So what do we actually do in the on start, on move, and on end event listeners? Wow, saying event listeners over and over and over and over and over again, that's not confusing for me. No. What are we doing those? Well, first, in the on start, the main thing is this. We basically take a marker for the start position of the interaction. Where does the user put their finger down on the screen? And then we get that with page x. The other thing we do is we take a copy of that for the current position. Because as we move our finger, we're going to update the current position so we know where we started and where we currently are. And the difference is how far we want to transform the card. The other things that we do in this is we set the dragon card to say true. But as we discussed in Theory Corner, we set will change to transform. Now we can check that that actually works by going back to the code, bringing up DevTools. And in the rendering settings, we're going to show layer borders. Anything that's got its own layer is going to go orange around its border. You ready? So when I click, you can see that we immediately the card gets its own layer, which is really cool. That means that we can transform and move it around cheaply, like we discussed over there in the theory corner. Here's what we've got in the on move. It's fairly straightforward. All we do is we take the current position of the input, and we basically say that's the current x. Now inside the update, what we can do is we can say if they're dragging the card, the screen x, which is basically the position of the card on the screen, is the current minus the start. That's basically how far they've moved. And we can apply the transform to account for that. Ta -da! Now, when the user stops interacting, we actually have to make a decision. If you remember over in Theory Corner, we said if the user is past that 0.35 marker, so it's a sort of a 0 to 1 range, 1 being the full distance of the card, 0 being not at all. If they go past 0 0.35, which is what I've chosen, but you could choose a different number, what we want to say is they are dismissing the card. And we do this by setting a target x, which we use later on in the update. And here we do screen x plus equals the target minus the current screen x over 4. What this is going to do is it's going to ease the card to that final position, which will either be the center or it'll be off to the side, depending on whether we've decided that they've gone past the point of dismissal or not. Then there's some a little bit of tidy up that we do here. We basically normalize the drag distance, and we use that to set the opacity so that the further across you get, the more fady the card is. Ta -da! So far, so good. 
So the last little bit is what we do when you dismiss the card, because what we want to do is we want to slide all the other cards into place. And we do that with this animate other cards into position function. Let me show you what it looks like without that. Let's switch off the layer borders. OK, here's what it looks like without that. You see all the other cards just snap into place, which you could do, but doesn't look quite so nice. So what we need to do is we need to transform them down quickly to where they moved from, which will be the height of the card plus the margin. And you can see that here. So we take every card that's after the current one, which is this, and we basically say translate yourself the height of a card plus 20 pixels, which is the margin. And again, this is hard coded, so you'd probably make this more dynamic in production. And then we basically go from that to no transform at all. And we use an easing of this cubic bezier and a duration of 150 milliseconds. And all we need to do is just say card.animate with those settings. And then when you've finished, we say the animation's complete, at which point we can just reset the target and call it a day. And the animation's done. So with that switched on, you can see we get a nice, smooth animation. So the only other thing to notice is when I'm dismissing the cards, you can see that the other ones get their own layer temporarily. This is because we're using element.animate and we're using a transform, and that means that those get temporarily promoted to their own layer. Cool. That means that it's also doing the same thing that we had over in Theory Corner. We're getting its own layer, which means it happens nice and performantly, and then when it's finished, the browser automatically demotes them back, and we're all good. So there you have it. That's swipeable cards. If you've got time, make sure you watch the live stream. There's loads in there. There's us finding and fixing bugs. There's just chatting about the general approach. All sorts of goodies in there. Hopefully you've, uh, you've enjoyed this little TLDW. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the flip side.
All right, what a great day it is today. I don't know about you, but um, I was dying yesterday. It was so hot out there. I talked to everyone in the tent next door. Um, I felt bad for them because I'm sure I smelled terrible. Went home, had to take a shower, washed my Firebase shirt for sure to, to uh, be able to be here today. Um, my name is Doug Stevenson. Welcome. It's great to see a packed room. And for everyone on the live stream, welcome as well. Um, <clears throat> I, I have sort of an eclectic mix of things to share with you today with respect to Firebase and the Android SDK. So Firebase, as you may have seen, is a suite of integrated products designed to help you develop your app, grow your user base, and earn money. Um, <clears throat> now, I won't go into all of Firebase. I'll go into some things that I thought was interesting uh, when I sort of helped build and uh, promote Firebase from an Android perspective. <clears throat> so first of all, you should know Firebase uh, works with Play Services. In fact, Firebase for Android is part of Play Services. Firebase is distributed uh, with Play Services, and so it might be interesting to know that um, from the beginning, um, if you've tracked Play Services progression, uh, the, a lot of people like to do APK breakdown. So the, the uh, uh, Play Services APK used to be just a single APK with a single DEX with code in it. So everyone knows what this is like. This is just like everyone else's app. And then when Play Services started to grow, uh, we had to do multi-DEX. Now, um, as you know, DEX has a, uh, a, a limit of 65,000 or so uh, reference methods in it. Uh, when you exceed that limit, then, then you have to start multi-DEXing. So Play Services is just like any other app where it had to do multi-DEXing. Now, Play Services is kind of special in that uh, they have to take very special care to determine which uh, uh, objects go into the main DEX. So the main DEX uh, normally is constructed by the build tools for you and will pick out the, the classes in it that need to be in the main DEX. But uh, there are certain things that, uh, that, that need to be in there that maybe you have to tell it. So if you're using reflection uh, or if you're doing anything prior to the creation of multi-DEX, that has to go into the main DEX. And if you have uh, questions about the nuances of how this works, go find the Android office hours. Um, they can help you work through that. Now, when Play Services continued to grow, we found that we needed a, a more of a modular architecture. So uh, new features of Play Services are now being embedded into the APK as modules. Um, and the, the value of having modules here is that uh, this lets us do things like independent updates of, uh, of modules. So um, in the past, if we wanted to update Play Services, we'd have to do this monolithic APK download. And that took you know, a lot of bandwidth and a lot of time. Um, and it disrupted apps that were trying to use it. So now with this modular interface, we're letting uh, the, in the modules update themselves outside of the normal Play Services release cycle. So what this means for your app is uh, your APK and your code can now link directly into the modules that are in the Firebase uh, or that are in Play Services. So when you use Firebase, a lot of times you're actually uh, referencing code that lives within Play Services. That code is being pulled directly into your app, not physically, but in terms of linking. So you can think of it like kind of like a shared library. Um, now this is great because now you don't have to go through a binder interface to, to, to get things done like you did with uh, Play Services previously. Now, to get Play Services, uh, you, to get Firebase, you will have to download the latest update Play Services. So uh, be sure to get version 30. This is a screenshot of the standalone updater. Um, once you have version 30, then you can start developing with Firebase on Android. Uh, so the Firebase Gradle plugin, which I guess is more correctly called uh, the uh, Play Services plugin for Android, uh, you might be curious what happens with that plugin. Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about what happens. Uh, three things. One, it will read a configuration from your Google services JSON. So Firebase is just like Play Services was, where you go to a console, you get a JSON file, you drop it into your app. This contains configuration that your app will use uh, in order to operate correctly. Um, and the other two things it will do is inject Maven dependencies. So uh, if you're looking at this bit of code here, it might look a little bit strange. This is actually groovy code. This is not Java code. So you'll notice the lack of a, of a semicolon and single quotes around some of the strings. So what we're doing here is uh, the, the plugin will reach into your project, look into its dependencies collection, and add a compile dependency on Firebase Core. Uh, now, this Firebase Core module is kind of interesting because it contains no code. Now, why would we add a dependency on something that contains no code? That seems kind of weird uh, until you look inside the Maven POM file for this. So uh, a POM file is just uh, sort of metadata about how uh, a dependency works. And you look in the highlighted section here, you can see that the Firebase Core module depends on Firebase Analytics. 
So when you apply uh, the Google Services plugin to your Firebase app, you will get analytics for free. Now, this is kind of important to note. This is how important we think that analytics is for your app. You get it always. It's a crucial part of Firebase applications. And you'll see that uh, throughout this conference, you'll see how Firebase analytics actually enhances the capabilities of the other components that you use in your app. Uh, the third thing uh, that, the, that the plugin will do is inject some resources. So uh, you can see in this bit of code, we're reaching into your project, into the Android configuration. And for each of the variants that you're building, what we'll do is uh, find a unique location for that variant. That's your file output directory. And then we'll create a task. And this task, uh, what it does is it will generate resources when it's called. So on that variant, we can register a resource generating task pass it that, that task that will actually do the work, and feed it the output directory. Now, what happens here is uh, this is, this is a, an API within the Gradle uh, plugin that uh, when it's called, you can say if this, if this plugin wants to generate some resources, this is an output directory that, uh, that the uh, rest of the build will use to look for those resources. And what this does is it actually drops fully formed, valid um, uh, Android resource files, XML files, that will be merged into the build. So what all this task is doing is it's reading out of that JSON file all of those values and keys and configurations um, and storing them as resources. And that's how your app actually gets a hold of all the different things that it needs to operate properly. So um, if you're developing with Firebase, you'll likely come across this new task API. Now, uh, this, is how the, the, uh, this is how Play Services is doing concurrency within, within your app. So this is like uh, the API that uh, pretty much all products will be using going forward. Um, this is created just for Firebase APIs. However, um, this could be applied to any sort of Play Services API in the future. Now, uh, for Firebase specifically, if you're using remote config, authentication, or file storage, you will run across this task API. So it's an important thing to know. Um, so the general form of the async API is, uh, let's say you have some API, and we'll call it Firebase thing, and say you call a method on that do stuff. Now, uh, this do stuff method, if it wants to do things asynchronously, it will return immediately and generate a task object. And this task object is parameterized by some result type, whatever it wants to generate. So here we just have a task that returns some result. Um, and on that task, it's, this is a representation of background work. On that task, you can register listeners. So you can have a success listener, um, and then there's a callback in there that will receive the result type when it's been generated. Um, you can register a failure listener, which then receives an exception of whatever happened uh, that caused the task to fail. Um, so that, that right there is all you actually need to uh, handle these things correctly. Now, uh, there's a third version where you can just register an incomplete listener. And what this does is it bundles both success and failure up into a single callback. Um, and if you choose to use an incomplete listener, uh, what you do is you get a task and then you can ask that task, did you complete successfully? If you did, give me, re give me a result. If you did not complete successfully, well, then give me the exception. So you can choose. You can either register success or failure uh, separately and independently, or you can do a completion listener and handle both in the same callback. So there's four ways to get task results. Um, I've showed you the general format, but there's four different ways, and you should know each one of them. First of all, there's a callback on the main thread. So this is what I just showed you in the, in the previous slide. Uh, you can add a success failure or completion listener, give it a uh, listener, and this listener will be invoked on the main thread. Now, there's a different format, and you should know this one. This is actually more important than the last one, where you can get a callback scoped to an activity. And what it means to be scoped to an activity is uh, this listener that you register uh, will not get executed if the activity goes through its on stop. So if an activity is being stopped, the listener will be automatically unregistered and it will not execute. Now, this is really important because if you register a listener without unregistering it, uh, when the activity dies, you can have an activity leak, and that's terrible. Uh, you know, long-running tasks that exceed or go beyond the life cycle of an activity can cause a leak. Um, this causes out-of-memory problems, and they're actually very difficult to diagnose. So if you're calling this API within an activity, use the second format. Use the format where it accepts an activity object, and you uh, only register or only have that listener for that one activity. 
Now, if you want to receive your result on another thread, so not on the main thread, if you, if you want to handle something in the background thread and say you want to do more blocking work after that, you can feed an executor to, uh, to the task listener. Now, if you've never dealt with an executor before, it's basically a Java or a JVM construct that, that identifies a thread to do work on. So the executor will make a decision and say, uh, how do I deploy this to another thread? It could be just a single thread, or it could be a pool of threads, or it could be uh, a, a growing and shrinking pool of threads. Uh, this API doesn't care. Um, the executor cares where the thread goes. You just hand it an executor uh, that makes that decision. And the last way is you can actually just block the current thread if you want to wait for the result in line. Now, I say right away, don't do this on the main thread. Don't block the main thread. We can't say that enough. Don't do that in your, in your Android applications. It can lead to a fairly bad user experience. Uh, but if you do want to block some other thread, um, there's a utility method on tasks called await. And you can call tasks await, give it the task that you want to wait for. It will block. Uh, and then the result will come out of that. Now, if you're not willing to wait indefinitely, you can feed it a timeout, and that timeout will uh, sort of time box the amount of time you're willing to wait, and it will return uh, with, a, with an execution exception. Now, you will have to catch both an execution exception if the task fails or an interrupted exception if the thread is interrupted. So you, you'll have to handle that case here. So let's say, what do you want to, how do you do a sequence of work? Now, this, is, uh, this can be common in some Android apps where you have uh, task one, which leads to task two, and so on and so forth. You have to do them in order. Uh, there's a special way to express this in the task API using continue with or using continue with task. And there's a subtle difference between the two, and I'll unpack those right now. Um, so if you're using continue with, you will have to create a continuation object. And what a continuation object does is it says, I know how to, uh, uh, there, there's some result type for input and there's some result type for output. And within my method, when it's called the then, uh, within the then method, it receives the task that's generating the input type. So you can see um, inside the method, we're calling task.getResult. That returns the input type. Then we can do some transformations on it, do whatever we need to do, and then generate an output type in response. Response. And to make use of that, you just call uh, on the origin task, you call task continue with, feed it the continuation, and that feeds you yet another task, uh, which is parameterized by the output type. Now, if you're using continuous task, it's very similar but slightly different in that continue with task generates a task. It doesn't generate the result type directly. It generates a task that is responsible for generating the output type. Um, and the format for execution is just the same task.continue with task. It returns a task object that you can then wait on to get these results. Now, um, it begs the question, uh, oh, no, I'm on the wrong slide. OK, so the upshot of all this task chaining business is that you have a, a, a sort of syntactic sugar for executing a series of tasks. So um, if you're like me and you've worked with uh, data processing frameworks like Spark, uh, you know that you have a series of steps that you have to execute. So say, for example, you have a query, and that's going to uh, generate a result set. Then you want to filter and maybe do some mapping, so translate from one data type to another, sort those results, and group them by type. Uh, you can express that very succinctly like this. So this is how you do um, serialized uh, chain of execution. So <clears throat> um, if you want to do parallel task execution, and I would say this is actually more common than, uh, than serial task, ex task execution. If you want to do it in parallel, and this is very common if you say uh, want to kick off, I don't know, an authentication and a query um, and do a database read, and you want those all to happen at the same time, but you only want to progress to the next step when all of those are complete. So you, you only want to wait as long as the longest one of those tasks. So to run things in parallel, uh, you can use uh, tasks.winAll. So tasks, again, is a utility class. WinAll is a utility method that says, uh, I'll take each one of the tasks that you want to wait on, and I'll generate from that a final task. Now, this is asynchronous. You'll get a task in response asynchronously parameterized by void. It itself doesn't generate anything. But it gives you a target to listen to to know when all the tasks are complete. So on this final task, you add a success listener. And inside there, you can reach into all the other tasks that were in flight and get their results. Now, it's worth noting that if any one of these tasks fail, the entire thing will fail. So you'll need to check for that as well. Um, same thing with uh, uh, serial task execution. If any one of your tasks in the serial chain fails, the whole thing will fail. And in fact, that exception will get propagated on from task to task until the final result will receive the original exception that caused the failure. OK, so the easiest way to create your own task 
uh, is to create what's called a callable. And if you've never dealt with a callable, it's a Java construct, very similar to runnable. Um, so runnable takes nothing as input and generates nothing as output. But callable takes nothing as input and generates some parameterized type as output. So in this case right here, uh, we're creating a callable. It's parameterized by some result type, and it simply returns that result type. So put your work in a callable. And then all you do is call tasks.call, and then you feed it that callable. And immediately, you'll get a task uh, object that, is, um, that you can wait on to get that result. Now, it's, it's important to note that tasks.call will schedule your work to run on the main thread. So if you're doing some blocking work in your callable, you probably don't want that. You probably want to schedule that on another thread. And again, there's a format that takes an executor. So create an executor, schedule your work on that, schedule your task on that, and then you can use that task in serial or parallel uh, tasks along with the Firebase tasks. So now, if you have your own threading framework, and I know there's a bunch of them out there, and everyone has their own you know, favorite asynchronous threading framework, um, you don't have to abandon that to use tasks, and you don't have to abandon, you don't have to wedge tasks into that other format. There's a way to do some interoperability, and there's a bunch of code on this, and I'll try to unpack it. So the interop method here, or the, the class here is called task completion source. And what a task completion source does is it provides kind of an empty task uh, for other threads to uh, feed their results into. So when you have a, t a task completion source, you can get a task out of it and then register a, a success listener. Um, and then that success listener will again be parameterized by the type that you're expecting. Now, in this example, I'm uh, below that, I'm going to fire up a new thread. Now, you shouldn't do this in an Android app, but this is here just for illustration. What you can do is, in that other thread, whatever it's doing, if it's going to generate some result and you need to feed that result into a task, you can just call source.setResult. And what that does is the task that's in that result will then be fully completed or fully resolved. And so that's how you can have things in your other asynchronous framework work with the task uh, framework. So um, that's all great. Um, now I'd like to move on to some specific product details. So I'll tell you a little bit about Firebase crash reporting. Now, crash reporting is special to me because I actually worked on this. Like, this was, you know, I, I'm actually the developer advocate for crash reporting in Test Lab. And so I have a, sort of a special uh, place for me with uh, uh, crash reporting. So you might ask the question how do you actually detect a crash? You know, that seems like a strange thing. How do you do it? Um, so I'm sure you all know this dialog. If you're an Android developer, you have seen this dialog. If you haven't seen this dialog, I'm willing to bet you've never written a line of Android code or you're a really darn good developer. So, um, and actually, I think this, this dialog is actually kind of funny because it's saying something rather unfortunate happened and I'm asked to be okay with it. Now, I don't think this is okay. This is, this is not okay. So the button should actually say not okay. I really think it should say not okay. But in this case, I'm being asked to say that it's okay. And then when you push okay, then the, then the, the, the uh, process finally dies. So um, the way to handle this case is using something called an uncaught exception handler. And this is a regular Java construct. Uh, this is an interface under, under uh, Java lang thread. You can register one of these, uh, and this will get notified if there is an exception that popped off the call stack. So if there was a, say, usually a runtime exception, more often than not a null pointer exception, that made its way all the way back to the top of the call stack, and you want to know if that happened use uh, an uncaught exception handler. Uh, so the interface of that is pretty simple. Um, here I'm creating an anonymous uncaught exception handler. I'm, uh, I'm going to receive the thread that actually generated that and the throwable that made it outside the call stack. And then what I can do is to register this for all threads within my JVM, or Art or Dalvik or whatever you want to call it, uh, you can call set default uncaught exception handler, a great verbose Java name, pass it that uh, handler, and then what happens is any time uh, for any thread, if it's going to crash uh, with an exception, you'll get called before um, the process finally dies. Now, actually, I advanced a little too soon. So, um, if you, if you register an uncaught exception handler, that does nothing. So like in the previous side, there was, no, uh, there was no implementation there. If you register that, it will actually keep your app from crashing. It will continue to run, which is probably not what you want. Because if a runtime exception gets thrown, that will actually, you know, that's a bad thing for your app. It really should die. Things could be in a bad state. You don't want to continue. So what you really want to do is call through to the prior exception handler. So this is the best practice. This is kind of the, the understood practice for exception handlers. The first thing you do 
you get the prior default exception handler. Then you create your own and call through to the prior one when you're done. This lets, you, uh, this lets a bunch of components all create a different sort of like chain of, res uh, not chain of responsibility, but a chain of action. So you can register a bunch of default exception handlers. Each one of them will run in turn until the original default exception handler, the Android exception handler, which is responsible for putting up that, uh, the crash dialog will finally run. So uh, you've probably seen this as well. This uh, is an ANR or application not responding. Um, this happens when you run something on the main thread that takes more than five seconds, and more often than not, then that's some sort of like network access or file access that took too long, or some sort of algorithm that got out of control. Um, this is a bad user experience. Um, again, it's asking me to be okay with that. I'm not really okay with it, um, and I probably don't want to wait. Um, but this is, not a, this is not generated from an uncaught exception handler. This is Android kicking in and said, look, your main thread is, you know, is, is, is out of order. You know, the user needs to be able to decide, do I want to keep waiting for this? Now, it's worth noting that inside your default um, uncaught exception handler, if you block too long an Android, you can still ANR the app. So and your uncaught exception handlers still have to follow the general rules of Android development where you don't block it. It's a, kind of a bad idea. Um, and if you do block for more than five seconds and the user chooses to terminate the app by saying, OK, you'll lose that crash. The, the Android as a platform will kill your app. So um, in your uh, uncaught exception handler, you need to be quick. You need to get out and let that app crash and let the user move on. Okay, so uh, all that aside, now hold that it all in your mind for a moment and say, uh, now let's talk about how crash reporting actually works. So at some point, we need to register this uncaught exception handler. Crash reporting needs to do this. And we use a content provider for this. Now that seems weird. Why would you use a content provider to register crash reporting? Isn't a content provider supposed to provide content? And you would say, yeah, of course, a content provider is supposed to provide content. But there's some interesting properties about content providers that make this interesting. Um, and it's, uh, it's worth a while to look at how an Android process actually starts up. So there's a, there's a procedure that every Android app goes through. So the first thing that happens when an Android process starts up is every content provider that you uh, declare in your manifest goes through its on create in order of priority. So if there's a priority definition there, it will go in that order. Uh, now, it's also, also worth noting that this happens in your main process only. Um, if you have a multi-process app, and most of you probably do not, but if you, ha if you have a multi-process app, this process, uh, the content providers will not be created off the main process. The second thing that happens is your application subclass will be created. So if you've defined an application subclass, which uh, I think something like a third of all Android apps do this, that will be initialized, go through its on create after all the content providers. Then once that happened, uh, the third thing that happens is whatever component that needs to be invoked will be invoked. So usually it's an app launch and so an activity will come into play or a service could have been started or a broadcast receiver. Uh, whatever the invoke component is, it will not be created and run until uh, content providers and applications all in it. So it's worth noting here, content provider is the earliest hook into the Android process, right? So that's why we initialize crash reporting there. If we initialize crash reporting in a content provider, that means we will happen before application and before everything else. So that's one benefit. The other benefit to using a content provider is that content providers participate in Android manifest merger. So in Android, you know that if you have library projects and uh, all of those things from all of those manifests all get combined into a single manifest for your app. So if we define uh, in our crash reporting library a content provider that does init, that automatically gets pulled into your app, and that automatically causes initialization. Now, this is great because you don't have to write a line of code to initialize. All you do is depend on the library, and manifest merger will bring our content provider in, do the initialization, um, and it's uh, super easy for you. Now, the reason, now you, you say, couldn't you use application for that? Well, you could use application, but applications don't participate in Android manifest merger. Uh, the only way you can define um, an, uh, an application object is you and your manifest. Uh, library projects cannot contribute to applications. Uh, they can't hook into onCreate, so that's why we're using Content Provider. Now, the Firebase uncaught exception handler does a number of things. The first thing it does is it collects a lot of uh, information about the device. So this is when we go off and find the device type and measure memory and uh, serialize the exception. And we're, what we're going to do is dump that all into a protobuf and send that to a crash service. Now, the crash service is an Android service. And the way we built it, uh, at least for launch, for this launch, is to run in another process. So the crash services that do 
persistence of the crash. So we'll write it to disk and do the transmission. All happens in another process. Now, this is a clever idea, right? Uh, if you remember back before, you can say, um, you know, the, the idea of causing an ANR within your crash handler is a bad idea. So what we wanted to do is get all that data as fast as possible and ship it off to another process, let that do the blocking, let that, that, let that do the writing to this, let that do the writing to network, and then let the main app process crash gracefully and let the user move on and do what they want. Um, this also lets us do persistent retries, so this other process can go and uh, keep retrying and sending that crash so we can get it as fast as possible. Now, <clears throat> there's a little problem with this, with this scheme. Um, so let's look at what the problem is. Now, I don't know if you can see it right away. Uh, we didn't see it until, um, in, until late in the, in, in the development cycle, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, but here's the situation we have. We have a main app process, and it goes through its content provider, it goes through its application, and it goes through its uh, invoke components. Now, we have this background process that's handling the crash. It goes through its application in it, and the crash service gets invoked. The problem here is that if your application object is writing to some shared resource, to a database or to a file, there's a potential for a race conflict here. Um, if, so most app developers don't actually depend or expect that their application object would be run twice. The normal expectation is that it's run once in a single process. But because we're, we're running crash reporting in another process, that means we have a second application object just like the first, and it's doing the same thing as the first. So if your application object is writing to a database, you could actually run into a locking problem. Um, so we, we actually didn't, we, we didn't detect this. The, the people who detected this were our early access partners. We had a couple partners who had some strange errors and we couldn't figure it out. And it turned out this was the problem. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we're launching crash reporting for Android as beta uh, because of this. Now, it should, be, uh, it should be told that crash reporting is you know, it's production ready. We want you to use it. We really hope you use it. We think it's a great tool. But you should know if your application object is doing any of, any of this uh, writing to a database or writing to a file, crash reporting may cause problems for you. And this is something we're, we're hoping to revolve, uh, resolve. Now, there's another problem with this, uh, this, this plan of using a background task is that there's a movement within Google to encourage apps to eliminate back, uh, background invisible work. Now, I'll define what invisible work is. Invisible work is something your app is doing without a UI displaying. So if you have no activity that started uh, in the foreground, um, so that would be uh, visible work. Or uh, if you have a service that has a notification in the curtain, that's visible work. So if you don't have either, either one of those situations, that's invisible invisible work. And at Google, we're trying to you know, encourage developers to cut back on the amount of invisible work because that can you know, cause battery drain or unknown um, like data usage. So for crash reporting, this actually you know, is we're doing invisible work. So we need to cut down on that. Um, now, I was expecting to have a URL to a blog post where we talk a little bit more about that. Unfortunately, it's not available. I'll have that on Monday. I think the plan is to, to publish this on Monday. So if you join the spaces for this talk, uh, I can get you that URL. I think it will be posted on our Medium blog. So if you want to read more about that, um, follow up with that. So in the next version of Crash Reporting, we will actually not have a background process. We're working on eliminating that. Um, the upsides, of course, it will work more widely, so we don't have to worry about apps with uh, application objects that, that, uh, that aren't compatible. And it'll be more compliant to development trends. We'll be cutting back on this invisible work. The downside is that there is an increased chance of latency. So with the old solution, we could be fairly certain that we could get that crash packaged and sent very quickly. Um, but if we're competing with the idea that the app may die before we can get the crash you know, out of the, you know, into our servers and out of the app, um, there's just a, a, a reduced a, a risk that we just can't get it immediately. And also, this gives us uh, a, a sort of constraint of being able to retry less frequently. So um, that said, there's trade-offs. We're going for the, for the no background process version. OK. So that's crash reporting. Um, I'll say a little bit about how things work on, oh, it didn't advance. Oh, Firebase Analytics, OK. So um, another interesting thing, you might be wondering, how does Firebase Analytics track user behavior? Now, um, if you recall earlier, we put analytics in every Firebase app. This is a very important component. Um, and what it does, one of the things it does, is it tracks the usage for your app. Now, this is great. You do nothing. You actually write zero lines of code, and you get tracking. And you might be wondering, well, how does analytics actually do that? If you're not writing code, how does it reach into my app and know uh, how the user is using it? Uh, so 
the question that we're trying to ask is, how do we determine when the app is in the foreground and when the app is in the background? How do you, how do you track the time spent in the app and how do they navigate activities? Um, and this is useful for de determining things like how long a session is uh, or how, how frequently a user is using your app. Now, the way we do that is using something called activity lifecycle callbacks. This is an API in Android. It's available since um, Ice Cream Sandwich and beyond, so API level 14. Uh, if you create one of these and register it with your app, you can receive callbacks for every activity in your app. So this is like a universal listener for all activities. So, you know, all activities clearly have to go through, you know, their uh, uh, create, start, resume, and so forth. Uh, you can listen to every single one of those. And this is how Firebase Analytics determines how users are using your app. So uh, if, for this interface, we have created, started, resumed, pause, stop, destroyed, and save instant state. You can listen to all of these, but there's two in particular that uh, are of interest to us in determining how a user is using your app, and that is uh, uh, unstart and unstop. So here's a bit of code. It's, it's kind of, um, it's a little bit pseudo uh, but this is something you could actually do in your own app if you want to track something similar. So uh, I'll walk you through these lines of code. So, the first thing we want to do is count the number of activities that have been started. So that's num started. We also want to count the moment at which the user first enters the app, and that's user entered time. Now, uh, when we listen to on activity started, what we can do is say, if there are no activities currently started, so num started equals zero, what we can do is record the current time, and that's the time that the user launched the app or first entered it from, say, the task switcher. And then we, what we do is we increment the number of started activities. Uh, then as an activity is stopped, we'll turn around De decrement the number of started activities and say, um, if the number of started activities is zero, meaning there's no activities visible right now, uh, record the time that they left the app, uh, do a little math and say, this is how long the user was in the app. Now this is pretty handy, right? You, this, this is a fairly bulletproof way of knowing when the user was looking at your, your app and when they were not, because as long as you have an activity started, you can be certain that you were on the screen. When your activity is stopped, you can be certain that you are invisible. So this is how we track that. So what's next after here? So I've given a bunch of information. I hope you found it useful. Now, if you're an iOS developer, there's another talk in this room after lunch uh, from an iOS perspective. Um, if you have questions, you want to know anything about Firebase, there's links here. And if you want to join the space and ask questions and interact with each other, and I have that link to the blog post, that'll be here as well. So it looks like we have some amount of time left. Um, I'll take some questions if, anyone's, uh, if anyone would like it. And uh, thank you for being here. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of IRIS, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. 
For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now, let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraint. 
They're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now, to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm going to want to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now, it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first, I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get-only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now, Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice, smooth-looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. Okay, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block, and I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide over view on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye.
people love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine. And we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store developer console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Welcome to the Googleplex. This is an incredible place with lots of great stuff being worked on every single day. Before I worked here, I always wondered what it would be like to come to the Googleplex, meet up with a Googler, and have coffee with them, and just chat about what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. And today we're going to do exactly that. Welcome to Coffee with a Googler. I'm Lawrence Moroni, and I'm here in New York City to meet with Roman Nurek. And Roman Nurek is one of our material design gurus here at Google. So material design, tell me, what, what's it all about? Oh, Lawrence, what is material design? Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's actually a, a video uh, okay. with a bunch of the original designers that created material design, and they get asked the same question, and they don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a complex kind of thing. There's a lot of things going on. Um, I guess at the most basic level, it's, it's a design language, okay. it's a design system. Um, it's, it covers visual interaction and motion design. I feel like most design systems, design languages, are treated as just visual languages, like right. here are the colors you should use and so on. But okay. you know, material is, is much more than that. It, it really kind of covers the, the model, the underlying physical model of a UI. Okay. So it basically tries to establish this, this physical environment within which your apps should live, on a phone, on a tablet, on a computer, um, basically any sort of screen. Um, and then it, it basically establishes this physical environment in a set of basic rules and principles. Um, and I like to think of it along these kind of four basic axes or four basic principles. And that's uh, tangible surfaces, or okay. kind of the material metaphor. Okay. We could talk about what material is at some point. Um, also, bold graphic design, this idea that you know, we, should, we should take some of the best design ideas from the print world and see how that can help us you know, make really great apps on, you know, on digital devices. Right. Right. Um, and the third is meaningful motion, basically how all these things, how um, the surfaces and the, the ink on that surface, the, the, the graphic design stuff, how that all kind of you know, moves in a consistent way mm -hmm. to help communicate what's going on. And the fourth thing, which is to me one of the most important things, is, um, is adaptive design, which is 
how can we take all these these first three things and make sure that they work consistently and coherently across different devices, phones, okay. tablets, and everything else. Now, you have a video, right, of some really good examples yeah. of material design being used. So shall we, shall we roll that? Let's roll it. Some pretty excellent examples yeah. there, but it's like, you know, how does somebody reach that level? And for someone like me, I'm a developer, and my design skills are non-existent. So if I if I want to become somebody who can build apps with those kind of design, how, how do I get started? And well, how do it, I learn this stuff? It's a it's a great question. Um, I think first of all, I just want to, I guess, recognize some of those apps are they're doing amazing jobs, and they have they have yeah. large teams. They, some of them right. actually have very small teams. Uh, some of those apps are. You know, created by one person. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely reach that level of quality from these amazing showcase apps, regardless of your team size. Okay. Um, but I'd say for the developers and designers out there that are just getting started, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, you know, there's a there's a great Udacity course that okay. uh, me, uh, Nick Butcher, um, also from uh, from Google team here, um, and James Williams from Udacity put together, um, and that's available at udacity.com/google. Right. Um, and there's also a bunch of amazing resources on design.google.com, uh, which will kind of tell you about how to come to Android if you're doing iOS stuff, okay. for example, or how to kind of get started understanding what material design is. There's obviously the, the entire material design guidelines are there. Okay. So um, I'd say that the, the first thing, the, the Udacity uh, course, is probably the, the best kind of first step in getting started. Um, but there's there's a whole lot of resources okay. out there, and we link to others from Udacity. Okay. And Udacity courses, if you're not familiar with them, they are very Socratic in how they teach. Right? It's it's short videos and then challenging you to do something, and then a short video and then getting you to do something. And it's a good way that someone can incrementally learn rather than be thrown into like huge design doc or something yes. like that. Right? So. Yeah, it's it's definitely there's a very clear progression. We specifically design that course so that you can kind of start with some of the basics, the most elementary basic things about a screen, like what is a pixel, mm -hmm. what is a density independent pixel, and then you kind of ramp all the way up to how do I make everything work on phones, tablets, and so on. Right, and I have to assume that a design course is well designed, right? Uh, we, have some, <laughs> we have some very nice color choices in our, in our slides or our tablet drawings, so cool. hopefully. <laughs> so, 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 so back to material design again, it's like why, why material, what is it that so material goes back to that first principle. Right. Um, so the, this idea of uh, tangible surfaces, this idea that you know everything on a you know on on your screen and your device exists on a on a surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think of them as pieces of paper. Um, so basically, you can think of um, a basically a sheet of material or um, the word material representing one of those pieces of paper. And the reason we don't just call it paper is because it actually is. It's a lot more than just paper. In the real world, paper, you know, once you rip it up, you can't really just, you know, put it back together and paper can't go from being, you know, a circle to a square or to a mm -hmm. rectangle. Um, and so we like to think of our digital pieces of material or sheets of material um, as kind of a, a smarter paper, a more kind of, you know, a still a constrained paper. You can't just do anything. You can't it can't just you know do all sorts of crazy things, but it is a physical thing that exists inside of this kind of you know environment, this this right. kind of like faux environment. But it it is something that that has a lot of thought put into it. And so the word material, you know, to me really means the the sheets of paper that everything in this world exists on. But for me, the the main thing you know to think about the the reason that motion is so important in material design is that. You know, motion should always have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to, you know, like, you know, just do a, like a flip of a button or like a double rotation or something just to kind of draw attention. Every, every time something moves, it attracts our attention. 
And so it needs to be really thoughtful and, and really kind of carefully planned out. And so in material, we use motion, or we kind of use just enough motion to convey the change in some object's state or, you know, try to get a little bit of attention, but, you know, just enough motion, not too little, not too much. I understand Android Studio has some templates to allow developers to at least get started with uh, building material design into apps. Absolutely. So one of, the, one, one of my philosophies for a long time has been, you know, we can write about, you know, uh, material design. We can write about a thing. Um, mm -hmm. We can make suggestions about that thing, and we can try to teach people about that thing, but one of the best ways to get you know the thing into people's hands, uh, you know in this case material design, is to actually just you know build it into the tools. Just mm -hmm. make sure that you know as a developer that's just getting started, even just on Android, um, if I just go to file new project or new app, right, I should be able to get the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. And so in you know in Android Studio now we're actually seeing um, new templates uh, for material design. So you could do file new project, and then your default activity templates are going to come with material design in them. Okay. So it's going to use the material theme, um, it's going to use some of the some of the latest uh, support libraries for material design, so things like the Android Design Support Library, things like AppCompat. Cool. And so you're, you're just going to get a lot of great stuff for free right off the nice. bat. Nice. So for someone like me, I'm, I'm a coder, not a designer, <laughs> and so, but, so I can use Android Studio, get the, the effectively the scaffolding done for me in exactly. these templates and then learn from something like the Udacity course. Exactly. I, I definitely suggest, you know, even before you do the Udacity course, file new project, right? Just look yeah. around the code, um, see what you get. Um, I think that, that's a great way to get started. I always valued, as, as a kid, and you know, growing up learning programming and stuff, I always valued experimentation. Mm -hmm. So definitely experiment with that. Um, but as soon as you kind of you know, uh, you know, hit some sort of, you know, if, you, if you hit an obstacle or something, Obviously, take a look at the guide and the reference and all that, but the Udacity course is a great way to say, you know what, let me just kind of see what Google thinks is the right way to kind of approach okay. understanding this, this uh, okay. system. Awesome. Well, thanks, Roman. This, this has been a whole lot of fun, and I've learned more about material design <laughs> in the last five minutes than I'd had in, in a year beforehand. So This is fun. I, and so I, can, much. I can always talk about this stuff. So, <laughs> They've um, told me that about you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> it's cool. It's been I'm, awesome. Lawrence. And thanks. I'm going to check out that Udacity course, and I recommend that you do so too. And if you're an Android developer, take a look at those templates. If you have any questions for me about this, or if you have any questions for Roman about material design, or other aspects of building for material design, just please drop us a line in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. Uh, for more great episodes of Coffee with a Googler and for more great videos on developer topics, please tune to the Google Developers channel on YouTube. Thank you. You just finished your app and it looks great. So let's call it a day because you're ready to rest, right? Wrong. I'm David East, and I'm here to convince you that you aren't done yet, because you need to build a widget. But first, what exactly is a widget? Well, a widget just consists of a single view that is passed to other apps, such as the home screen app, and this view gets displayed as a portion of their layout. And that single view has now become a window to your app from the home screen or even the lock screen. And this is where the magic comes in. Because you can use that widget to display information that your users will care about and to trigger actions that will bring them back into your app. This means that you have an opportunity to become the core part of your user's mobile experience. And how cool is that? Consider a simple non-interactive widget, like for a weather app. It can display the current temperature overlaid on a sunny sky to show the weather outside in a single glance on the home screen. Now you just gained a grateful user because they don't actually have to open up the app just to check the weather. But widgets are about doing things, not just showing off. So give that informative view a job to do. A click on the view should trigger a deep link into your app, but don't just open up your main activity. Instead, consider is there a better point of entry, such as the view for this week's forecast. Another use for a widget could be a control toggle. Perhaps you want to show how strong the Wi-Fi signal is right now. That's your view. And a click on that view could toggle the Wi-Fi on and off without ever directing the user into the settings app, which is super useful. But these are still only scraping the surface of what widgets can do for you and for users. Think about a calendar widget. The view can adjust to fill whatever size the user gives it, listing out all the events for today. Clicking on an event can open up its detail view, and scrolling through the list can show you everything that doesn't fit in the view. 
And just because you're showing a list doesn't mean you can't provide space for a quick add action to easily create a new event in a single click. Widgets are great because they empower you to make your app useful to users even when they haven't specifically opened it. And then you can easily get users back into your app because you're enticing them with completing an action. So check out the documentation on widgets to learn how you can get started and what widgets can do for you. But most importantly, just continue to build better apps. I got to do it, man. <sighs> Why in-app payments are important? Well, as you all know, users like free applications. However, you need to make a living out of your work. Life is not as easy as it seems, right? For that, we got you covered with in-app payments. You could see it in many examples, Clash of the Clans, Netflix, Spotify, and many more. In this episode, you'll learn how to perform common in-app billing operations for your Android applications. In-app billing is a service hosted on Google Play that lets you charge for digital content or for upgrades in your app. You can request product details from Google Play issue orders for in-app products, and retrieve ownership information based on your user's purchase history. Google Play provides a checkout interface that makes user interaction with the in-app billing service seamless. It provides a more intuitive experience to your users. So now you need to set up. Before you can start using the in-app billing service, you'll need to follow these three steps. Add the library that contains the in-app billing API to your Android project. Why? Well, it's the definition of the interface that in-app billing expose. This will enable us to call its methods. Then, set the permissions for your application to communicate with Google Play. Last but not least, establish a connection between your application and Google Play. Now, you can place products for sale. Before publishing your application, you'll need to define the product list of digital goods available for purchase in Google Play Developer Console. Once your application is connected to Google Play, you can initiate purchase requests for in-app products. Google Play provides a checkout interface for users to enter the payment method so your application does not need to handle payment transactions directly. When an item is purchased, Google Play recognizes that the user has an ownership of the item and prevents the users from purchasing another item with the same product ID until it is consumed. You could also query Google Play to quickly retrieve the list of purchases that were made by the user. To ensure that in-app billing is functioning correctly, you should test the application before you publish it on Google Play. Early testing also helps to ensure that the user flow for purchasing in-app items is not confusing or slow, and that users can see their newly purchased item in a timely way. Want to know more? Follow the links below. Until next time, eat your vegetables, use in-app payments, and listen to your partner. Developing a successful app isn't easy. To reach a broad audience, you'll need to consider your iOS, Android, and mobile web users. And to build for these platforms, you'll need a back-end server to store data and support the apps. Of course, you want to get your users logged in, hopefully lots of users, which means your back-end will have to scale. Then after you've solved your scaling problems, you have to find more ways to spread the word to get new users. But have you found a way to measure all this activity? And, oh no, your app is crashing and causing servers to melt down, and you haven't even made a dime yet. <sighs> Don't you wish this could be easier? This is why we built Firebase. It has all the tools you need to build a successful app. It helps you reach new users, keep them engaged, scale up to meet that demand, in addition to getting paid. From the beginning, with Firebase, you'll have test lab and crash reporting to prevent and diagnose errors in your app. Your backend infrastructure problems are solved with our real-time database, file storage, and hosting solutions. Acquiring new users is easy with invites, AdWords, and dynamic links. 
and using the authentication component, you can get those users logged in with minimal friction. Once installed, you can keep your users engaged with notifications, cloud messaging, and app indexing. Then, with Remote Config, you'll have the freedom to experiment with new features and optimize the user experience in real time. And of course, you can earn money with the same AdMob component that's been monetizing great apps for years. Last, but certainly not least, our all-new Analytics component, designed uniquely for Firebase, brings insight into how well these components are working for you and your users. With Firebase Analytics, you can measure and optimize your advertising campaigns, discover who are your most valuable users, and understand exactly how they are using your app. Now, all these components work great on their own and provide a solid infrastructure to build out your app, but they work even better when combined in creative ways. So let Firebase handle the details of your app's backend infrastructure, user engagement, and monetization, while you spend more time building the apps your users will love. To get started right now with Firebase on Android, iOS, or the web, follow these links for more information. Then, to manage and monitor your apps connected to Firebase, there's a web console to view crashes, set up experiments, track analytics, and a whole lot more. And to learn more about Firebase and all of its components, you can read the documentation right here. We can't wait to see what you build. Hey folks, welcome to Totally Tooling Tips Season 3. Come check us out. We're going to be talking about progressive web apps, uh, some of the tooling around them. On first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. Module bundling, accessibility. Do you know what the top four things to look at when it comes to web accessibility are? Uh, no, I can only think of two. Like, I only think of audio and then visual. So there's visual, hearing, mobility, and cognition. The first episode will be out on April the 27th. So subscribe to the YouTube channel, check out season one and two before season three starts, which will be happening soon. We promise that season three is gonna be equally as mediocre as seasons one and two. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm going to want to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get-only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. 
One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice, smooth-looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. OK, next, I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block. And I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. Bitcoin represents a way to transfer money anonymously and at almost no cost. And since it's an arbitrary currency with no nationality attached to it, you're free to exchange it with anyone in the world. What is money? Resources are limited and they hold explicit value to people. Most resources are physical and such needed to be traded in a physical form. Diamonds, gold coins, chickens or bikes. At some point, it becomes too difficult to physically transact those objects, and it's easier to agree, collectively, on the value of cash instead of gold. As we know today, this has many advantages. Credit cards and the modern banking basically gave us another abstraction layer on top of cash. There is a centralized system which defines who owns what resources. All of these trades are made virtually. This is the backbone of why Bitcoin is a valid idea. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is decentralized, anonymous, digital-only currency that recently received public attention. Bitcoin was originally developed in 2008. Like in any good mystery, someone using the alias Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper describing how Bitcoin could work. There's a very interesting story about this guy too. He must be very smart, but he never came forward to claim ownership or any part of the revenue. Just one year later, in 2009, Bitcoin started being traded. Where do they come from? Think about gold. You could buy it or mine it, and it's the same concept with Bitcoin. You do this by using your computer to hunt for 64 digit numbers. By having your computer repeatedly solve complex mathematical puzzles, you're competing with other miners to generate the number that the Bitcoin network is looking for. If your computer generates it first, you receive Bitcoins. The Bitcoin system is programmed to generate a fixed number of Bitcoins per unit of computing time. It is also self-sustaining, coded to prevent inflation, and encrypted to prevent anyone from disrupting its code. In the year 2140, the total number of Bitcoins in circulation will be capped at 21 million. So how much is a Bitcoin worth today? You'll need to Google it. 
Just type Bitcoin in US dollar, for example. You could also check it out at Priv.com. Why are they anonymous? Bitcoin are pseudo-anonymous because they are built upon this centralized system. The Bitcoins themselves are anonymous, the wallets are not. Here is why. The base algorithm creates anonymity, but as the recent court cases show, if your Bitcoin wallet is identified and attached to a person, then someone can go through and track every transaction you've made. Bitcoins exist entirely on their own because there's no central infrastructure to shut down. You are identified by nothing more than your Bitcoin wallet address, a string of randomized letters and numbers. There are absolutely no identifying characteristic beyond that. For the paranoid dude, you can simply create a new wallet for each transaction. Here are some interesting startups that push the technology forward. We are still in the initial phase of Bitcoins, and there are many challenges and opportunities ahead. Exchanges, wallets, merchant services, security, and more. But this is something for another episode. Until next time, eat your vegetables and listen to your partners. Hey there, Polycasters, Rob here. So before coming into the studio, we tweeted out a question to see what folks wanted to see in the next episode of Polycast. And a lot of folks wrote in and said they wanted to know how to lazy load Polymer elements to improve the performance of their apps. So that's exactly what we're going to cover today. Now to do that, we're going to start off over here at the Polymer docs. And we're going to go down to the API reference. And some folks might not even realize that we, we have an API reference, but it's, it's kind of hidden down here in the sidebar for the documentation. You can go click on that. And that's going to take you to this sort of uh, kind of classic Polymer doc layout if, if you've seen this before on other elements. And this is where you can find all of the properties and methods of the Polymer object itself. So a lot of really cool stuff inside of here. This is also where, for instance, like the Polymer templatizer documentation is. So if you wanted to create your own uh, version of DOM if or DOM repeat, you could use templatizer to do that. Just a helpful tidbit there. But what we're interested in here is this Polymer base object. And Polymer base is sort of the base prototype for all Polymer elements. And it's where we hide interesting like methods and properties and stuff like that. The one I'm into is called import href down here. We can hit the embiggen button to make it larger. And so what import href is going to do, it's going to give us the ability to dynamically load an HTML import at runtime. It's got a few arguments that it takes. The first argument is we're going to give it an href, so basically just a path to some component or some uh, HTML import that you want to pull in at runtime. And then it wants callbacks for on success, on error. And lastly, it takes an option, which specifies whether or not you want the link tag to have an async attribute on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use import href, and I'm going to build sort of a sample application. This is the app that I have thrown together. It is called Polymeal. It's a social network for foodies. And I guess people that like uh, stir fry, because um, there's a lot of pictures of stir fry. And uh, you can either go to the sort of the, the browse section, and you see here that I've got all sorts of yummy photos, or you could go to the activity feed, and you could see maybe like I'd be posting status updates from all the cool, awesome restaurants that I am eating at, right? Now, the main thing to take away from this is that these two sections have very, very different content, right? This one is, is a whole bunch of cards with some paper buttons on it. Right? And this activity feed is instead just sort of these like little, little status blurb things. So there's no reason to load all of this, uh, all these card elements if the user is just starting off in the activity feed. Right? It would just make more sense to load that at runtime to kind of like uh, reduce the bandwidth for our total application. So to do that, we're going to use import href over here in our code editor. So this is my X app element that I have started off with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an X app element. Inside of XAP, I will chuck in a little iron pages here. And inside of uh, iron pages, we'll have sections for the different bits of our app that we are interested in. So I've got a browse section and an activity section. And we've also got the page.js router loaded into XAP as well. So if we go down to the JavaScript definition, we can see that I've got kind of a, a basic route stubbed out. And what I want to do is when the route changes to either the browse section or the activity section, I'm going to call Polymer's import href method, load in my element definition. Once that's loaded in, I will then tell Iron Pages to switch over to that section. 
Now, the first thing I want to do, though, since we're starting off just at like slash, uh, right now what we're doing is we're actually just loading a shell that looks kind of like this, right? We don't have, uh, you know, we're not hitting either the browse or the activity section. So the user's kind of got, you know, nothing to look at. So we'll start off by redirecting them, page.redirect, over to the browse section. So this way we just have kind of like a nice starting point. I'm going to write another handler for browse, so page slash browse. And you'll notice here that I'm using uh, ES6 fat arrow functions. That just makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to deal with the scoping of the this value inside of these handlers. So I'll say uh, page.browse. And what I first want to do is see if the element has already been loaded. Has this page been loaded before? Because if it has, there's no reason to import it again. So we'll call Polymer's is instance method. And this is something that I don't even think it's, it's well documented. It might seriously not even exist anywhere in our docs. But I spoke with our tech writer. This is a thing. You can use it to sort of check to see if an element is an upgraded Polymer element. So because both our browse element and our activity element have IDs, we can reference them using automatic node finding. And we could say this.$sign.browse. So if this is already a Polymer element, let's just go ahead and return. No reason to do anything. No, no importing or anything like that is needed. Uh, but we will set the selected value to browse. And then what that's going to do is that's going to tell our iron pages up here to switch to that section. So you can see we're, we're binding its selected attribute to that property. Okay. Now, if the element has not been loaded, if it hasn't been upgraded yet, now we're going to import its definition. So we'll call uh, polymer.base.importhref. And we're going to pass it a path to the HTML import for the browse section that we want to load. So elements slash xbrowse slash xbrowse.html. And then we'll give it a success handler to run. So we're going to say, all right, cool, the element loaded in. Let's now set the selected state to browse. That'll tell Iron Pages to update. And now we can return, exit our, our route here. We should be good to go. If we go back and we look at our application now and we refresh the page, it should redirect to the browse section and it should start loading in all of those cards. Awesome, right? Uh, now we need to do the same thing for the activity section. So I can just grab this entire route right here and uh, do, some, do some dangerous copy and paste work here. And we're just going to go through. And any place where it says browse, we'll just flip it out for activity. Activity. Thank you, spell check. So when we go to slash activity, we're going to check to see if the activity element is upgraded. If it is, return. If it's not, import it. Let's go give that a look. So refresh the page. And we see our browse section looking good. We go to the activity section. And boom, we got our status feed showing up right there. Now, there's still a lot of unanswered questions to this. I kind of showed you the, the quick and dirty version of using import href. But what we didn't talk about was, you know, do we need to vulcanize these things into different bundles? And if so, how do we exclude common dependencies? Or can we just use HTTP2 to maybe like server push all the things or multiplex stream all of our dependencies? So there's still a lot of things that uh, remain to be worked out. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those in an upcoming episode of Polymer. But today, for what we've done here, if you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Otherwise, you can always ping me on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Otherwise, you can ping me on a social network at Two. I'll keep all the, the fun stuff up here, top two thirds of the screen. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So, why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. 
Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. 
You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now, let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm gonna wanna change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm gonna control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here, I wanna adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get-only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now, Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. Okay, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block, and I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide over view on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. 
For example, on this screen, I can change all of my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine. And we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Welcome to the Googleplex. This is an incredible place with lots of great stuff being worked on every single day. Before I worked here, I always wondered what it would be like to come to the Googleplex, meet up with a Googler, and have coffee with them, and just chat about what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. And today we're going to do exactly that. Welcome to Coffee with a Googler. I'm Lawrence Moroni, and I'm here in New York City to meet with Roman Nurek. And Roman Nurek is one of our material design gurus here at Google. So material design, tell me, what, what's it all about? Oh, Lawrence, what is material design? Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's actually a, a video uh, okay. with a bunch of the original designers that created material design, and they get asked the same question, and they don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a complex kind of thing. There's a lot of things going on. Um, I guess at the most basic level, it's, it's a design language. Okay. It's a design system. Um, it's, it covers visual interaction and motion design. I feel like most design systems, design languages, are treated as just visual languages, like right. here are the colors you should use and so on. But okay. you know, material is is much more than that. It it really kind of covers the the model, the underlying physical model of a UI. Okay. So it basically tries to establish 
this, this physical environment within which your apps should live, on a phone, on a tablet, on a computer, um, basically any sort of screen. Um, and then it, it basically establishes this physical environment in a set of basic rules and principles. Um, and I like to think of it along these kind of four basic axes or four basic principles. And that's uh, tangible surfaces, or okay. kind of the material metaphor. We okay. could talk about what material is at some point. Um, also, bold graphic design, this idea that you know, we, should, we should take some of the best design ideas from the print world and see how that can help us you know, make really great apps on, you know, on digital devices. Right. Right. Um, and the third is meaningful motion, basically how all these things, how um, the surfaces and the, the ink on that surface, the, the, the graphic design stuff, how that all kind of you know, moves in a consistent way mm -hmm. to help communicate what's going on. And the fourth thing, which is to me one of the most important things, is, um, is adaptive design, which is how can we take all these, these first three things and make sure that they work consistently and coherently across different devices, phones, okay. tablets, and everything else. Now, you have a video, right, of some really good examples yeah. of material design being used. So shall we, shall we roll that? Let's roll it. Some pretty excellent examples yeah. there, but it's like, you know, how does somebody reach that level? For someone like me, I'm a developer and my design skills are non-existent. So if I, if I want to become somebody who can build apps with those kind of design, how, how do I get started? And well, how do it, I learn this stuff? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, first of all, I just want to, I guess, recognize some of those apps, are, they're doing amazing jobs and they have, they have yeah. large teams. They, some of them right. actually have very small teams. Uh, some of those apps are you know, created by one person. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely reach that level of quality from these amazing showcase apps, regardless of your team size. Okay. Um, but I'd say for the developers and designers out there that are just getting started, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great Udacity course that okay. uh, me, uh, Nick Butcher, um, also from, uh, from the Google team here, um, and James Williams from Udacity put together. Um, and that's available at udacity.com slash Google. Right. Um, and there's also a bunch of amazing resources on design.google.com, uh, which will kind of tell you about how to come to Android if you're doing iOS stuff, okay. for example, or how to kind of get started understanding what material design is. There's obviously the, the entire material design guidelines are there. Okay. So um, I'd say that the, the first thing, the, the Udacity uh, course, is probably the, the best kind of first step in getting started. Um, but there's there's a whole lot of resources okay. out there, and we link to others from the Udacity okay. course. And Udacity courses, if you're not familiar with them, they are very Socratic in how they teach, right? It's it's short videos and then challenging you to do something, and then a short video and then getting you to do something. And it's a good way that someone can incrementally learn rather than be thrown into like huge design doc or something yes. like that, right? So yeah, it's it's definitely there's a very clear progression. We specifically design that course so that you can kind of start with some of the basics, the most elementary basic things about a screen, like what is a pixel, mm -hmm. what is a density independent pixel, and then you kind of ramp all the way up to how do I make everything work on phones, tablets, and so on. Right, and I have to assume that a design course is well designed, right? Uh, we, have some, <laughs> we have some very nice color choices in our, in our slides or our tablet drawings, so cool. hopefully. <laughs> so, 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 so back to material design again, it's like why, why material, what is it that so material goes back to that first principle. Right. Um, so the, this idea of uh, tangible surfaces, this idea that you know everything on a you know on on your screen and your device exists on a on a surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think of them as pieces of paper. Um, so basically, you can think of um, a basically a sheet of material or um, the word material representing one of those pieces of paper. And the reason we don't just call it paper is because it actually is. It's a lot more than just paper. 
in the real world, paper, you know, once you rip it up, you can't really just, you know, put it back together. And right. paper can't go from being, you know, a circle to a square or to a mm -hmm. rectangle. Um, and so we like to think of our digital pieces of material or sheets of material um, as kind of a, a smarter paper, a more kind of, you know, a still a constrained paper. You can't just do anything. You can't, it can't just, you know, do all sorts of crazy things. But it is a physical thing that exists inside of this kind of, you know, environment, this this right. kind of like faux environment, but it, it is something that, that has a lot of thought put into it. And so the word material, you know, to me really means the, the sheets of paper that everything in this world exists on. But for me, the, the main thing, you know, to think about, the, the reason that motion is so important in material design is that, you know, motion should always have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to you know, like, you know, just do a, like a flip of a button or like a double rotation or something just to kind of draw attention. Every, every time something moves, it attracts our attention. And so it needs to be really thoughtful and, and really kind of carefully planned out. And so in material, we use motion or we kind of use just enough motion to convey the change in some object's state or, you know, try to get a little bit of attention. But you know, just enough motion, not too little, not too much. I understand Android Studio has some templates to allow developers to at least get started with uh, building material design into Absolutely. Apps. So one of the, one of my philosophies for a long time has been, you know, we can write about, you know, a material design. We can write about a thing. Um, mm -hmm. We can make suggestions about that thing and we can try to teach people about that thing. But one of the best ways to get, you know, the thing into people's hands uh, you know, in this case, material design, is to actually just, you know, build it into the tools. Just mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, as a developer that's just getting started, even just on Android, um, if I just go to File, New Project, or New App, right, I should be able to get the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. And so in, you know, in Android Studio now, we're actually seeing um, new templates uh, for material design. So you could do File, New Project, and then your default activity templates are going to come with material design in them. Okay. So it's going to use the material theme. Um, it's going to use some of the some of the latest uh, support libraries for material design. So things like the Android Design Support Library, things like App Compat. Cool. And so you're you're just going to get a lot of great stuff for free right off the nice. bat. Nice. So for someone like me, I'm I'm a coder, not a designer, <laughs> and so but so I can use Android Studio, get the the effectively the scaffolding done for me in exactly. these templates and then learn from something like the Udacity course. Exactly. I, I definitely suggest, you know, even before you do the Udacity course, file new project, right? Just look yeah. around the code, um, see what you get. Um, I think that, that's a great way to get started. I always valued, as, as a kid, and you know, growing up learning programming and stuff, I always valued experimentation. Mm -hmm. So definitely experiment with that. Um, but as soon as you kind of you know, uh, you know, hit some sort of, you know, if you, if you hit an obstacle or something, Obviously, take a look at the guide and the reference and all that, but the Udacity course is a great way to say, you know what, let me just kind of see what Google thinks is the right way to kind of approach okay. understanding this, this okay. uh, system. Awesome. Well, thanks, Roman. This, this has been a whole lot of fun, and I've learned more about material design <laughs> in the last five minutes than I'd had in, in a year beforehand. So This is fun. I, and so I, can, I can always talk about this stuff. So, <laughs> They've um, told me that about you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> it's cool. It's been I'm, awesome. Last and time. I'm going to check out that Udacity course, and I recommend that you do so too. And if you're an Android developer, take a look at those templates. If you have any questions for me about this, or if you have any questions for Roman about material design or other aspects of building for material design, just please drop us a line in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. Uh, for more great episodes of Coffee with a Googler and for more great videos on developer topics, please tune to the Google Developers channel on YouTube. Thank you. You just finished your app and it looks great. So let's call it a day because you're ready to rest, right? Wrong. I'm David East and I'm here to convince you that you aren't done yet because you need to build a widget. But first, what exactly is a widget? Well, a widget just consists of a single view that is passed to other apps such as the home screen app. And this view gets displayed as a portion of their layout. And that single view has now become a window to your app from the home screen or even the lock screen. And this is where the magic comes in because you can use that widget to display information that your users will care about and to trigger actions that will bring them back into your app. This means that you have an opportunity to become the core part of your user's mobile experience. And how cool is that? 
Consider a simple non-interactive widget, like for a weather app. It can display the current temperature overlaid on a sunny sky to show the weather outside in a single glance on the home screen. Now you just gained a grateful user because they don't actually have to open up the app just to check the weather. But widgets are about doing things, not just showing off. So give that informative view a job to do. A click on the view should trigger a deep link into your app, but don't just open up your main activity. Instead, consider is there a better point of entry, such as the view for this week's forecast. Another use for a widget could be a control toggle. Perhaps you want to show how strong the Wi-Fi signal is right now. That's your view. And a click on that view could toggle the Wi-Fi on and off without ever directing the user into the settings app, which is super useful. But these are still only scraping the surface of what widgets can do for you and for users. Think about a calendar widget. The view can adjust to fill whatever size the user gives it, listing out all the events for today. Clicking on an event can open up its detail view, and scrolling through the list can show you everything that doesn't fit in the view. And just because you're showing a list doesn't mean you can't provide space for a quick add action to easily create a new event in a single click. Widgets are great because they empower you to make your app useful to users even when they haven't specifically opened it. And then you can easily get users back into your app because you're enticing them with completing an action. So check out the documentation on widgets to learn how you can get started and what widgets can do for you. But most importantly, just continue to build better apps. I got to do it, man. <sighs> Why in-app payments are important? Well, as you all know, users like free applications. However, you need to make a living out of your work. Life is not as easy as it seems, right? For that, we got you covered with in-app payments. You can see it in many examples, Clash of the Clans, Netflix, Spotify, and many more. In this episode, you'll learn how to perform common in-app billing operations for your Android applications. In-app billing is a service hosted on Google Play that lets you charge for digital content or for upgrades in your app. You can request product details from Google Play issue orders for in-app products, and retrieve ownership information based on your user's purchase history. Google Play provides a checkout interface that makes user interaction with the in-app billing service seamless. It provides a more intuitive experience to your users. So now you need to set up. Before you can start using the in-app billing service, you'll need to follow these three steps. Add the library that contains the in-app billing API to your Android project. Why? Well, it's the definition of the interface that in-app billing exposes. This will enable us to call its methods. Then, set the permissions for your application to communicate with Google Play. Last but not least, establish a connection between your application and Google Play. Now, you can place products for sale. Before publishing your application, you'll need to define the product list of digital goods available for purchase in Google Play Developer Console. Once your application is connected to Google Play, you can initiate purchase requests for in-app products. Google Play provides a checkout interface for users to enter the payment method so your application does not need to handle payment transactions directly. When an item is purchased, Google Play recognizes that the user has an ownership of the item and prevents the users from purchasing another item with the same product ID until it is consumed. You could also query Google Play to quickly retrieve the list of purchases that were made by the user. To ensure that in-app billing is functioning correctly, you should test the application before you publish it on Google Play. Early testing also helps to ensure that the user flow for purchasing in-app items is not confusing or slow, and that users can see their newly purchased item in a timely way. Want to know more? Follow the links below. Until next time, eat your vegetables, use in-app payments, and listen to your partner.
Developing a successful app isn't easy. To reach a broad audience, you'll need to consider your iOS, Android, and mobile web users. And to build for these platforms, you'll need a back-end server to store data and support the apps. Of course, you want to get your users logged in, hopefully lots of users, which means your back-end will have to scale. Then after you've solved your scaling problems, you have to find more ways to spread the word to get new users. But have you found a way to measure all this activity? And, oh no, your app is crashing and causing servers to meltdown, and you haven't even made a dime yet. <sighs> Don't you wish this could be easier? This is why we built Firebase. It has all the tools you need to build a successful app. It helps you reach new users, keep them engaged, scale up to meet that demand, in addition to getting paid. From the beginning, with Firebase, you'll have test lab and crash reporting to prevent and diagnose errors in your app. Your backend infrastructure problems are solved with our real-time database, file storage, and hosting solutions. Acquiring new users is easy with invites, AdWords, and dynamic links. And using the authentication component, you can get those users logged in with minimal friction. Once installed, you can keep your users engaged with notifications, cloud messaging, and app indexing. Then, with Remote Config, you have the freedom to experiment with new features and optimize the user experience in real time. And of course, you can earn money with the same AdMob component that's been monetizing great apps for years. Last, but certainly not least, our all-new analytics component, designed uniquely for Firebase, brings insight into how well these components are working for you and your users. With Firebase Analytics, you can measure and optimize your advertising campaigns, discover who are your most valuable users, and understand exactly how they are using your app. Now, all these components work great on their own and provide a solid infrastructure to build out your app, but they work even better when combined in creative ways. So let Firebase handle the details of your app's backend infrastructure, user engagement, and monetization while you spend more time building the apps your users will love. To get started right now with Firebase on Android, iOS, or the web, follow these links for more information. Then, to manage and monitor your apps connected to Firebase, there's a web console to view crashes, set up experiments, track analytics, and a whole lot more. And to learn more about Firebase and all of its components, you can read the documentation right here. We can't wait to see what you build. Hey folks, welcome to Totally Tooling Tips Season 3. Come check us out. We're going to be talking about progressive web apps, uh, some of the tooling around them. On first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. Module bundling, accessibility. Do you know what the top four things to look at when it comes to web accessibility are? Uh, no, I can only think of two. Like, I only think of audio and then visual. So there's visual, hearing, mobility, and cognition. The first episode will be out on April the 27th. So subscribe to the YouTube channel, check out season one and two before season three starts, which will be happening soon. We promise that season three is gonna be equally as mediocre as seasons one and two.
Well, I guess the music stopped, so that's my cue to start. Um, hi, everybody. I hope the line wasn't too long today. Um, this is Firebase for iOS developers. I have an awful lot of content to go through and uh, not a lot of time to do it in. So I'm just going to get started, and I'm going to kind of talk really fast, sort of like the Micro Machines guy, if, if any of you remember him. Um, so as you may have heard, Firebase is a suite of integrated products designed to help you develop your app, grow a user grow your user base, and earn money. Um, and more specifically, um, we're there to help you do that on iOS. So I know we're at Google I.O., and you're probably going to hear a lot of like, announcements about Android and things and instant apps and all that fun stuff, which does sound kind of cool. But when it comes to developer tools, um, particularly um, mobile developer tools, and particularly Firebase, um, we take cross-platform very seriously. We know that a mobile library is probably not um, helpful to you unless it's available on all the platforms you're developing for. And for most of you um, do, doing development in mobile, that generally means Android and iOS. So honestly, I'm actually very happy that this whole cool new platform is built under the Firebase brand, because I think people already know um, that Firebase is very serious about supporting iOS and, and will continue to in the future. So um, fun fact, if I give this talk in Spanish, it looks like I'm just kind of generally excited about the idea of an operating system. So that's. That's my one internationalization joke for, for the event. So thank you. I'm going to move on. Uh, so out of all these features that we have available on Firebase, um, these are the ones that are available on iOS. So you'll notice that the only thing that, I, that we had to dim out was the test lab, which is specifically being called test lab for Android um, for that purpose. It just didn't fit nicely in the slide. Um, so really, everything that you can do in Firebase, you can do on Android and iOS, which is great. Um, so this is kind of supposed to be a technical deep dive, which I think is a little weird given that some of these features are brand new to you and you haven't yet had a chance to even play with them. Um, so really, this talk is going to be a little more about interesting quirks that I discovered when I just kind of started experimenting and playing around with the Firebase platform and uh, building, building my own app, which, as federal law mandates, any time you create a new app with a new library has to be a to-do app. So um, let's move. There we go. Um, so this is not like, I don't know all the answers to everything. This is more like, hey, this is kind of a neat little quirk. And I sort of wrote it down. And I thought I'd give a presentation on all of it. So let's talk a little bit about the setup process. Generally speaking, Firebase encourages you to use CocoaPods. We're, we're using CocoaPods now as sort of our, our generally recommended way to install stuff. Um, probably most of you know this by now. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it. But it's a dependency manager that vastly simplifies the process of adding libraries to your app. Um, and uh, if you don't know anything about CocoaPods, we do have a fantastic video. I'm having a little trouble with the clicker. Here we go. Um, that uh, you can check out with uh, an incredibly handsome cast. So I'll give you a moment. If you want to take a picture of that URL, go ahead. And uh, if not, I will post it in the, in the uh, Google space afterwards. Uh, one important note about CocoaPods is you should generally only pod install what you need. Um, May, not everyone knows this. I didn't know this at first. But the thing about CocoaPods is adding a pod actually increases the size of your app, whether you ever include that code or not. Um, so if you have the choice between installing a massive Uber pod that's got 40 features in it or installing a little subspec of that pod that contains the three features you're interested in, always kind of go for that subspec. Um, and we've actually structured our pods to, to encourage that kind of behavior. So you'll notice in our documentation for all of our Cocoa Pods that we ask you to install, they're the individual um, subspecs that are part of Firebase. So you've got Firebase Core, which gives you analytics and all of the setup work, um, Firebase Database, Auth, Messaging, Remote Config for all of the various features. In fact, if you do try and pod Firebase in the hopes that you're going to you know, install this giant, massive um, everything, uh, that's not going to work. We just map that directly to Firebase slash core. So, uh, so keep that in mind. You do have to actually pod install every explicit feature that, that you're interested in adding. Um, if you don't know about pod try, who, who doesn't know about pod try? OK, like either there's like one or two people, or maybe everyone's just afraid to raise their hand. Um, so if you don't know, it's a great way to sort of try out any library that CocoaPods has available. It basically goes out and searches the repository for a demo or sample app that it downloads to a temporary directory on your, um, on your computer and then runs it. So you can kind of check out all the libraries in action in Xcode. You, know, you can play around with the code, see what happens when you tweak different things without having to be like, Gee, I wonder where this, you know, what this thing does. And then you have to go out and find the documentation and find where the sample file is and download it and do all that work manually. And so um, 
We've made sure that all of our Firebase samples work with Pod Try, so go ahead and give it a try. Uh, CocoaPods recently released version 1.0. Congratulations to the team if you're watching online. Hi. Um, from an end user perspective, probably not a lot has changed for you with version 1.0. Hopefully, there's very few breakages with your pod files unless you're doing something really fancy. Um, I think the point of, of the 1.0 release is it's really more of a forward-looking release where the team is really kind of preparing um, for the future and wants to make sure everything can scale and is production ready. And so we're very excited to be a part of that. But granted, you know, whenever I give this presentation, there's always one developer in every crowd who is not happy with the idea of CocoaPods and like, oh, I really don't want, hey, there they are. All right. Well, don't worry, grumpy cats, we love you too. Um, you can still install all the libraries without CocoaPods. Um, if you check at our documentation down at the bottom, there is an installing without CocoaPods um, section, where basically what you're going to do is you're going to download this giant zip file that is going to contain all the frameworks available. Um, and there is a step-by-step -step guide that says, you know, for every feature, if you want Firebase messaging, you need to install A, B, C, and D. And if you want analytics, you need to install D and F, and, and so on and so forth for every feature that we have available. So um, it takes a few manual steps, but you can still do it. Um, so don't worry. Don't worry, CocoaPods haters. We, we, we still like you. Um, by the way, show of hands if anyone was secretly wishing we'd be supporting Carthage instead. All right, a few. Good to know. I'm just kind of gauging the, gauging the interest in the room. I'm not making any promises about any future anything. Uh, we are almost all on modules now, which is generally nicer when you're importing things. Um, and importing is very simple. You can just import Firebase, and this will import all of the headers for any of the pods you have installed. There's sort of a lot of uh, has include magic going on. There we go. Um, underneath the hood that, that makes sure this works, which I know kind of sounds like the opposite of my, hey, only pod install what you need advice that I gave you like three slides ago. Um, but here, you're not going to increase the size of your app um, if you import Firebase and import all the Firebase features you, you have installed. That's not going to change the size of your app. Maybe there will be a slight increase in compilation time, but I think it should be pretty negligible. I certainly haven't noticed. And it makes development very easy, right? You just sort of have import Firebase, and then any feature you want to try out should just work without, without Xcode giving you an error. Um, we have big code support now. Yay. That's good. Um, so you can finally use Firebase for your, you know, your watch and TV apps. Sorry, this, this took so long. Uh, we have a style guide now, an API review for all our developer libraries that are published as part of the Firebase platform. So you should start to see consistent class names and method naming across the different features of Firebase, um, which is good. Not, not all of them are there yet. You know who you are. But um, most of our features now look very consistent. So almost all of our classes begin with FIR. And for anything that uses a singleton, you'll kind of call it in the same way. And so the idea is once you've gotten used to using a couple of features in Firebase, you should kind of be able to sort of guess how you'd be using some of these other features as well. So let's talk briefly about what does happen when you create a project in Firebase, because you're going to go to the Firebase console, and uh, you're going to say, hey, please create a project. And then you're going to wait a little while, and it's going to be doing some magic for you. And then you attach your iOS app, and then it's going to give you a plist file that you're going to download and drag into your Xcode project. After you've done that, you are then going to call this one magic call for app.configure, which will set up everything within Firebase for you. No matter sort of you know, what feature you have installed, this, this generally configures it for you. And so what's going on when all of this happens? So when you create a new project in the Firebase console, it does a bunch of work for you on the back end. It's going to create you know, OAuth clients and spin up a, um, a, you know, an instance of the Firebase database for you to use and set up a Firebase storage bucket. Um, whether you actually ever plan on using them or not, they're already available on the back end for you to use. And for each one of these things that it sets up, there's also a constant available. right? It's going to be the address of the database or your OAuth client IDs or your cloud, you know, cloud messenger sender ID. Um, all of that is the stuff that gets put in the plist file, so that when you drag it into your app and you call for app.configure, um, it will then configure any client libraries that it sees are installed within your app. And uh, you know, it will do that by dragging in all of these constants that, that you've put into this plist file. Um, so there's no more kind of copying, pasting various IDs from you know, the console into your app. You shouldn't have to do any of that, which, which is awfully nice. 
So let's talk a little about these individual features. I'm going to start with my favorite, which is Firebase Remote Config. And this is basically a way for you um, to change the look and feel of your app from the cloud. So when you release your app and you realize, oh no, I have some text that's wrong, or level five is too hard, or this animation is taking way too long, if you've wired up those values to use Remote Config, what you can do is update them from the cloud. So you'll change within, you know, within the cloud. You'll say, you know what? This is actually the value I want to use for my button text. And um, that will go, you know, your, your app will download these new values, and it should be available in a matter of minutes instead of having to go through the whole, well, let's release a new build and you know, get it approved and published and have everybody download the new version. Right? This all happens um, you know, not quite instantaneously, but pretty darn quick. So generally speaking, how remote config works on iOS is first you're going to set up a bunch of default values. And you do this either by passing in an NS dictionary or passing in a plist, whichever way you want to do it. And then you're going to um, you know, fetch new values from Firebase Remote Config with a completion handler. These new values get downloaded, and they get placed in kind of a, a cached holding pattern on your device. They don't get used until you call activate fetched. At that point, when you call activate fetch, these new values get applied on top of your defaults. So then at some point later, when you want to retrieve these values, when you want to kind of retrieve a value for any of these individual um, settings that you've got, remote config will either give you the version that it's downloaded or the, the default values that you've, that you've supplied. And I think the important thing to take away from this is you don't have to supply new values for everything. Um, what we would encourage you to do is basically use remote config for any, any value that you have in your app, right? Any kind of magic number, any constant, any text string, all of that stuff, everything you've got in that you know, app constants.swift file that we all you know, have around, um, this stuff should be set up to use remote config. Then when you want to change you know, one or two of those values, you're only supplying the deltas. You're only supplying the stuff that's changed from remote config. And so you can download just those new values, and you have the flexibility to change any other values in the future without your having to supply you know, thousands upon thousands of values every time you, know, you want to fetch stuff from remote config. So um, that's generally the way we recommend you use it. Uh, in case you're wondering what's up with that activate fetched call, um, why not just sort of apply these values right away? Uh, generally speaking, the idea is maybe you don't want your app changing mid-run, right? If you're, you know, if you're using remote config and you're using values to say change the layout of your buttons or like change the text of your buttons, it can be kind of awkward if that happens right when the user is in the middle of using your app, right? You don't quite know when that fetch call is going to be complete, and so we give that power to you as as the developer. And there's a couple of strategies for how you can actually make use of this. One is go ahead and activate you know, the values as soon as they're downloaded, if maybe you don't care if the values change in the middle of your app. Um, another option is to basically you know, put up a loading screen, kind of block until load. And so you'll call fetch with completion handler in your loading screen. Um, once the fetch is complete, you're going to call activate fetched, and then you can tell the loading screen to go away and put up you know, your real uh, view controller and, and actually start your app. And maybe just to be safe, you go ahead and add a timeout in case things go terribly wrong. Um, and so this has the advantage of you're always going to get the latest fresh values anytime your user starts up your app, but obviously has the disadvantage of you now have a loading screen that they have to look at. Um, maybe that's OK if you have other sort of setup work happening in parallel, but maybe you want your app to start a little faster. And so that's why I actually like this other method, which seems a little counterintuitive at first, um, but, but I think is pretty neat, which is you call activate fetched as soon as your app starts up or you know, maybe enters the foreground, whatever makes sense for your app. And this will take any previously downloaded values that are sort of in that cached local holding pattern and apply them immediately on top of your defaults. Then you're going to call um, fetch with completion handler, and you're not going to actually care about what happens in your completion handler. That's essentially a no-op. But what you've done is you now have new values downloaded from the cloud that are sitting there on your device ready to be applied the next time the user starts up your app. Um, so obviously, this has the advantage of being able to start right away. You don't have to wait for that network call to complete. Um, but does have the disadvantage of you might be supplying slightly older values. And then, of course, you could try a hybrid approach where you basically kind of um, you're allowed to see you know, when this last um, remote config batch of data was downloaded. And you can see, like, is it older than three days? Well, maybe that's too old for my app. So then I will go ahead and put up a loading screen and fetch the new values. But if it's you know, more recent than three days, well, then that's fine. 
Uh, fun side discussion about localized text. Every time I talk to people about, hey, you can use remote config for text, people are always like, yeah, that sounds great, but I know I'm not really supposed to because you know, we have all these best practices on these devices for using NS localized string and you know, that R dot thing on Android. Um, so you, know, you really want me to throw out these best practices and use remote config? And my answer is no, you can have the best of both worlds. So I'm sure most of you know, you know, NS localized string will provide the appropriate localized string for the device that the user is using, and it will sort of smartly fall back to a default language if, if you don't have that, that language available. Well, you can take that localized string value, and that's what you would actually pass into remote config as your defaults. And so what ends up happening is, for your English users, you're going to have a set of defaults that contain all your English text. And for your French users, you're going to have a bunch of defaults that contain all your French text. And so then when you realize that maybe one of your translations is not quite right and it's a little off, you can fix it in remote config. Um, within remote config, you have the ability to create conditions. And um, these basically are your way of telling remote config, please supply new values, but only to people who meet this condition. Um, sometimes it's you know, a random subset of your audience, but often it could be things like people whose device language happens to be French. So you might create a condition for your French speakers. And then within remote config, you would supply um, a new value just for that condition. You would say, my French speakers, this is going to be the new value that you're going to download. Um, you'll notice that for all your other users, the default value here is no value. Um, and this basically tells remote config, please go ahead and um, just use whatever default is supplied on the device. In fact, you actually just don't send any value down to remote config when you have no value here. So I don't need to supply you know, text for all the other you know, 12 languages that maybe I'm supporting in my app. And so this will end up just changing the store text only on devices where the language is French. So I'm still using NS localized string and still following all these great best practices, but I still also get to update my app when I need to using remote config. So that's pretty good. At least I think so. Um, so yes, in summary, you can use remote config to adjust localized text. Don't use it to dynamically localize all of your text in the cloud. Um, in theory, you could do it, and maybe that's a fun hack, but um, don't do it, because you're basically downloading an entire language pack, pack from the cloud every time, and um, that, that's, not, that's not cool. You get a, you know, a disappointed looking emoji for that. And uh, fun side discussion, apparently you can use emojis in your remote config strings. At least I tried it, and it seemed to work. I can't guarantee it's bulletproof, but, uh, but there you go. Um, let's move on to analytics, because this is really the, going to do a time check, all right? Might need to talk faster. This is really the backbone of what a lot of Firebase is about. Um, there's not a whole lot to say on the client side here. You're basically, you know, the API surface is pretty small. Most of the time, you're going to be logging events possibly with some parameters, and setting user properties. Um, and that, that's about it. Uh, so probably maybe the most interesting thing to note is that if you want to turn on debug mode for um, Firebase Analytics, it's actually an argument that you pass in. So you've got to go in and like, edit your schemes and put this thing in. Um, I don't know why, but, but that's what you've got to do. Uh, an important note about testing, analytics data is not being sent all the time, um, sort of as a way to keep, you know, be respectful of your user's battery life and all of that. We're not constantly streaming down analytics data. That, that wouldn't be cool. So instead, we only send down analytics data either if it's been an hour since the last time we sent down any data or when your app goes into the background. And so when you're testing this in Xcode, you're going to, you know, try firing off a few analytics events, and then you're going to hit stop, and then you're going to say, hey, how come none of my analytics data is making it? Is something wrong? Well, the issue is that you know, if you hit stop, then your app quits before it has a chance to send any of that analytics data. So if you are testing out analytics, always make sure you, you know, command shift H to go to the home screen in, in the simulator, or actually hit the home screen on the device, and that will give analytics a chance to send its data down to our servers. I'm going to talk briefly about audiences, because they're pretty cool, and we use them in, in some other Firebase features. Um, these are basically groups that you can define out of things that you are recording in Firebase Analytics. So this could be you know, people who have reached level 30 in my game, or you know, women in Canada between the ages of 30 and 45 who listed baseball as their favorite sport and have visited my in-app store but haven't purchased anything yet. Like They can sort of be as, as broad or as narrow as you would like. Um, and as people use your app, Firebase Analytics will, will subscribe them to these audiences, which is used for a lot of other features, including remote config. Um, one other condition you can add for remote config is, you know, does somebody belong in this audience? So you can actually change the look and feel of your app for people who have you know, reached level 30 in your game um, and sort of do all of that without having to actually kind of touch the code on your client, which is kind of neat. It's also used um, for notifications, and I'll talk a little about that later. Click. There we go. 
Um, one important note about audiences is they are not retroactive. Uh, people will create audiences, and they'll go and look at them in Firebase Analytics, and their first question is, oh, why are they empty? Did I do something wrong? Um, and so, no, you didn't. One, one, basically, the reason this is happening is in order for us to give you an analytic service that is free and scales to thousands upon thousands of apps with millions upon millions of users, we have to distribute some of that work onto the clients themselves. And so it's actually the client that is going to be determining whether it belongs to a particular audience or not. So as people use your app, they will get subscribed to these various audiences by, by the client as they are using them. Which means that if you think you're going to be using an audience for something um, you know, a few days or a few weeks ahead of time, go ahead and you know, start creating these audiences so they have a chance to kind of fill up and, and propagate as, as, as you go. Let's move on to Firebase crash reporting, um, which I believe is still in beta. But in spite of that, it's still pretty cool. Um, there's actually not a whole lot to say here. You sort of add in the, uh, you, you add in the library, and then um, crashes get reported to um, Firebase. Um, probably the most interesting part here is you're going to add this script into your build phases, which uploads your symbols file. Um, I think this is probably standard if you've used other crash reporting tools. But essentially, what this does is this deobfuscates your your you know your stack trace, so that when you're analyzing your crashes, instead of something that looks like this, well, there we go, woo, um, where you're like, oh, maybe the problem is with method 474525. I should figure out what that is. You know, you get something that looks a little more like this, where you can say, oh, I guess maybe the problem is with that crash button was press method. Why do I even have this method? Why do I have a crash button? Maybe that's the problem. I should get rid of it. Um, so that's sort of what happens when you, when you upload your symbols file. Um, when you want to test your crash reporting, it's a little tricky just in that if your app crashes um, and you're running it in Xcode, obviously Xcode will go in and it will kind of capture that um, in the debugger, which obviously is what you want, right? If your app is crashing while you're in the middle of development, you want to be able to analyze what's going on right there in the debugger. Um, so if you actually want to explicitly test that crash reporting is working by you know, sort of running a crash on your, on your app, first thing you got to do, run your app in Xcode, make sure the latest version is on your device or the simulator. Then hit stop in Xcode so that the debugger is no longer attached. And then run it again from the simulator or the device. And then generate a crash. And then you can run it one more time. And it's on this last run that Firebase Crash Reporting will notice that your app crashed the previous time. And it will then upload the crash report. Um, and this last time, you can run it in Xcode. And you'll actually see a little console message that says, like, crash report finished uploading, which is nice. Uh, a quick note on logging. So um, Firebase Crash Reporting also allows you to record some logs, report those directly to, um, yeah, to the crash reporting tool, so that in addition to getting a stack trace for any crash, you can kind of see what your user was doing right up to the point where the app crashed, so that you, know, you don't have to, so you can analyze this and be like, wow, my user is using my app in ways I totally did not expect. So you can do this by explicitly logging events to Firebase Crash Reporting, either with FIR Crash Log or FIR Crash NS Log. The first one just you know, reports to, to Firebase Crash Reporting. The second one also spits out stuff to the console. And uh, maybe for some of you that are doing more sophisticated logging, like you know, you've sort of written your own logging method, you can be like, oh, well, that's great. I can you know, report all my log messages to Crash Reporting with just you know, a couple of lines of, of code. And you know, voila, all my logs are now being reported to my Crash Reporting tool. Or if you're using something like Coco Lumberjack, you can say, oh, that's great. I can add in another logger that will you know, report things to my Crash Reporting tool. And again, everything that I log will also get logged to, to Firebase Crash Reporting or whatever crashing tool I happen to be using. Um, and this is great, but I want to point out one little cautionary tale that, that Doug, another um, Dev, DevRel guy, pointed out to me, which is that you might be logging things that you aren't expecting to actually get reported to a crash reporting tool. Right? I mean, I print out all sorts of stuff, all sorts of debug info when I'm, like, you know, when I'm developing. I print out OAuth information all the time and, and stuff. Because um, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to see that while I'm debugging, or you know, it's just going to stay local, local on the user's device. So if you are suddenly magically with a couple lines of code also reporting all that information to your crash reporting tool where perhaps other people in your company can see that because they have access to, to that panel, um, you know, just make sure you're not leaking information that you didn't intend to. Um, if you're currently using another crash reporting tool and you've done this kind of technique, also maybe go home and double check that you're not doing this. So uh, just a recommendation. I'm going to talk about dynamic links, because I think they're, they're also kind of cool. Um, these are basically links that work the way you want them to on mobile devices. So the very same link um, can take users either to an Android app, if they have it installed on their device, or an iOS app. 
if they don't have the app installed, it can take them to the appropriate place in the App Store or the Play Store. And uh, if you prefer, you can also take them to a website instead if they don't have your app installed. That, sort of, that, that option is up to you. Um, but one of the big advantages of dynamic links is if you have to take users to the App Store first, all that link information doesn't get lost. Um, your basically um, Firebase dynamic links can, can read in whatever link brought your users to your app in the first place. And that's generally good information for you. It's probably a really important signal um, for like what did the user click on that made them so you know, interested in your app that they had to install it. Because you can then take that information and make sure that you're presenting relevant information to your user right away, instead of just sort of a generic home screen or something like that. Um, so this is sort of a really good way to increase retention. Um, I encourage you to kind of look into these if you have any kind of email campaign or any other way you're sharing your app through a link. So one question I sometimes get is, OK, well, so are dynamic links the same thing as universal links? And the answer is mostly no, but kind of yes a little bit. Um, you probably know about universal links, right? It's your way of telling iOS, hey, instead of opening this link in Safari, well, if my app is installed, go ahead and open up my app and pass the link into it. My app will read in that link and know kind of what important stuff it should be displaying um, that, you know, you were probably asking for when you clicked on that link. Um, and you do this by placing a little Apple App Site Association file on your website. Um, and it generally all works. And this is good, you know, assuming you have a website um, with content that more or less mirrors what's in your app. Um, so you could use dynamic links in the same way, right? You could just say, OK, you know, if the user clicks on this link, take them to my app, and otherwise take them to you know, uh, some other website. Um, but generally speaking, most people use them when they want to be a little more aggressive about driving um, installs. Like if you're creating an explicit, hey, install our app button somewhere. right? It's di dynamic links that will be able to take your user to the app store, make sure they install your app. And when they open it up for the first time, it says, oh, you, know, you installed our app because you were interested in cat facts. Here are some cat facts for you right away instead of you know, just showing you a generic sign-in screen. Um, games are also another good example. Very often, you know, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of games out there that don't have all of that corresponding content on their website. Um, you know, if, the, if this is you and all your website just kind of has like a list of our games and a jobs page or something, um, you know, this is another option where dynamic links could probably be really helpful if you want to link to a particular replay or a particular level or something like that within your game. So uh, how do they talk to your app? Basically through two ways. One way is through custom URL schemes. And so you're going to kind of add your bundle ID as, you know, um, as your custom URL scheme. If you've done Google sign-in, you've done this before. Or if you saw my last presentation about dynamic links, this is familiar to you. And you're going to handle it in an open URL call. Um, within this open URL call, the full URL, which is that full giant dynamic link, um, you're going to pass it into the dynamic links library and say, hey, can you turn this URL into a dynamic link object? And either you'll get back the object, which you can then kind of parse and analyze and do whatever you need to um, to, you know, to respond to that link, or you'll get back nil, in which case, well, maybe it's a Google sign-in URL or a Facebook sign-in URL or something like that. The other way these um, dynamic links could get into your app is through universal links. And to get this working, you're going to need to turn on the associated domains um, capability. And you're going to need to make sure you add in this subdomain.app.goo.gl um, at head, uh, domain, basically, as, as sort of um, a domain that your app can accept. And this um, ABCDE will obviously be a code that is specific to your um, project when you create it in the Firebase console. And then you know, you'll handle it the same way, except that you'll be handling it through your continue user activity method instead of open URL. And so maybe you're wondering, wait a minute, I thought you just told me that dynamic links aren't the same as universal links. So what's the deal? Um, so the deal is that you, we basically do use universal links um, to send information to your site when they click on the dynamic link. What we do is we create our own tiny little website you know, with subdomain.app.goo.gl, and then we host our own Apple App Site Association file on there that then goes ahead and links directly to your app. Um, so it is completely up to you whether you want to support universal links on your own site. Like Maybe you do, and that's fine. And maybe you don't, and that's also fine. And maybe you don't have a website at all, and uh, that's OK too. right? It doesn't really matter. Um, so don't freak out about universal links if you're like, oh, we haven't gotten around to setting that up on our website. Um, you don't need to. You only need to make sure that your client is capable of receiving them, which basically means turning on that one switch in the Capabilities tab of Xcode. 
One last note on testing uh, dynamic links. Um, you can't cut and paste them into Safari. Um, if you do, basically, Safari will always act like um, your app is not installed. I think, is, is it the same issue with universal links? Maybe. Um, getting some nods. Um, instead, what you want to do is basically paste them directly into an app like Notes. And then you, know, you, can, you also have the option then of sort of editing these URLs. You want to try out different things and see what happens. And if you kind of long press on them, you also then have the option of whether you want to open them in your app or actually see what happens if this link goes to Safari. So um, yeah, if you want to test these links, put them in notes first, and then let iOS do its magic. I'm going to move on to 15 minutes. I'm doing all right. I'm going to move on to Firebase Auth. It lets you sign in from a number of different sources, um, including Google, Twitter, Facebook, GitHub, or even letting your users add in their own username and password that Firebase manages for you, so you don't have to add store passwords anywhere on your server. Um, so generally speaking, when you first sign in, you're going to use something like you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter to, to sign in the user. And you're going to get back, OK, I think this is user you know, Google123. And uh, here's some information that you can use to verify it. And so you will basically send that information down to Firebase and say, this is Google user 123. Firebase will go ahead and verify on this end, on its end, that yes, this appears to be the user that you say. And then you know, basically, once that's done, you will get back a Firebase user ID. And you'll be able to sort of access this user as a Firebase user um, in, in the client. And this Firebase user looks the same for all users, no matter how they signed into your app. So you can treat this object basically the same way. Um, and this user ID will be unique across all the different sign-in providers, no matter what you add. And then you also get you know, like a giant random string that you know, sort of gets paired with the user ID, so you can verify them on future visits. And this is cached locally and rotated out on regular intervals. And all that done transparent to you. You don't have to care about that. Um, but this is nice, because then when your user comes back to your device, you don't then need to sign them into Facebook, Google, Twitter, et cetera. All you, you, know, you have all the information there on your device locally to keep signing them in um, to Firebase. Um, now, granted, if you still want to you know, post things on Facebook or tweet something or you know, post something to YouTube, you are going to still need to sign into these other services. But if all you're looking to do is you know, sign in your user against Firebase services, um, you're all set. Firebase Auth also supports the idea of anonymous auth which I think is, is basically, it's, it's pretty cool. It basically allows you to sign in the user anonymously. Um, so you can tell you know, Firebase, I have this anonymous user, and it will still give you back a Firebase user object. And then you can go ahead and let your user you know, communicate with Firebase just the way they normally do. Um, then at a future point, if your user says, OK, great, I'm going to sign in with Facebook, well, now you can tell Firebase, this anonymous user that we've been using this whole time is also this Facebook user. And Firebase will go ahead and link up those accounts so that then if this same user signs in with Facebook on another device, they'll get all this information. And you know, we do the right thing where if this user also happened to have created another anonymous account um, on that other device, and then they say, oh, yeah, I'm also this same Firebase user, Firebase will say, OK, it looks like we've got two different accounts that you want to associate with this Firebase account. Let's give you this information, and you can then kind of resolve them how you see fit. That gets resolved on the client. Um, and so the nice thing about this flow is it lets you, um, it basically gives you the power to have your user use your app and all of its features without forcing them through a sign-in flow. Um, and this is, you know, it's great for your users. They often don't want to have to sign in just to try out your app, right? They're sort of much more vested in the process if they've tried it for a little bit and they say, oh, I actually really like this app. Now I'm willing to sign in. Um, it's sort of, you know, for you, it makes the whole process a lot easier to handle that. Um, and you know, Apple generally likes this, this approach as well. I know they're always sort of encouraging you to, you know, can you have the user try out your app without sort of sending them into a sign-in flow right away without sort of knowing what they're getting into. So try out anonymous auth if you haven't. It's, it's pretty neat. All right, I'm going to move on. I'm going to take a drink of water. Whew. Sorry, this is an awkward pause. All right, um, to Firebase app indexing, which allows your apps to show up better in Google searches. So um, sometimes a, a question I get about this is, oh, OK, so this is like universal links? And my answer is no, but also yes a little bit. Um, so app indexing on iOS is useful if you have universal links set up where those links point to your app. So we have our website that, you know, we've got our website and our app and our Apple App Site Association file that basically tells iOS, hey, instead of opening up any of these links in Safari, go ahead and open it up directly in the app if it's installed. Um, 
And so what you can do is basically through one call through app indexing, you can let Google know that your app is using universal links. This parameter that you're passing in is your iTunes ID. Um, so you app activate app indexing with this one call, and it does a little work to first you know, let Google know that your app is available on this device. And also what your Apple App Store ID is, in case you know, we need to grab some information like your app icon. It also lets Google know that you're using universal links install or universal links are installed on your site and that you're okay with it reading that file. And so then what happens is when your site shows up in the search results, Google will look at that link and say, oh wait, I know that link uses universal links, right? And I know the app's available on this device. And so I know that this, this link is not actually going to go to a website. It's going to open directly in the app instead. And so it will change the look of that result to look a little more appy. You'll kind of see your app icon there and, and that sort of thing. And then basically, based on the assumption that you've gone or your user has gone through the trouble of installing the app in the first place, well, that probably means that they are interested in the content of your app. And therefore, this search result might be a little bit more relevant. And so you will often, not always, no guarantees, um, get a little ranking boost uh, because basically we now know that this is going to go to an app that the user has installed and therefore is probably interested in. Uh, so then the other question is, OK, so is this like core spotlight? And here the answer is also no. Um, app indexing is really more for web content that you might be searching for on Google and letting Google know that those links will show up in your app instead. Right? Core Spotlight is really about letting Spotlight know that you have content available um, in your app on the device and that people can find it using Spotlight. And this is not an either or a proposition. Right? You, can, you can very clearly use both of these if you feel like they're appropriate for your app. And you probably should because you want your app to be discoverable. All right, so let's talk about Firebase Cloud Messaging, which is our one-stop messaging solution for messaging on, on all platforms. Um, so the idea is that you can use Firebase Cloud Messaging to both communicate with Android devices as well as route notifications through APNS to talk to iOS devices. And so how does it work? Here's the 90-second summary. I'm going to have to talk and click fast. Oh, actually, you know what? Before we do that, forgot. Why would you want to do this? Maybe that's a better question. Um, and so basically, part of the reason is that you only have to write um, one code path, right? You only have to talk to one service. And so sort of that, that gives you less code to write. There's sort of less code in general. I guess that's not true, because we have to write the code, but you don't have to, so it's not your problem. Um, so that's good. Um, there's other reasons, too. You can take advantage of services like topics. Your, your clients can subscribe to various notification topics about various subjects. Your client can say, hey, I'm interested in you know, events happening in Texas. And then you know, if you want to send a notification to everybody you know, who's interested in, in Texas events, um, you can do that without having to write any server-side code. Right? You simply tell Firebase Cloud Messaging, send this to people, subscribe to the Texas topic, and it will go ahead and do that um, to all the clients that, that have told Firebase Cloud Messaging that that's what it's interested in. It also lets you use the Firebase Notifications panel, um, which does make this whole process a lot easier, and I will talk about in a minute, because it is pretty cool. All right, so now here is the 90-second summary of how this all works. Generally speaking, you're going to set up you know, APNS, and you're going to have an APNS certificate that you're going to use to talk to that server. You're going to set up Firebase Cloud Messaging, and you're going to have an API key that's required to talk to that server. You're going to upload your APNS certificate to Firebase Cloud Messaging. It will associate it with the same app associated with the API key. Um, your client device is then going to ask APNS for a device token, um, assuming that you know, your user has said, yes, I, I would like to receive notifications. Um, APNS will, will send a device token, which you will then send down, um, or you'll then request a device token from Firebase Cloud Messenger, also passing down the APNS token. So you'll get back a Firebase Cloud Messaging token, and Firebase will hold on to that uh, copy of that token and make sure it's associated with the Firebase Cloud Messaging token. So when you then ask to send a notification, you're going to send it along with an API key, and Firebase will confirm that, yes, this matches your app, and a token, and Firebase will confirm that, yes, this apparently is a, a targeted device. And it will notice, hey, this Firebase Cloud Messaging device token is also associated with an APNS device token. Therefore, my target device is actually an iOS device. So I'm going to take that APNS cert to talk to APNS. I'm going to take that token to identify the object I want to talk to. And I'm going to put that in a new notification that I'm going to send to APNS, and then APNS sends a notification to your device. So simple, right? Um, so yeah, here's how you do all of that work um, on the client side. You do this. Um, 
So I'm, I'm being a little facetious. You still need to do things like enable um, notifications in your capabilities tab and register for the certificate in the first place and so on. Um, but basically, this call does all the work needed on the client to do that whole, hey, let's request a token from APNS and then give it to Firebase Cloud Messaging and get back a Firebase Cloud Messaging token. There's sort of some very clever method swizzling going on behind the scenes um, that hides a lot of these details from you. So basically, at this point, on your end, um, handling these incoming messages are just like handling typical APNS notifications, because they are. So um, you know, there's very little custom code you have to write to get your app to work with Firebase Cloud Messaging. And now that I've told you that, you're going to go and look at our documentation. Oh, actually, I'm going to hold that thought. That's right. Um, I want to also point out the first thing that we're asking you for, um, or that we ask for from APNS, is a silent notification. Um, and that's important because, you know, uh, as a developer, you want to decide when you're going to ask for those more visible notifications with the badges and the sounds and the whatnot, right? I think apps used to kind of ask for these immediately upon startup, um, but users are like, why do you want to send me notifications? I don't want that. And they would decline, you know, in, in fairly large numbers. And so now, you know, the, the best practice is for, sort of for apps to say, hey, we would like to send you notifications for these reasons. Doesn't that sound great? And the user says, yeah, that sounds fantastic. And then you write this code to bring up the, the system dialogue that then requests these notifications. Um, so you know, don't worry. You can still do that using Firebase Cloud Messaging. Yeah. So like I was saying, you don't have to write any custom code to uh, actually get Firebase Cloud Messaging to work. And then you're going to look at our documentation, and you're going to see this custom code to connect to Firebase Cloud Messaging. And you're going to be like, what's that all about? I thought you said I didn't have to do any of this. Um, and the answer is that you can also send messages through Firebase Cloud Messaging directly to your app if it is in the foreground without having to go through APNS or in addition to going through APNS. And so why would you want to do this? Well, mostly for redundancy. Um, click. There we go. Uh, it also turns out that um, Firebase Cloud Messaging does tend to be a little more aggressive about delivering medium priority messages, so that helps too. Um, but really, it's, it's, it's about sort of redundancy. And so what will happen is within your app, when it goes into the foreground, a little trouble clicking here. There we go. Um, when your app goes into the foreground, you will explicitly connect to Firebase Cloud Messaging. And then when your app goes into the background, you will explicitly disconnect. Um, and that's basically how Firebase Cloud Messaging knows whether or not to use that channel to communicate to your app. Um, and the nice thing is that Firebase Cloud Messaging does go, through the, um, does go through the process of deduping those messages for you. So from your perspective, it only looks like you get one. So why would we want to do this? Mostly for redundancy. Um, the other interesting thing that we've announced around notifications is the Firebase Notifications panel. This basically makes it a lot easier for non-technical members of your team to send notifications. Um, there will be times that you're still going to need to write custom curl calls and server logic and all that stuff. Um, but this does cover a lot. There's two pretty cool things I want to point out here. Um, first is that we can target audiences to receive these notifications. So I can you know, send a notification to people who have bought stickers for my in-app store in the past and tell them, hey, we've got some new categories of stickers. Go ahead and check them out. Um, and then we also define conversion events so we can see how effective a notification was. Um, Basically, within Firebase Analytics, if there are important events that, that you really want to track, like the user making a purchase or subscribing um, you know, to your newsletter or signing up for a premium service or that sort of thing, you would identify those as conversion events. And then you can tell Firebase notifications, hey, I would like to um, identify this conversion event as sort of the successful conclusion of this notification. So then for every notification you send, you can see the number of, you know, the number of people it got sent to the number of people who then opened up that notification, or I guess number of devices, because um, a person can have multiple devices, and then the number of times that notification led to a conversion event. Um, and that's really useful in case you're wondering if your notifications are, are actually being helpful or not, right? Are they being spammy, um, or are they actually sort of being helpful to the users that you're targeting? And so you can kind of look and see you know, how many of them are being opened, how many of them are being acted upon, um, and it can kind of help you realize either like I need to target at my messaging a little more, or I'm doing a good job. So that was a lot of stuff to cover. And um, I haven't even covered a whole bunch of other features yet, like Firebase Storage and AdMob and, and other things like that. Um, and normally, it's at this point that I would be plugging Route 85, which is my little show on the Google Developers YouTube channel. But I'm not going to do that. We've started a brand new YouTube channel. Um, 
just for Firebase. So um, it's not called Firebase Developers, it's just called Firebase, but you can find it at youtube.com slash Firebase, um, where we will probably be hosting a whole bunch of screencasts on how to get started with some of these features, um, both on iOS and Android. Um, you know, as we start building out these libraries and adding cool features and adding new stuff, they'll, they might get out of date pretty fast, um, but that's okay. It, it keeps me in a job, keeps me employed. Uh, so if you want to find out more, this is where you can find Firebase. Um, this is where you can get some nice help and support. We've got our YouTube channel. We've got our Twitter feed. And with one minute remaining, uh, I'm going to say thank you very much. I'll take questions down here. Thanks. <laughs>
then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now, let's close with an essential point. 
Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm going to want to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get-only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cr I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now, Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. OK, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block, and I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? 
Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today to this session. My name is Timo. I'm a product manager in Google Search, and I work on app indexing. And here with me, I have Fabian, who's a software engineer who also works on app indexing. We're very excited to talk to all of you about app indexing today. I'll start out with a quick overview of what app indexing is all about. I'll tell you a little bit how you can use Google Search to get more active users and to get, keep those users engaged. Then Fabian is going to talk a little bit about how you can get started with app indexing. We'll conclude with a very exciting uh, outlook of what we are going to do later this year around personal content with a couple of very exciting demos. Every day, users come to Google billions of times with their information needs. And that happens in many countries, more often on mobile than on desktop. Now, your app can be relevant to these billions of information needs. Your app content can help all of these users that come to us with various needs that they have. Now, the question is, how can you actually connect your app with all of those users and their needs? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the answer is Firebase App Indexing. Now, with App Indexing, you can get your app and its content into Google Search. That means you can acquire new users, you can experience organic growth, and you can keep those users engaged. Now, one of the changes that we've announced this week is that App Indexing is now part of Firebase. Firebase is a suite of integrated products designed to help you develop your app, grow a user base, and earn money. 
App indexing is one of 15 APIs that helps you, the developers, build amazing apps. We're in the grow pillar, and that means that it can lead to more active users. Together with your app content and Google search, we can delight all of those users that come to Google for, with various information needs. Now, who here today is familiar with app indexing? Awesome. It's a good number. So for those of you who are familiar with it, you'll find that Fabian has a couple of interesting changes to announce. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with it, don't worry about it. With Firebase, you have all the tools you need to get started at your fingertips. Now, next, let's talk about some of the products that we've built to help you grow your app and keep your users engaged. Now, let's start with growth and installs through Google Search. Now, here you can see on the search results page, we can help you get your app discovered. For very you know, specific search intents, such as I.O. 2016, we can show you results uh, from apps such that you can install that app. For example, here, all I have to do if I wanted to install that app is tap on that green button. It goes to the Play Store, can download and install the app. If I have more you know, generic information, such as you know, Google Apps or racing games, we show multiple apps to choose from. Now, through app indexing, we can also help rank these types of results better. Now, having to install an app, though, creates a lot of you know, friction between users and their needs, as well as you know, your app content. Now, yesterday, Ali announced something really exciting at the keynote, which is instant apps. It's an amazing new experience that keeps you know, user coming to your app faster. Now, instead of having to, to download an app first, they can simply tap on that result, and they go right into the app where they can find all the information that they need. Now, this will ultimately reduce this barrier that stands between the user and your app content. Next, let's talk a little bit about engagement and how Google Search can help you with that. Once an app is installed, we can organically open results from the search results page in your app. Here, for example, I search for I.O. schedule. You can see there's a result from the app. All I have to do now is tap on it, and it goes right into the app, where I find all the information that I need. Through app indexing, again, you can, we can help you rank those results better on the search results page. With the Google app, we've put the power of Google Search at our users' fingertips, for example, here with the search box on many Android phones on the home screen. All they have to do is tap on the search box, type in the query, and they're good to go. Earlier today, I looked uh, up various sessions in the I.O. app, now my, my, my own session included. Now, if I want to get back to that session, all I have to do is type in rules, which is the title of the talk, and I see a result appear here while I type in the Google app. Now, when I tap on this, it goes right back into the app, where I can find all the information, such as the stage and session, et cetera. Now, the Google app helps re-engage users with uh, your app content like this for thousands of apps. And it's really, really easy for users to just get right back in, because all they have to do is tap on that search box and tell us what they're looking for. Now, besides the search results page and uh, the Google app, Google brings your app content to our users' fingertips in the form of Now and Tap Anywhere on Android. Here, Fabian told me about a new movie, Captain America, that either we should check out. Now, all I have to do is tap and press the Home button, and I get more information through Google Now on Tap. Here, I get the card for Captain America. You can see that there's a couple of app results as well. Now, these app results are there because these apps use, are using app indexing. Now, if I tap on the IMDb result, it goes right into the app where I find all the information that I need. Now, that's really an amazing feature because it puts your app content uh, in front of the users anywhere where they are on Android. Now, let's talk about metrics a little bit. More than 10,000 apps are using app indexing to grow their app and keep their users engaged. But it includes most of the top apps that users use every single day all over the world. That translates to more than 200 billion app URLs in our search index, which is truly an amazing number. 
Let's look at some of the success stories of partners that are actually using app indexing. The Guardian saw an increase in CTR by almost 5% for app URLs over web URLs or mobile web URLs. Etsy saw an increase in daily app traffic by almost 12%. And AliExpress saw an increased transaction value by 200%. Now, those are some truly amazing numbers that tell you how important app indexing is for these partners and that any app really should use this technology to grow their user base and keep their users engaged. Now, with that, I'm handing it over to Fabian so he can tell you all you need to know how to get started. Thank you, Timo. So let's talk about what you need to do and how you can get started enabling all of these great features that we just uh, saw uh, working for your app. And as Timo outlined, the key is really to get your app into the Google Search Index. Because once it's in there, um, we can then surface results for your app in all these great places like Google Search, Now on Tap, the autocomplete feature. And we can bring users right into the relevant uh, screen in your app. Over the last year, uh, it's actually gotten quite a bit easier to index apps. So that, um, that's something we're really excited about. And you'll see that in a moment when I step through. There's three basic rules that you want to follow if you want to get this engagement and growth for your app. First, your app needs to support URLs so that you can actually link right into the right place. Second, you need to call our API so that we can actually better understand the content in your app. And three, you want to make sure you can keep an eye on you know, the impact you're getting from following the first two rules, right? How many more active users you're getting, and if there's still room for improvement, optimization in your app to get even more out of it. We'll step through these uh, one by one in a second, starting with supporting URLs. Let's do a quick show of hands. Who here has an app or has worked on an app that supports URLs? Oh, great, about half. And how many of you have worked on app indexing specifically, so getting your app into the index? All right. Cool, excellent. Um, so let's talk about URLs first. URLs were invented for the web, right? And so websites support URLs naturally. You have different web pages. Each one comes with their own URL. And that's what you see in the address bar at the top of your browser as you navigate the web. But for apps, it's a little less natural to support URLs. And we really have to think about and, and write specific code to actually handle URLs in our apps and make sure the right screen comes up when your app is started with a URL. But it's, it's really very important to do that, right? Because when we want to find relevant content for our users, we don't want to just send them to your app, just launch the app, but we actually want to take them straight to the right place, right? So this is really one of, the, one of the building blocks of app indexing. Next, you know, uh, there's a question of if you have a URL like the one that's on screen here, how do you actually know that there's an app that can handle this type of URL? How do you know this might potentially link into an app? And how do you find out what that app might be? So we somehow need to link up the website with the app or with a set of apps that can also show that content. And it turns out in the web world, we actually have a very similar challenge where a web browser needs to find out what web server it should go talk to to actually get the web page you want to look at, right? So when you type a URL into a browser, the browser uses something called the domain name system, or DNS, to resolve the domain name into an IP address, which basically tells it what server to talk to. And so that's worked really well for the web. And over the last year, we've actually seen a very similar system being established for resolving a domain name into a mobile app. And actually, it's, it's two systems, one for Android and one for iOS. Um, but they work very similarly, in fact, almost, almost identically. And I'll step through uh, how exactly it works in just a moment. What they do, these systems, is they allow you to create this connection linking from your website to the app and basically declaring, hey, this is the app or this is the set of apps that can handle my URLs. And then also the other way around, have the app declare you know, what are the kinds of URLs I can handle. 
And then with this two-way connection, um, that's really then what helps us understand that space. So let's look at how this specifically works on Android, and then I'll go into iOS second. And I'll just continue to use the I.O. app as an example as I step through, because many of you might already have that installed on your phone today, and so you can actually check out some of these things uh, right after the session yourself. And then also we'll be publishing the source code for the I.O. app uh, later after the conference, so you can go see the implementation behind, of this, behind all of this. So every Android app has something called the Android Manifest, and here's an example of the I.O. app's uh, manifest more specifically of the intent filter section. And that's where it declares that it can handle any URL in the domain events.google.com that starts with the path io2016 slash schedule slash anything. And then there's this little attribute that you can see, auto verify equals true. That's a very new attribute uh, from API level 23 um, that tells us that we have this two-way connection set up meaning that the system can go talk to the website, and the website will verify and confirm that, in fact, this is the app that it wants its URLs to link into. And also, if you add this attribute, what you'll actually get starting from Android 6.0 Marshmallow is that your app will be set as the default handler for these types of URLs right when it's installed. So that means that even the very first time a user taps on one of your URLs anywhere on their phone, be that a messaging app or, or the web or anywhere, they'll be taken straight to your app. And they won't get this disambiguation dialogue that you might know that will ask you, you know, do you want to open this in a, in a browser or, or in this app? So that's another great uh, benefit you get there. But for any of this to work, the server side has to also check out right, the other connection, the other side of the connection. So um, how this works is you host a small JSON file at a predefined path on your website that refers back to the app by package name and certificate fingerprint. And that part is really important right, for Google, for example, to understand that it's OK to link results from search for these types of URLs directly into this app, because that's something we really don't want to do unless we know, you know the website owner actually wants these, uh, this traffic to go into this particular app, right, instead of the website. On the iOS side, um, we have something called entitlements as part of the app itself. And again, that's where you would refer to the domain for which the app can handle URLs. And on the server side, again, a small JSON file, different one, but you know, similar in spirit, where you point back to the iOS app by iTunes ID. Again, a fixed, predefined path on your website where this goes. And you'll know an interesting uh, difference here, actually, between the iOS and the Android system. Uh, with iOS, the path prefix that kind of defines what exact set of URLs the app can actually handle um, is defined with the server-side configuration file on iOS, while with Android, this is part of the app itself in the intent filter. So now you've got this two-way connection set up. And of course, you still have to write the code to actually you know, bring up the right screen and so forth in your app. And I'm not going to go into details uh, about that here. Um, but at least now we have a clear system for you know, finding the right app to link into just given a URL. But until recently, actually, many of us have still been using custom URLs. And let me give you an example of what I mean. By custom URLs, I mean URLs that use a custom scheme, so not HTTP. This is an example of how this might look like for the I.O. app and for a particular session. So these links are broken in several ways. So I wanted to take a moment to try to discourage you from using these as much as possible, if you can at all help it. One of the issues here is that we do not have this system here, right, where we can somehow reliably resolve any part of this to an app. So it's really not exactly clear what app this should actually link into. And then also, it really doesn't work across platforms. So if you want to share this URL with a friend, send them a message, or post this on social media, you, you can't really, right? Because if your friend opens this on a mobile computer, uh, or on a desktop computer, rather, um, then that's not going to do anything on a desktop computer. 
And so in these cases, you still have to then send a web URL, which works anywhere uh, because it opens the web page. But then if your friend does receive it on a mobile device, then now that's not going to go into the app, right? even if they have the app installed. Because now you would first have to translate back from the web URL to the custom URL. And now you'd have to have like, some sort of big mapping table or translation rule. Um, so long story short, by using web URLs, HTTP URLs, you can actually sidestep a lot of these headaches. And so that's what I would recommend. But let's say your app does support HTTP URLs. Um, so now you're ready to test. And if you want to just test your app in isolation, let's say you, maybe you haven't gotten the server-side file deployed yet. For Android, you can just launch your app from the Android uh, debug bridge with a view intent and, and passing the URL you want to test out. And that should launch your app and get you straight to the right screen if, you know, if you've done everything right. And then once you've got the connection in both ways established, if you have the little um, JSON file for, for Android or, or iOS or both deployed on the website, then the easiest way to test is probably to just send yourself a bunch of URLs in an email or something and just tap on them on your device. And then that should go straight into, into the right screen. And so that's all the basics uh, you know, that is required for your results to start showing up on Google. It might still take a day or two for us to actually pick it up and to start showing these results to users. So in the meantime, what you can do, you can check out our brand new preview tool. You can find this as part of our documentation, which was launched it earlier this week. You can enter any of your URLs, and we'll instantly show you a preview of how your results are going to look like on mobile uh, for your users. So that's kind of cool. So with that, let's go on to the next slide and talk about the second rule, calling the API. As a user uses your app and browses the content in your app, you can call the API with the URL and the title of the current screen. And that helps us better understand how your app works and what content is important to users. And that can actually also be an interesting signal for us to help rank these results on Google Search. And another place where this is really important is the autocomplete feature that Timo showed you earlier. Here we have very limited real estate on the screen. We can fit a max of maybe five or six uh, results tops. So we want to make sure to really show only the most relevant results. And so in this case here, just knowing that I've looked at my own session <laughs> before in the I.O. app, that's a very strong signal for us uh, that there's you know, a li high likelihood I might want to get back there, right? and that that's important content for me. And so that's what we would show in autocomplete if I just type a few characters. And with one tap, I'll be right back in the app. And in terms of the code that we ask you to add for this, it should be fairly minimal. It can basically be distilled down to three lines per activity or per type of screen that you have. The first one is constructing the URL for the current session. Again, this is the example from the I.O. app. Second, putting together the action object with the title and the URL that describes what is happening. And you see that we use the view action here. We also support other action types, such as listen or purchase or uh, bookmark, depending on what it is the user does. But Viewing will be one of the more common ones. And then third, uh, you call the start method to indicate that the action is now starting. And there's a corresponding end method as well that would be called by the I.O. app as you navigate away from the session details screen again. And if you have instantaneous actions in your app, like you know, bookmarking something or purchasing something, then you can just call the end method straight away and, and be done with it. And to make it you know, as simple as possible to, to do this, we've added support to Android Studio. One of the things Android Studio will do, it'll tell you if there's any issues with both you know, your implementation of URL support in general or your implementation of uh, calling the API. 
And it'll also help you generate most of the code that you need to write to call the API. And it can also help you generate uh, most of the intent filters. And then you can also test right from within Android Studio. We have a feature where we can essentially simulate you know, linking into your app with a given URL. And Android Studio will show you what parameters were passed to the API in this instance, and then also show you a little preview of that page in your app. On the iOS side, uh, the API is even simpler and a little bit more limited currently, which is asked that you add a single call when the app starts up to, to register the app on the device. And so now you already essentially know everything there is to get your app into the index. And now you really want to make sure it actually worked, right? And you're actually getting more active users, and you want to see if there's any issues or maybe what you can optimize and tweak to get even more out of this. So one thing you definitely want to do is track refer traffic, meaning you know, keep track of how many users find their way into your app through Google. Um, and a way to make this simpler, um, or like to make this simpler for you, we've added this uh, method get refer directly on the Android activity object um, a little over a year ago with API level 22. And you can think of it similar to the HTTP refer header, right? It tells you where a user is coming from in terms of a URL. So in our example here, if a user is coming from google.com in a web browser, then the refer will be google.com. <laughs> and if the user is coming in through the Google app, which could be any of you know, auto completions or now on tap, all of these things, then the URL would be the second URL you see on screen here. The Android-app URL notation is, is just a way that, that we use to put both like a package name and the URL inside the app into one URL, so we can kind of package it all into one, one string. So if, if, if your traffic is coming from any of these two uh, refers, you know the user came in through Google. And you can log it accordingly in your analytics solution. If you don't have an uh, analytics solution yet, by the way, you might have heard about uh, this new offering also under the Firebase umbrella that we launched yesterday, Firebase Analytics, uh, which offers unlimited reporting for free uh, for your app. So that might be a strong candidate to consider here. And then from our side, we also offer some analytics. We have a tool called the Search Console that you can log into, and you can verify that you own a given app. And then we'll show you uh, metrics on you know, how many results are we showing for your app, how many clicks are these results getting, and also how many installs are happening as a result of people uh, discovering your app on Google Search. And that's basically it. So make sure to support URLs, and many of you already do. Second, call the App Indexing API so we can better understand the content and we can better rank your results. And if you already support URLs in your apps, then this is really the only, the only rule you have to follow in addition, basically. And then three, make sure to log into the Search Console to see if you have any issues and to see the, the, the benefits that you're getting and you know, what you might potentially be able to optimize further. You can find all of this and more at chi.co slash app indexing. But before you do that, I'm going to give it back to Timo for the exciting last part. Thank you so much, Fabian. I hope everybody knows a little more now what it takes to get your app and its content into Google Search. Now we'd like to talk about something very special that's going to come later this year that revolves around personal content. Now, so far, we've talked about how to get your public app content into Google Search so you can grow your user base and keep your users engaged. But every day, users all over the world interact with or create a lot of personal information, whether that's messages that you send or receive, documents that you create, you know, playlists that you listen to, or photos that you take. Now, all, that, all of that data is really important for many, many different user needs that our users have every single day. For example, it wouldn't be amazing if I could just find that message from my best friend that talked about this awesome new sushi place to check out this weekend just by typing a few characters. 
would be great to find this shopping list when I'm at the grocery store. It would be awesome if I could just you know, have in a few characters and get back to that playlist before my Sunday morning run. No, your app content can help with many of these different user needs. And that's why we're excited to announce today that later this year, we're going to let you index personal content on Android. We're going to extend app indexing to let users find anything in their apps through the Google app. Now, when we designed this addition to app indexing, we sort of followed three core principles which are privacy control and simplicity. First of all, personal app content stays on the device and doesn't leave the phone. That means that we will search over that data on the phone. Next, you as the developer will be in control over the life cycle of that data. You determine when content gets indexed, updated, or removed. And finally, if we go to the, if we advance once more, there you go. We had simplicity in mind when we built this. Fabian already explained how easy it is right now to get that content into Google Search, just a few lines of code, and want to keep it as simple as that. All it'll take, just a few lines of code, and your personal content will be indexed on the phone. Now, um, let's look at some of the cool experiences that we could actually enable with that addition. We've worked with some very special partners uh, in an early access program to demo some really cool use cases that this edition will be able to unlock. And for that, I need a little bit of help from Fabian here. Hope you can see the screen. All right, I don't know whether. Mm -hmm. OK, fair enough. Um, so my friend Henry sent me a message before uh, telling me about a great, new, a great session I should check out on Friday. Totally forgot the title for it. So let's see whether we can get back to that. All we have to do is tap on the search box here. Oops. Tap on the search box, and all we have to do is type the name. Okay, it's too bright. I don't know whether we can adjust the. We're good with time. We get a few minutes. Yeah. Let me try to just bring the brightness of the device itself. Excellent. Better? Is that better? No, maybe a little bit. A little darker still. How many developers does it take to fix the brightness here? <laughs> we need more people here on stage, apparently, to fix this. Maybe you can just talk through what would actually happen. All right. Because people have seen the autocomplete feature. Um, so we'll just close your eyes and, and think. Just imagine. That's right. That's right. So. What I wanted to do is find a message from my friend Henry where he's talking about this session I should check out. So all we have to do, as Fabian started to demonstrate, is type the name in the search box. And normally, you see com query completions for that. And instead, what we will show is a contact card for that contact, as well as a message from that app. In this case, uh, Henry sent that message through Viber. And all we would have to do is tap on the result, and it goes right into the app, uh, where we can then read the message in that conversation. Yes. And now that seems to be better. Uh, yes? No? OK, how about this? We just go for it, and then you just have to imagine that you see the right yes. things yeah. on the screen. We'll just do it like this. Thank you. All right, once more. Let's try this one more time. Henry and. <laughs> You see, you see an icon over there. That's good. That's a good start. Yeah. Just tap on the results, and we go right into the app. And get a little purple. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, anyway, Henry is telling me to check out Google's vision for machine learning, which is tomorrow morning at 9 AM. Sounds like a great talk. They should totally check out. Um, 
Now, OK, this is going to be now really tricky, but <laughs> right, we need to go down a little bit to see what else we got there. There you see Google's vision. Uh. All right, going into the next one. If we go back to the home screen now, um, by the way, who went to the concert last night? Awesome. It was amazing, wasn't it? Now, uh, we happened to go as well, and Fabian sent me a message, actually, with a video that he took. Um, now, all we have to do is search for Fabian. There we see there's a message in Glide. Excellent. So all we have to do is tap on it, and let's see whether we can play that back. Uh. <laughs> looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome. Now, um, going back to the previous message, tomorrow morning, 9 AM, I remember I had breakfast planned with, with Adam. So again, let's try to find the message, because I've totally forgot the time. Can we tap on it, search for Adam? Oh, D there you go. Adam. And there it is. There's a message in LinkedIn. All we have to do is tap on it. We jump right into it. And there we go, 8 AM on Friday. Thank you. Yeah. Now, 8 AM, I guess I have to get up a little earlier tomorrow. Fair enough. Um, I love eating yogurt for breakfast. Um, the other day, I started reading an article that was called How Yogurt Affects the Brain that I never finished reading, uh, but I did save that one in pocket. So now, if I want to go back to it, all I have to do is type in part of the title, and we can tap on it. It goes right into the app, where I can then go ahead and read it on my way home tonight. Thank you, Fabian. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Now, these uh, examples really show the power of that data and user needs. So through the Google app, we can let users find anything that they're looking for in the apps that revolves around their personal life with their personal data, all through the Google app by tapping on the search box, typing in a few characters, and they see your app content right there. And all of this will be powered through app indexing later this year. Now, here are the partners that we've worked with uh, in this early access program. They've done an amazing job in, in enabling these experiences. And we're looking forward to working with more of you later this year. Now, if you're interested in this, have a look at this link here and share your interest with us. Later this year, we will follow up with more information around availability of this extension of app indexing. Now, quick summary, we showed that with app indexing, you can get more active users, you can grow your app, you can drive re-engagement all through these various Google search features, such as the search results page, the Google app, now on tap, or instant apps. And Fabian explained three simple rules. That's all it takes to get your content into search. And later this year, you'll see some really cool features around personal content. Now, here's more information about both uh, app indexing as well as Firebase. Come chat with us. We have various sandboxes, code labs, in other sessions, happy to talk more with all of you. And with that, thank you all so much for coming. We hope you're as excited about getting your app into search as we are. Thank you. Hi, I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is The Developer Show. I'm standing here with Purnima Kochikar, Director for Google Play Apps and Games. Purnima, welcome to the show. Thank you, Timothy. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's great to have you here. First, I'd like to learn a little bit about your history and what brought you to Google Play. I know that you used to be VP at Nokia for developer communities. What is it that you learned about developers there that brought you to this role? What I loved about working with developers is that they are always optimistic. I don't think there's any job in the world that you're working with more optimistic people who mm. are trying to solve amazing problems. Uh, every day I talk to people who are saying, this is a new way of doing taxis, or a new way of doing education, or a new way of supplying food. So there's always a new way, and that's exciting. The second thing, what I love about developers, is that they'll take the technology or a platform that you have built and completely use it in ways that you have never imagined would happen. And so the two aspects of it, the surprises and, and the solutions, is what makes me excited about working with developers. 
problems. That's one of my favorite things too, is that uh, working with platforms, we always kind of have an idea of how developers are going to use it, and then they always find a way to surprise us, yes. especially with Google Play, because the, the landscape is so huge, there's always something every week where you're like, that's amazing, and I never would have thought of that. Yeah, exactly. And so it's it's amazing to be able to do this. Plus, you realize that you're actually making a difference in people's lives, both for the developer as well as for the user. Yeah. And so that helps too. It's interesting to talk about Google Play because developers building Android already know about Google Play. But sometimes I wonder if they know all of the kind of nooks and crannies and some of the best features. Uh, do you have like maybe some of the your favorite lesser known features of Google Play that are great for app developers and publishers? Well, I don't know whether it's about lesser known features, but maybe we should talk about the things that people may not think about. Mm. Uh, number one thing uh, I, I believe that people should really think about is that your users really want your app to get better and yeah. you should tap into them. <laughs> I think a lot of times we think, you know, I hear developers say, there's a really bad review, can you, can you make it go away? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, harness it. Your user really cares, so what can you do about it? But they're also telling you positive things. So on Google Play, one of the things we've really focused on is to how to get developers harness all the intelligence of the users to make better products. So everything from alpha beta testing to stage rollouts, and now we just introduce A-B testing, which we call store listing experiments. Mm -hmm. So harnessing the intelligence of your users, who are your biggest advocates and your users, uh, to make apps better, I think is something people don't use enough. Well, and we just mentioned an article on the show about uh, ratings and reviews in the Google Play Developer Console. And oh, I think we've done a lot of work there to bring that intelligence into a format that's actionable yes. and really like intelligible at the same time. Absolutely. One of the big things developers told us is that we love the fact that we can reply to reviews and that we can have a direct channel of communication to our users. However, there are so many reviews. How do I find the themes? Mm -hmm. How do I know areas that I should focus on? And what I find interesting is that there are folks who view it as something as a problem to fix, but a lot of people are now looking at as strengths that they need to leverage. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at it as a way to measure community sentiment management. So what we did is to say, how do we measure sentiment? And the tools we, that you're talking about allow developers to uh, you know, use Google Smarts to understand mm -hmm. all the hidden gems in your ratings and reviews. That's cool. Um, developers often ask me, and I'm sure they ask you as well, yeah. what's the secret? And coolest thing is you actually recently published the second version of the Secrets to App Success on Google Play, yeah. uh, which you should check out and will be linked in the show notes. However, uh, maybe you could give us a highlight. What's one of your favorite kind of insights from that book? The first thing we did was actually put it out linearly. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing about the book is that you can always just jump in where you are at the stage of what matters to you. So if you're in design, there is a section for design. If you're in place where you're building growth, there's a section for growth. If you're thinking about, should I use ads for monetizing, there's a section for that. It goes not just about Android and Play, but also looks at other Google technologies, like mm -hmm. ads, for example. So that's a huge plus. So the big insight I would like to point there is to really think about this, what it means to be not constrained by the market that you're in. Android is huge. Yeah. It's around the world. Okay. And you could be a global business no matter where you are. This book gives you interesting ways to tie from everything from how do you design for various markets, how do you localize, but also how you price. So wow. that I think is It's really inspiring. Yes. I mean, you know, think about it. Twenty years ago they would have needed a new management team mm -hmm. to figure out how to take a business global. Yeah. Now you could do it from your living room. And sales offices in multiple markets, whereas again Oh you can. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Timothy. This was fun. For more information about everything that we talked about, check the show notes for links. And of course, subscribe to this channel for more interviews like this. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'll see you next time. Hey there, Polycasters. Rob here. Welcome back to the show. Uh, last week, we were doing this thing called Ask Polymer, where we take questions from you and then we try and answer them here on the YouTube channel. 
And as we were collecting those questions, I noticed a lot of folks were asking, you know, when's the Polymer team going to create a data table? Or what is the roadmap for this particular element and stuff like that? And as we were going through that process, I really started to think that you know, if web components are going to be successful, we're going to have to scale beyond the Polymer team. Really, it's going to be up to all of us out here in the community to start making cool stuff, sharing it with one another, and also like promoting it. right? So one of the things that I wanted to do was, here on this show, I want to start a new segment called Built with Polymer, where I take all the cool stuff that you're building, and we just show it off so other folks can get involved with the projects and, and start using it in their own applications. Now, to do this, we're going to start off by looking at a website called customelements.io. I'm curious, show of hands, how many of you have seen customelements.io before? OK, I, I noticed that you did not raise your hand, sir. Uh, so so for, for you and for other folks like you, I want to just walk you through how this website works and some of the cool stuff that's on there. So if you haven't seen it before, customelements.io is pretty badass. Uh, you can think of it kind of like NPM for web components. It's sort of a, a, a registry. It collects all the things that are actually in the Bower registry, and then it displays uh, little bits of info about it. So you can search, and you can find the different components that are out there. You go to the website, and the first thing that you're going to see up here are these three sort of main sections. You've got the uh, stuff that is recently created. It's brand new. You've got the things that have been recently updated, which I always like to see. That's supposed to be a clock. Uh, and then you've also got the stuff that's the most popular elements out there, so the things with the most GitHub stars. All three of these very useful categories to, to kind of keep tabs on. And one of the things that I also really like is you've got this really huge search field up at the top. You know, anything that you could kind of imagine needing a component for, you can just go type. So I might say, oh, I want something like a, uh, like a table. So go type in table. And now I've got uh, all of these cool results popping up here for various kinds of tables. Another thing that customelements.io gives you, which is pretty awesome, is at any point if you want, you can click on someone's profile photo. And this will show you uh, not only their profile page, but also all the cool elements that they've produced in addition to that one that you were looking at. So if you think someone's making some really high quality stuff, you can kind of stock them on customelements.io and see what else they're making. Going back to, to where we were last week, a lot of folks were asking, uh, when is the Polymer team going to create a date picker in the material design style? Now, this is something that is not currently on the Polymer team's to-do list. We have a lot of elements that we've created. And right now, what we really want to focus on is sort of polishing those, closing bugs, and making sure that they work really well. So at the moment, no one is actively working on a paper date picker. And that, for a lot of folks, is sort of a dilemma. But if we go to customelements.io, we go to the search field, we can just type in date picker, or just date, whatever. And we can see right here, right away, we've got this paper date picker that shows up by this guy named Ben Davis. So let's scope that out. And looking at the component page on customelements.io, we get a lot of information really quick right here. So I can see, for instance, uh, how many stars this or how many stars this component has. I can see how many people have forked it and how many people are watching the issues on it. I also get the one-liner to install this on Bower. And what I think is is maybe one of the most important aspects of the site. I get this activity panel here, and on the activity panel, I can see that the component was created a year ago. And most importantly, I can see that it was last updated 11 days ago, which tells me that this is still being actively developed. People are you know, contributing to this thing. They're patching it. They're fixing bugs. And, and it's getting a lot of love right now, which is important for anything that I'm going to add to my application. Also, we've got the uh, list of Bower dependencies down here on the right-hand side. And again, it's really valuable because I want to know that, hey, is this thing depending on the latest version of Polymer, or at least Polymer 1.0? And some version above that. I don't want an element that is Polymer 0.5 or, or Polymer 0.3 or anything. That's just not going to work in my app. So having all of this information just kind of at your disposal every time you go check out one of these elements is a huge, huge benefit and one of the main reasons why I think everyone should be using Custom Elements I.O. Now, the other thing that it does is it slurps in the readme for this element. So you can see here on the left, I've got kind of the, uh, the GitHub readme that's just been pulled into the website. And if you want, you can go down here and click on the, uh, the component page. And this is going to give you sort of the uh, classic Polymer docs style, right? You've probably seen these before. We can see properties that an element supports. You can see the methods that it supports as well. Uh, one of the things that I noticed was not showing up here. Usually up in the top right corner, there's a little demo button. It's not, it's not showing up on this page, but we can just add that by typing demo into uh, the URL bar. 
And now we've got our paper date picker showing up. And you can see this thing looks pretty nice, right? I can, I can go click around different dates. Uh, changing the month gives me these sort of cool material design ripple effects. Close it, and then I can click this button again to show you how it reopens. Uh, lastly, one of the things that's really important is making sure that the date picker is responsive. So I go grab the corner of my browser, start shrinking the page, and then boom, uh, you can see that it has changed its layout, which is really, really good for mobile devices. So that is just one element that uh, Ben Davis has produced. If you go back to his profile on customelements.io, you can see that he's got a few other items here. Uh, uh, paper chip, paper time picker, slightly different from a date picker, paper full screen dialog, a lot of really interesting looking stuff there that hopefully we can show off in a future episode. So go find some elements on customelements.io. Go find the authors, stock them, stock them on GitHub, stock them, don't stock them in real life, but stock them on GitHub and, and on this website, right? So you can keep tabs on all the cool stuff that they're building. Another thing that happened last week was a lot of folks were asking, when's the Polymer team going to create a data table, something that is really sophisticated that I can filter, where I can you know, rearrange columns and do all sorts of stuff like that. Honestly, again, this is one of those things that it's, it's such a big undertaking. No one on the Polymer team currently has it on their to-do list. Because building a complex data table, you could, you could seriously just found a company just on making a killer data table. And in fact, uh, there's a group of folks who have done just that. So recently, a team called Vaden released a set of elements, which they're calling Vaden Elements. And very similar to the, the product lines that the Polymer team vends, things like iron elements and paper elements, they put out this set. And the bottom elements are split into kind of two categories. Uh, you've got these uh, business-oriented elements for things like data tables and combo boxes. They've even created an icon set of kind of business -y icons. Uh, and then they've also got a bunch of sort of data visualization components, bottom charts. Now, the uh, the core elements, as they call them, these, these sort of business layout ones, these are all free and open source. They are Apache licensed, so you can use them in your project today. And then the chart elements, uh, those are a commercial license, which you have to pay for. Uh, but since a lot of you were asking about data tables, I thought this would be a really good one to highlight because it's available on GitHub, and, and you can mess around with it and use it today in your project for free. So if you go to their website, which is at vaden.com slash elements, we've got this little demo button. And if we click that, it's going to show us this cool expense manager application. So I'm going to scope out the live demo for this puppy. And we've got a really, really nice looking uh, experience here. So uh, kind of classic table layout, columns and headers. What I really like about this is there's these uh, these filters up at the top. So I can just like go and, and check some of these values. And for instance, checking in progress and reimburse. You can see over here the, uh, this, this, uh, the amount of items in the table is changing as I'm changing these values, right? You can sort of see them changing over here as well on the left. Uh, we can also look for different merchants. So I could say, oh, I just want to see uh, stuff from the, the taxi merchant, for instance. And we'll just get only the expenses related to that category. Uh, likewise, you know, we can search by min and max values. A lot of cool things you can do here. They've even got this little uh, floating action button down here at the bottom. So you can use that to open a dialog and actually add a new expense to this table. Really, really cool example. Really, really cool, powerful element. It's one of those things that, again, it's not on the Polymer team's agenda at the moment to build. But here you've got this awesome community-built project, which we can all start using in our own work. Uh, so yeah, that about covers it for today. I've, I know I've only shown a couple elements, but there's actually a, a big, long list of elements that I want to start featuring on this show. But before I get into that, if you out there, if you've got some stuff that you've built which you would like for us to show off, it can be elements, it could just be cool projects that you've built, please leave me a comment down there in the YouTube comments. Or you can ping me on Twitter at hashtag builtwithpolymer. That about covers it for today. So uh, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Ready? Yeah. 43, take two, second sticks. Hey there, Polycasters, Rob here. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna pause for a second. Oh, Twitter notifications. Actually, okay, glad you asked because I did think a little bit further than you. Since you've started driving and you've no idea where you're going, um, I thought since we went to the boozer in England, we could this time continue the trend but go to a vineyard. Ooh, yeah. that's uh... keep it classy. See now, look at this, right? I kind of feel like, yeah, all right.
like we did the pub before back in England. But I do think this is a slightly better view. Uh, how how qualified do you feel? Not at all. Yeah, I know, I'm, I know I'm, you're going I'm, through this. It's, I know it's red or it's um, clearish kind of colour. Um, uh, it's nice and it's not nice. It's one of those it's, bi very binary with my wine yeah, tasting. And, and I have an upper limit of about five pounds or eight dollars. And if it's more than that, it's probably not worth it. Anyway, right. So I want to, since we're here, yes. I, we tend to talk about the web. Mm -hmm. And today I think is no different. I want to talk about libraries and frameworks. Ah, yes, because you're not big on the frameworks, are you? No, and neither are you. Uh, and on the other hand, I am not big on the frameworks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I don't think there's going to be much of an argument, but I do want to talk about it because it bothers me that I seem, I, I perceive that the default state of developers is, I've got a blank page here, how am I going to fill it out? Ah, I need a framework. Which one do I use? That, that, is, ah, that is a problem I have with frameworks, that they have uh, a way of starting projects. Like, they, they, there's a kind of expectation to use them from the offset. And yeah. I, I think if you're thinking, what, what combination of frameworks should I use to render this blank page, then I think something has sort wrong. of gone wrong. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's, it's entirely from a performance point of view. Oh. I, well, no, it's not actually. But OK, step one, performance. If your page has to load a ton of JavaScript in order to make a request for the actual data it's going to display, yes. you've, lost the, you've lost performance. Yes. And you can sort of say, oh, but next time it's going to be cached. It's, it might not be. You and might it, have changed the code, busted the cache. And, and it's an assumption that somebody's going to come back again. Right? Well, well, it's, I mean, it's your goal, I would say. It's your goal, but you don't know that somebody's going to. It's like paying a big, fat, hefty tax on the assumption you're going to get a repeat view. And That's you true. might not. That is true. You might not. Yep. And, 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 and stuff falls out the cache all the time. Yeah, exactly. So Not the service worker cache, though. Oh, you and service worker. Here we go again. Service worker! Da, da, da. One trick pony, Jake Archer. Uh, come on, but it's got a cache, you can rely on it. All right. Yeah. Okay, performance that notwithstanding. I think for me, um, it's about code ownership somehow. It's about a level of trust that I don't necessarily feel. And what I want to do is I want to be able to feel like my application code is the thing that's running, that I'm not running through something else that I don't necessarily understand. Well, running through something else is fine because that's what a library is, right? Like you've got, no, you're, 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 you've got hold both ends and you're running through bits okay. of library that you don't understand. Yeah. But that's fine because if one of them starts misbehaving, rip it out, <laughs> either code it yourself or find a, a replacement yes, library. But when, you, when you're going through something else, to well, you're kind of in get... something else, I think, yeah, with okay. the framework. You're, 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 and, and the framework will then do little bits of, it'll give you scraps, and then <laughs> please, you, you sir, do can something. Please, I have some more? I'd like to work with this application. <laughs> can you please send this data up More! <laughs> get out. But then the frameworks, you, you kind of, you're sat in a tiny bubble of, of the overall application mm. with a framework. And I feel like to get the most out of a framework, you need to understand how the framework is built. Mm. Like, and and these frameworks are huge, so it's they really are. To do I that. actually feel maybe, and maybe this is wrong, but it feels to me like it's a kind of the decision is an ergonomics one, like a developer saying, my ergonomics trumps the user's requirements. I want to feel like, you know, my job is easy, um, and what the user gets is what the user gets. Mm. And I, I, my my whole approach is very much the other, other way. I'd rather go the extra mile, and all my users benefit, than my life is a bit easier and I'll take some of the, the bad performance or the, the tax of using that framework. Um, and so I don't think that frameworks are inherently evil and uh, to be avoided, but I think you want to be able to transition to one and say, yeah, now it feels like we're getting to the point where we're going to reinvent that. Mm -hmm. And I think you can only do that when you've got to a certain point with the build. So for you, it's start lights, start with libraries as when you need them, and then make the jump to frameworks only if you have to. Agreed. How are you hey, doing? How's it going, Timothy? <laughs> Just, I'm screaming to the AO guys. You want to try it with me? Okay, let's do it. Ah! We're here at the ground floor of Google I.O. 2016. I'm here with Dion Almer. Dion, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Yourself? I'm doing fantastic. It's go time. We are T minus two days. Yes. As you can tell from the forklifts and the array of things yet to be put in their place. We're going to make it, right? 
I think we're gonna make it. Okay, I'm good. told we're gonna make it. Good. We're gonna sneak around and take a look at the I.O. grounds right before it gets done so you get a behind the scenes look at how I.O. 2016 came together. Let's do it. Oh, now this is a completely different micro environment. It's good. cool. It's very nice. And it's huge, too. I think there's going to be a lot of Android and some Firebase talks in here. Yeah, even some improv comedy. <laughs> is, is that in here, too? Yeah. OK, let's go find some people. OK, so Chet Haas is here to tell us about uh, the cool stuff that's getting set up. Have you had a chance to walk around at all? I walked into the tent where I was supposed to be. And did you get set up? I did. I did for uh, three different sessions that I'm involved in this week. Excellent. Is there anything that uh, you're going to announce that you don't want to tell our audience right now? Yeah, uh, we're, we're going to need to bleep out the following phrase and this next one too. Android... Not yet. Okay. What do you hope for this I.O. outside of your sessions? Good afternoon. Welcome to Firebase Notifications. <laughs> <laughs> In this session, I'm Francesco, and I'm going to introduce why we believe that notifications are important. Later on, Ting Mei, our product manager, will come on stage and introduce what we have built so you can use notifications effectively. And finally, Lawrence, our launching t-shirt guy and developer advocate. <laughs> we'll show you this product uh, with a few demos. So let's begin. Why notifications? When we embark in the journey of developing an application, we all dream about its success. We think about how much our users will love our applications. We want them to come to the application and want more and more. Because User engagement plays a really big role in application development. And notifications are those messages that pop in front of a user, they grab their attention, and hopefully they make them do something that we want to. A month ago, I bought a ticket to a festival, and this application is reminding me that in three days, the festival begins. And maybe I should come back to the app and check the final lineup, or buy tickets for the shuttle, or schedule the concerts, and share them with my friends. So notifications are really powerful in getting the users back into our application. In fact, there are studies that show that users that opt into notifications are twice as likely to come back as opposed to those that don't. But if we send too many notifications, we might upset the user. We overwhelm them, and we achieve the opposite effect. Users might silence the notifications, or even worse, uninstall our app. So we need to get a few things right. We need to know when is the right time to send the notifications. If, if I get the notification now to come back to a game and play a new level, it's probably not as effective. We need to understand who we should target. If you have like a wetsuit sales and we target runners, maybe we are not as effective as, as if we target surfers. And finally, what is the message? What we are trying to convey to the user? Because if we get these things right, 
That is when we grab the user attention and we get them to do what we need. If you write an application and we slip in a bug, and you know, bugs happen, right? We definitely have bugs in our applications. Not Lawrence, obviously, not Lawrence. <laughs> well, we want to target just the population that was affected by the bug. We don't want to send an apology to the entire population of our users. So notifications are really important. But to get these things right, we need some sort of feedback. And here is when analytics come to help. Because with good analytics data, now we can improve our engagement strategies. And our marketing and uh, growth hacker people, they can spend time in focusing on how we increase our user base. And our content editor can send content updates as they write the articles. And our product managers, like Ting Mei here, they're super happy and send announcements about new features that will make the usage of the app even more compelling. So we think that this is very important to get it right. And here at Firebase, we bought a new product that will let you do exactly this. Please welcome Ting Mei to show you Firebase notifications. Thank you, Francesco. So let's take a look at Firebase notifications. It is part of the Firebase product. <laughs> and Firebase is a suite of integrated products that helps you to develop your apps, grow a user base, and earn money. Francesco just mentioned that notification is really important in helping you to engage users with the right context and the right analytics, it could be even more powerful. But the process has to be simple so that people can really focus on getting the content of the message. Send an interesting message is going to bring your user back much more effectively. So let's see how Firebase notification is going to help you achieve that. Many of you are familiar with Firebase Cloud Messaging, the new version of Google Cloud Messaging. It has been reliably de delivering messages to Android, iOS, and Chrome users. Firebase Notifications is built on top of Firebase Cloud Messaging. It is cross-platform. It's designed so that you can set the right target with the right contacts and be able to evaluate the effectiveness after. It is simple. As you can see from this console, Anyone should be able to send a notification or message without having to write a single line of server code so that you can really focus on getting the content of your message right. But it is not just a form so that you have to fill out all the mandatory fields before you can send a message. It's designed so that you can set the right target by using analytic insights, FCM topics, or even device and app info. Once you have designed your right target, it's about engaging your user with the right context. For example, use language so that you can localize your message so that your Italian users will not be getting a German message, for example. Or <laughs> send your message so that it's delivered when the user, uh, based off the user's uh, time zone. Don't have to worry about waking user at 3 AM in the morning, get them mad, turn off notifications, and potentially say bye to your applications. Every application has its own customizations. And you can do that by using the custom data fields. You can pass in a dynamic link so that you can take user to the right context and the right flow of your app, or provide a discount code so that you can apply the discount when you search tap and open your notifications. You've just seen how easy it is to send notifications. But is it effective? Is it actually bringing more of your user back? Not having that much of a difference, or actually turning your user away? Firebase notification is integrated with Firebase Analytics and provide you with a default set of analytics so that you can understand the effectiveness right out of the box. When sending a message, a lot of the time, there is a goal that we want to achieve. And you can set that by using conversion events. 
we track sent and open for you by default. But obviously, you can provide your own. So now, let's go take a look at the console and see where you can find the analysis. Switch to the laptop. All right. So what you're <laughs> <laughs> so what you're seeing here is the Firebase console, and you can find notifications under growth because we believe that it can really help you to re-engage your user to ex to improve the experience. So this is where you have all the campaigns that you're managing. If you click on one of the campaigns that has already been completed, it's loading. All right. Um, this is where you're going to see the analysis, the notification funnel. So there's some interesting data here. The number of sent, and how many of your users actually tap and open your notifications. So apparently, uh, this particular promotion is not as effective in uh, getting the user open the, the notification, so we need to do better there. And if you actually provide a conversion event when you send notifications, we will track the number of times your user actually clicked that particular actions that will lead to that event. So this gives you the basic insight of notification effectiveness. If you want to do more analysis, this is when you go to analytics. So there's one trick that I would like to share with you here today. So if you go to analytics and look for notification opens under the events tab, this will bring you the default analytic event report view. So you see the total count, the breakdown by messages and topics, as well as the breakdown by location and demographic if those data are available to you. The trick that I want to show you is if you actually click on one of the messages up here, we'll actually automatically apply filters to all the dashboards and all the event reports in analytics. So now you can really do some serious analysis of how this particular notification campaign actually impact your underlying success metrics and factors. So now let's go back to the presentation, please. All right. So we've just seen the product walkthrough. So now Lawrence, our developer advocate, is going to show us some demo. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a really, really lazy programmer. So I really like to write as few lines of code as possible. But yeah, thank you. So actually, before I demo, I, don't, I get one of these. I got my demo wrong earlier. I was fixing it. So as, as I, let me see if I can. Who? OK, I see people waving. <laughs> oh, short. So I'm a very lazy programmer in general. I like to write as few lines of code as possible. I want things to be made as easy for me as they can be. And that's one of the things that really attracts me to Firebase notifications, because it's just so easy as a developer. And so first of all, I want to talk about two scenarios for building applications. And one is when you're receiving notifications in the background. And I want to talk about just how easy it is for you to build the code for doing that. So the first one I'm going to show is here's the code that you do if you want to receive background notifications in iOS. Any other lazy developers here? <laughs> you know, a single line of code. And it, I mean, technically, it's not even a line of code. It's a line of configuration, right? You add a single pod to your iOS application, and you use the Firebase messaging pod. Now, a lot of people ask, well, why messaging? Why not notifications? And you may be familiar with Google Cloud Messaging, and now it's new evolution, the Firebase Cloud Messaging. It, they're so similar, and the underlying infrastructure is used in the same way that we said there's no point in shipping two sets of libraries because they're so similar. So if you incorporate the Firebase messaging pod into your iOS application, you can also then grow into Firebase Cloud Messaging as well. But all you've got to do is put this into your application, and you're good to go. And then for Android, it's almost as easy. You just build this into your uh, build.gradle file. You're going to compile com Google Firebase, Firebase Messaging 3.0.0. And that's it. So if you create an application, and I, I'm going to demo in just a moment where I used Android Studio and I did file new application. And if you're an Android Studio developer, you're probably familiar with the empty activity template, which just gives you a hello world. That's all I did. And then I added this line to the build.gradle. And let's demo it now. Can we switch to the Wolf Vision? 
So I have an app running in the background now, and Ting Mei is going to send a notification to this app. Can we go to yeah, yeah. Can so we switch to, to the laptop? Please? Yeah, sorry, switch to the laptop. All right. So let's see. Let's start sending a notification. What shall I send? Uh, what should we say? What, what kind of notification, just so you know it's real? Any hockey fans here? Who's going to win the Stanley Cup? Penguins. Penguins. Oh, wow. OK. Who said the Seattle Thunderbirds? You're my hero. They're not even in it. Uh, so <laughs> OK, let's send Penguins. Oh, sorry. Penguins. <laughs> Easier this way. Hey. All right, so can we switch back to the phone? So now earlier you saw the phone was just sitting on the desktop, and the notification has just come in. You can see it up in my notification tray. So now if I slide down from that, my application was just called Firebase Notification 1, and you can see Ting Mei has actually sent the notification penguins. And then if I touch on that, it's going to launch the app. And this is the familiar Hello World app from Android Studio. I wrote no code to be able to get that. Isn't that pretty cool, right? I've never had so many applause for doing nothing before. This is great. <laughs> so can we switch back to the slides, please? So that, that was background notifications. And then people say, OK, that's great. But what about when the app is in the foreground? What about like if I want to be able to do things and I want to receive a notification and have it maybe change an activity in my app while the app is in the foreground? Like The classic example of this is if you're using like some kind of IP telephony app, and then you receive an incoming call, it's going to change your activity to be able to handle the incoming call. In most cases, you want to answer. Some cases, you want to ignore. And you got all that kind of UI. So you're changing the context of the app upon receiving a notification. So that's Let's take a look at how we would actually do this. In this case, and I'm still a very lazy developer, so it's not a whole lot of work, but it's a little bit of work, and it's a little bit more. So in Android, here's all I have to do. OK, I'm going to create a service class. In this case, I call it my Firebase Messaging Service, because like I said, I'm a really lazy programmer, and I have no imagination about what to call the thing. And I specify an intent filter on that so that it will handle particular actions, so that this class is the one that will handle the action. And the action that I want to handle is com Google Firebase Messaging Event. So what I'm saying is that once I compile my application and I have that service class in there, if this application is running on the device, whenever an incoming message comes, an incoming notification comes, then this class, the Firebase Messaging Service class, is the one that's going to handle it. And this class would look a little bit like this. So it's just you know, straightforward Java code here. This is my lazy, my Firebase Messaging Service. And I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to extend the, Firebase, the base Firebase Messaging Service class for that. And then whenever I receive a message, once I'm extending, then I just receive this on message received, and it's going to contain a remote message. And then there's a bunch of attributes of that remote message that I can do something with. Uh, some, I, I put together a screencast of this that went on YouTube last night. And one question that somebody asked me was, well, like, how would I generate a custom notification? So say, take for example, um, like Android M and Android N, we have the ability to have a custom notification, and you can reply, or you can do something directly in the notification. Here's where you would do that. You're receiving the remote message in. You can parse metadata out of that remote message. And then you can generate a new notification that you would then render on Android with that custom stuff on there. And also, if you have like an Android where a watch connected to it, you can like send the notifications there. So there's lots of really fun and lots of really great stuff that you can do. And this is really all the code that you have to do to be able to do that. It's you create the service, you create the intent filter, your service has to extend Firebase messaging service, and then you handle your stuff in the on message received. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy, right? And then people go, but what about iOS? I say, OK, iOS. Now, forgive me my slides. I tend to use Objective-C. I haven't become a fan of Taylor Swift yet. So people are laughing at my jokes. This is great. <laughs> so my last session, nobody laughed. So, uh, so, in, so when you're writing an iOS application, you just have your application have a did receive remote not notification handler on that. That's the second line of code here. And that's going to receive an NS dictionary. And if you're an Objective-C or an iOS programmer, you're familiar with an NS dictionary. It's just a set of name value pairs. So there's going to be a set of name value pairs, keys, and the value for that. So as you can see here, the user info bracket key that I'm doing there, that would be just where I read out the keys. Like maybe it's the message ID or the message body or something like that. And then I can do something interesting with that in iOS. So should we see this in action? 
What do you think? Why not? OK. So can we switch to the laptop, please? Actually, switch back to the phone first, please. And I have my application here running in the foreground. And it's the same file new Hello World application from Android Studio, except I added a service class to that with all the code that I just showed you on the slide. And I'm running it. And now, can we switch to the laptop, please? And Ting Mei will send a notification. And what, 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 what kind of thing should we send? What do you think? Something other than penguins, because I don't really like the penguins. Oh, uh, well, Sidney Crosby's good, but I don't know. Turtles? Turtles. Oh, there's no hockey team called the Turtles, <laughs> but that's OK. Name a hockey team. Sharks, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a former Seattle star plays for the Sharks, Patrick Marlowe. So I'm a big Sharks fan. Sharks? Sharks. They're going to win tonight, right? We'll see. So as Ting Mai sends that, can we now switch to the phone, please? Oh. And we should see an incoming notification is going to change my activity. Drum roll, everybody. Thank you for the drum roll. There it is. And we see this activity now that comes in. And this was launched in response to the notification. So in that slide you know, where I showed you earlier on that I've received the notification and I received data, I have another activity that I just launched, stuck that data in a bundle. So it was the from and the text. And in this activity, I render the text. It was really, really as simple as that. We're probably talking 15 lines of code total to do the whole thing. And I, this is me receiving custom notifications from Firebase notifications and actually doing something active with that. How easy is that? What are we going to do next year? <laughs> you know. So uh, with that, so Ting Mei, I would like to pass it back to you. And we're going to talk about some customers, right? Yep. Right. Can we go back to the presentation, please? And thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. <laughs> And I get applause because I got the t-shirts. Shirts to send <laughs> out. All right. So I hope you guys enjoy the t-shirts as well as the demos that we just uh, shown you. We definitely like it. Um, so you, we have just shown you how easy it is to be able to send notification without um, using the console, and also how simple it is to actually integrate on the client side. We don't want to develop a product in vacuum, so we have been gathering a lot of developers' feedback. And um, there are many developers who actually integrate with Firebase notifications already. Today, I would like to share the experiences from three of them. And for the rest, um, please go to other Firebase session and heard about their experiences. So first, <laughs> app in the air. Someone is taking a picture. <laughs> So App in the Air helps users to manage their travel experience after they have already booked their flight ticket. So they would get flight status change alert, for example. And what they found is Firebase notification is reliable and flexible. And they were able also to really allow them to focus on the important metrics of their app. Buzzbud, an application that helps you to book bus ticket. They will send you new route information or a discount code. And they were able to integrate with Firebase Analytic really quickly, while still able to customize to their user experiences. Milan Studio is able to use Firebase notifications in their latest application, True Day, an application that helps users to celebrate anniversaries. They have users around the world, and they're able to use a time zone feature so that they don't have to worry about sending notifications after midnight and disrupt their users. So these are some really interesting real-life examples and testimonies on how flexible, simple, and reliable Firebase notification is. So we've covered a lot today. We talk about why we think notification is important in engaging users what we've built to help you to better engage your users. And we also will show you some demos and also partner feedbacks. In summary, there are three key takeaways. We build Firebase notifications so that anyone can send notification without having to write a single line of server code. And we make the, server in, uh, we, we make the client integration super simple as well so that you can focus on getting the right user with the right contacts. And with a tight integration with analytics, you'll be able to measure the effectiveness of your notifications. We're really excited to announce that Firebase notification is available to you today. 
So for those who are interested to learn more, please go to firebase.google.com, check out our documentation and support page. We really look forward for your feedback because we want to develop a product that really helps you to better engage your users. So thank you so much for coming to this session. And now I'm going to invite Francesco back on stage, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. And before we take questions, I have a question for everybody here. And I've got a couple of prizes of some Chromecasts. <laughs> that uh, anybody who's an eagle-eyed developer, we saw we did our agenda slide. We did a little bit of joke and code. But there was a bug in that code that wouldn't compile. And if anybody knows what it is, come see me after the session. And the first two will get a Chromecast. <laughs> who's eagle-eyed? So let's take some questions. Now they're all wondering about it, right? Hello, I'm Timothy Jordan, and you're watching the day two live stream of Google I.O. 2016. Stay tuned for more sessions on all four live stream channels today and tomorrow. We'll also be on the ground as usual, behind the scenes, finding the coolest and most innovative things to share with you right here on the live stream between sessions. And if you want us to track down somebody with your questions, use the hashtag Step Hi, I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'm here at the Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View, California. The Google I.O. 2016 keynote just finished, and I'm going to take some time to talk to some people that were there in person about what they thought and what they're most excited about. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just downloading a new Android Wear watch face, which Chuki here built. Yay! It's really cool. What's it called? FitCat. Fit yeah, and yeah. Uh, you find it by searching for FitCat on Google Play. Yes. Um, tell me about the watch face. Uh, so what happened was uh, last year I watched a video on the uh, YouTube channel about um, Google Fit and Android Wear. You can uh -huh. put them together. And I decided that I need a cat on my watch. <laughs> that the more I walk, the fitter it gets. Yeah. And I partnered up with uh, Virginia Potrack and then we made this really super cute cat and put it on. It is on. adorable. And uh, we have a special uh, cat that is the IO cat. Really? So yeah. That's he's the one I'm going to switch to today. Yeah, and like wearing a, wearing a, a backpack, so uh -huh. it's uh, super fun. Yeah, I like it. You mentioned you have a cat on your watch. It's also a fit cat. It's a cat on your side. Yeah, and it, it, it encourages you to walk more because the more you walk, the more different things it does. That's very cool. Yeah. All right, so Chuki, you were in the audience mm -hmm. uh, during the Google I.O. 2016 keynote. Yeah. I have a few questions for you. What are you most excited about that was announced today? Um, it was kind of towards the end when they did uh, the Android Instant apps, mm -hmm. meaning that if you want to send somebody something that is better in an app experience, but the person doesn't have the app installed, he doesn't have to suffer with just using the web interface. He mm -hmm. can run just the part of the app that he needs, and no need to install anything. That's that really was cool. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, do you think you'll integrate that into some of your apps? Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, it's just right now. I mean, just from the keynote, fresh from the keynote, I'm like. Uh, I'm not sure how exactly I'm using it, but I want to use it. <laughs> Very cool. So one question about the keynote specifically. What from the keynote were you most excited to hear about today? I think it's about the Google Assistant. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, everyone dreaming about having their own Jarvis, right? Yeah. If you're fans of the Iron Man, of course we want to have our own Assistant. So having the Google Assistant, especially if they will have uh, the API, for me as a web developer, I really want to build my own Jarvis based on Google Assistant. So I hope it could be become the true if we open the API also for the web developer. And what is it that you're most excited to work on as soon as you get back to your machine at home? Uh, I think the first thing that I want to I want to build with a lot of new cool things I saw, like the Firebase. Firebase. Because as a web developer and also mobile developer, one the biggest challenge for us is actually talking to the backend. Mm -hmm. Right? If you focus on the web, you need to learn also about the, how you can build the API. But using the Firebase, I think you can forget everything about that. You can just using the API, throw the data into the Firebase, and you can just focus in your front web app. So, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good thing for us. Johan, thanks for taking the time yes, today. Thank you. And enjoy Google I.O. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling loose? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do this. This okay, is my okay. So, for the keynote, you were in the audience. I was in the audience. Is that cool or what? It was a fantastic <laughs> keynote. Just beautiful stage. The whole setup was just primo. Yeah, I, I think it's amazing. I mean, there's a session going on right now. We can see Chet Haas on the screen. He's loving it. Oh, he's loving it. He's, he, he is in his element. <laughs> <laughs> so, what 
uh, was announced today in the keynote that you're most excited about? Uh, I, I love to hear the word context in the keynote every year because I think developers really need to understand context as a whole. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I saw a lot of cross-platform stuff on there. You see, you look at the, the Firebase announcement. It works for Android, iOS, the web. You see that Android Studio is getting better C++ support. You see that progressive web apps are coming up across the platform to give us more reach on the web. Uh, there was just so much in that keynote uh, that allows developers to do more. And then with things like uh, Assistant, which is going to really sort of drive home when I think we get some access to those APIs to build some really amazing experiences. Awesome. And uh, what's the first thing that you're going to start building when you get home? Oh, uh, well, if you guys give me access, I'll start working on Google Home immediately. <laughs> But uh, I think the first thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at the new Firebase. Uh, with notifications that are cross-platform, uh, that looks very sticky to me. Uh, the analytics uh, that give me more information about how my applications work. Uh, I have lots of applications on a lot of platforms that could use those things. So mm. that's the first thing I'm going to tackle. Very cool. Just thanks for taking the time. Thank you very much, Timothy. Hello and welcome to The Developer Show. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Mary Grove, Director of Google for Entrepreneurs. Hi, Timothy. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Okay. Let me jump to a question about Google for Entrepreneurs. It's been on my mind for a little while because developers ask it right. and I think it's fair and I think we should give them an answer. Why is Google doing this? It's a great question. I'm yeah. glad you asked. So there's two ways that I look at that. One is if you look at Google's own history, our own journey as a company, it's entrepreneurship is such a core part of our DNA, right? Google began as a startup in a garage now almost 20 years ago. We are a company founded by entrepreneurs, built by entrepreneurial people, and then it makes sense that we are passionate about empowering the next generation of startups like Google to become successful, to launch, to use the internet to grow their business. So that's the first reason. Mm -hmm. The second reason, though, is actually an economic one. Right? We believe that by investing in communities, long-term investing in startup communities, these are the next set of companies who are going to come online, use the internet, leverage Google's products as well. So really it's this notion that all boats rise and long, long-term it's also going to benefit our own business too. Now before you were the director of this huge amazing thing, you were a BD principal at Google. And I'm curious, what did you learn um, doing those global partnerships that brought you into this new job? Sure. So my actual, my personal story with entrepreneurship begins with my parents. So my parents are both immigrants from Thailand, and they moved to America, sort of personify the quintessential American dream. They were entrepreneurs and really showed me firsthand that you can really, you know, create whatever future you dream for yourself. Mm -hmm. So at Google, fast forward many years later, I was working in new business development, as you said, looking at emerging markets for Google. And everywhere we worked, we looked for three things. One is how can we increase access, so internet and mobile penetration. Two is how can we increase content created from these regions. And the third bucket, which was my personal sort of passion, was entrepreneurship. So mm -hmm. how can we work with students, developers, any emerging entrepreneur ecosystem to really help them create the next generation of companies and really create and grow their own economies. So let's say you are a budding entrepreneur out there with an early stage startup, what's your first step getting help from Google? There's many ways to look at that, right? There's so many amazing groups and networks that Google has. Of course, Google developer groups being one of them, women tech makers being another great example. We, at the heart of it, are a technology company, so we hope that our products, our platforms can help you be successful. Beyond that, in the Google for Entrepreneurs umbrella, our mission is really about bringing together startup communities. So working mm -hmm. with partners of all types, whether that's physical space, co-working, tech hub, to accelerators and educational curricula, we try to knit together this global partner community of about 50 organizations who are supporting entrepreneurs. So we encourage you to get involved with one of them. For example, Techstars is a global accelerator running all sorts of programs ranging from Startup Weekend to their vertical accelerators. And you can find all these resources on our website, which is google.com slash entrepreneurs. Awesome. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about the program that you don't often get to talk about? You know, I think that we're based here in Silicon Valley, but Google is truly a global company. The internet has really democratized access to entrepreneurship, right? You can launch a company from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and have users in Seoul, South Korea, instantly. And so what I would say is, is we passionately believe that entrepreneurship's thriving all over the world. It's about getting more access, getting more opportunity, and helping companies really go global from day one and think about their market opportunity as not just 
their city or their, their country, but really the whole world. Mary, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Timothy. Thanks for having me. For more information about Google for Entrepreneurs, make sure to check out the show notes for all the links that you need. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'll see you next time. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right. And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. That could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah, and it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important, because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance the service worker to then use the AppShell model. And if you are using the AppShell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good, we've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paints on repeat visits. Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server-side rendering has on this, uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the App Shell model in mind, with server-side rendering in mind, you will get like, a really good first paint, even in like, Safari and um, like, mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have 
service worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, OK, well, should I be using the application shell model on all of my applications? Um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This, this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know, a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox, and it's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know, we, we way too much to explain in just one video, but we wrote up uh, a pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up, and I just read it. So you you just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how I wrote it. Pretty much. <laughs> Impact. Um, that's worth checking out. That's the format of this It's a mediocre already. article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out. Yep. Learn more about App Shell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yep. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like, really quickly um, that yeah. we're working on. So check that out. Yeah, build a weather app. So what if I told you there was a way you could compress nearly any stream of data by a factor of 10x or more? Wouldn't that be something you'd be interested in? Yeah, I thought so. Let's find out more on this episode of Route 85. So I want you to take a look at this array of numbers here. Imagine that we wanted to send this array of integers from a server to your user's device. Looks like just a bunch of random numbers, right? Well, that word random is actually the key to compressing these in an incredibly efficient manner. As you probably know, a random number generator isn't truly random. Supply a random number generator with the same seed, and you'll get the same results out every time. And we can take advantage of that fact to recreate that list of integers using a random number generator. You see, all I need to do to regenerate that array on a device is to supply three parameters. The seed for an agreed upon random number generator, an upper bound to apply to these results, and the length of the list. I simply supply those numbers to a method that looks a little like this, and I can recreate that original number stream. Just like that, I've built my array of 30 integers using just two integers and an int 32. That's a 92% compression rate. Now granted, finding that initial seed did take some work. But you know what? That work can happen in the cloud, so it doesn't really matter. What's important is that on the device, I'm able to decompress that number stream in order and time. And then, of course, once you start looking around, you can see that there's a ton of data you can compress this way. I mean, need to compress a text string? Well, what's a string but a stream of encoded integers? Once I have my stream of integers, I simply figure out what seed I need to generate them, and voila, I've compressed my string down into just three numbers. It's a pretty amazing savings, right? Anybody with the username of stidjexmissdizixgoodquibpubpa will be singing your praises in their reviews. And uh, my gosh, if you think about it, an image is really just a stream of numbers broken out into uh, several channels. Take a look at this image here, and you can see how, using our random number generator, I've been able to replace it with just three sets of integers for the red, green, and blue channels, respectively. Now, once again, finding the right seed can take some time, and I haven't found the perfect seed just yet. So if you look at the results carefully, you can see that this is not quite a lossless compression scheme. But I think you'll agree that for this kind of savings, these trade-offs just might be worth it. Anyway, I hope you consider using this technique the next time you have data that needs to be compressed. Remember, the more efficient you are with your user's data, the more they'll love you. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to check out other episodes of Route 85. And uh, remember that, as my coworkers on the Android team like to say, perf matters. All right, thanks guys. I think we're done. Uh, who let him into the studio again? I just, I couldn't say no to Elijah Wood. But that's... Elijah Wood. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called Iris. 
Iris is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. 
The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm going to want to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get-only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now, Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. OK, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. 
Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block, and I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine, and we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Let's be honest, you're an awesome engineer with an awesome app and you are using threading to the max. Sadly though, managing all those individual threads and assigning work between them is causing you to lose your hair. My name is Colt McCandless and please, don't join the bald club. Instead, use the thread pools class, which is an ideal primitive for breaking up lots of work into little buckets. See, historically, it was commonplace that applications would use a dedicated thread model. Uh, that is, one thread that only deals with database rights, while a separate thread only handles streaming of music, and a third one only handles networking. Uh, these setups are okay because the amount of work per thread isn't that large, and it's okay to handle this work in sequential order. But 
there reaches a point where this model starts to fall over. Now, say, for example, that you've got 40 bitmaps to decode, and each decode takes like four milliseconds or something. Now, putting all of this work on a single dedicated thread is a bad idea, since it'll take 80 milliseconds total to get all that work done in a sequential fashion. On the other hand, if you created 10 threads and let each one decode four bitmaps, then you'd end up only taking 16 milliseconds total. But then, of course, you run into the problem of how to properly pass the work around between those threads, schedule that work, and then managing of those threads. Before you start stressing out about writing all that code, don't worry. This is exactly what thread pool executor primitive is for. Uh, basically, this class will just let you spin up a number of threads and toss blocks of work to execute on it. Thread pool executor handles all of the heavy lifting of spinning up the threads, load balancing work across those threads, and even killing those threads when they have been idle for a while. Uh, basically, it handles all the heavy lifting of super parallel processing on your behalf. All you have to do is split up the work. But there's a small caveat here. How many threads should your thread pool have? I mean, technically speaking, you have the ability to create as many threads as you want, but that's not ideal. See, CPUs can only execute a certain number of threads in parallel. Once you get above that number, then the CPU has to start deciding which threads get the next free block of processor time based on how important they are. Which means that if you keep eventually adding threads, you'll hit a break-even point where your computation isn't getting any faster, even though the number of threads that you have has increased significantly. And it's also important to note that each of these threads aren't free. Uh, each thread costs you about 64k of memory in minimum, and that adds up quickly, especially in situations where the call stacks can start growing pretty large. As such, your app needs to find a sweet spot between the number of cores and the point of diminishing return with the number of threads. Thankfully, once again, the thread pool executor class has got you covered. When creating your thread pool, you can specify the number of initial threads and the number of maximum. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So today, my name is Sandeep. It's always Sandeep. <laughs> and I'm a developer advocate on the Google Cloud platform. My name is Brett McGowan. I am also a developer advocate at Google for the Google Cloud platform. And today, we want to talk about supercharging Firebase with Google Cloud Platform. So how many of you guys have had a chance to play with Firebase, either doing I.O. or maybe previously? OK, a good number. So you guys know that Firebase is an integrated suite of products to help you develop your app, grow your user base, and earn money. And as a developer, my favorite part of that is how quickly you can build amazing applications without writing a single line of server-side code. But when you do need some server-side code, Google Cloud Platform comes to the rescue. Now, Google Cloud is a full suite of cloud tools from VMs, big data, machine learning, you name it. And it makes supercharging your app really easy. So today, we're going to talk about how Firebase and Google Cloud Platform our best friends. <laughs> How they can work together to help you build amazing applications in record time that scale. So, you know, when we like started brainstorming what we're gonna do, we said, well, what are all the crazy ideas we have? And we just like started throwing them on the board. And we said, we're gonna build an app that does all of these things. Exactly. We're gonna wait, all of these things? That's all of these things. Okay, we don't have that much time. Can we maybe pick like a handful? Let's not get crazy. Okay, let's not get too crazy. They don't want crazy. They want boring, easy demo yeah. that works, right? Well, let's pick a few things. So we're going to build an app that does a few of these crazy things. 
Uh, you know, Brett kind of toned me down a little bit. But what we wanted to do was build a real-time, crowdsourced, live-streamed gaming platform. <laughs> that was a lot of buzzwords. A lot of buzzwords. So like what does them. that mean? So what that means is instead of a normal game setup where each player has their own character, everyone is going to be playing the same character at the same time. You might have seen Twitch plays Pokemon, it was popular a couple of years ago. Uh, but here's how it works. Every player who's logged in, we've got someone on tablet, mobile, desktop, they're all sending commands. Up, down, left, right, right, left. And the character is responding to every single one of them. Sounds a little bit chaotic, but a lot of fun. So of course, the Firebase real-time database is perfect for this. Whenever any client sends up data, it's automatically synchronized with all the other clients. This makes making real-time crowdsource applications very simple. Let's take a look. So I built a simple chat app, and every time I send a chat message with my phone, you can see the chat messages showing up in both browsers. You can also see the chats coming in the Firebase dashboard. And what is this data? It's just JSON. So of course, it makes it really easy to integrate into any application. All right, you said JSON. So let's talk a little bit about code. So how do you connect to Firebase? When you create a Firebase project, you're going to get three pieces of information. You're going to get an API key, a database URL, He's following along, <laughs> and a project ID. You'll use these three things to connect to Firebase, and you'll also use the API key uh, and the project ID to connect to Google Cloud Platform. So that makes it super easy. So you'll take this configuration, you'll pass it into Firebase, get a reference to your database, and then we're going to get a reference to our chat node. So Firebase is basically just a tree of data. So we've got a node called chat, and we're going to be inserting chat messages under that node. So each chat message will be a child uh, of the chat node. So how do we get the data into Firebase? Super easy. Firebase provides a method called push. And push will automatically append your data to this list. It'll create a new child, and it'll create a unique ID for you. This is really nice in our multiplayer environment, because you're going to have a lot of messages coming in at the same time. And you won't have to worry about stepping on each other, uh, getting conflicting IDs, or creating some sort of timestamp on your own. Firebase does that for you. So you pass in whatever data you want. In this case, we're going to do a JSON blob. It's a name value pair, name Brett, uh, and then text, hello, Google I.O. So just like that, it instantly goes up into Firebase. So how do we listen to the events uh, as they come in? So Firebase provides a few event listeners, one of which is called child added. So if you're listening to the chat node, any time a message comes under that, it's going to be a child node, you're going to get notified almost instantaneously. And so you can do whatever you want. In this case, we're just going to console.log and write it out to the browser. So of course, the real-time database with Firebase is what we all know and love. But Firebase gives you a ton of features as well, from static hosting, the cloud test lab, push notifications, user auth, remote config, and of course, the real-time database. But my favorite part about Firebase is you can pick and choose what services you want. You don't have to use all of them. So we're going to use static hosting, user auth, and the real-time database. And we're going to use these with the Google Cloud Platform. So let's look at our mock-up. Yes, let's look at our mock-up. Um, I think it's pretty clear we're developers, not designers. I mean, I think it's beautiful in the way that my mother thinks I'm beautiful. Um, so we just. Knock this out in HTML. We've got a login button. And using Firebase authentication, you click it, and you can log in using Twitter, GitHub, Facebook, Google. Firebase authentication makes it super easy. Right below that, we're going to actually embed a YouTube live stream of the game so you can see it as it's playing. Um, below that, if you've ever played a video game before, you're familiar with the concept of the D-pad. Up, down, left, right. Clicking on these buttons will send those commands to Firebase. And of course, what would a game be without a little trash talk? So we're going to add a chat box at the bottom. You type your message, hopefully something nice, uh, and everyone else will send it when you submit. Cool. So taking a look at our application architecture right now, it's pretty simple. We have all of our clients directly talking to Firebase, no server-side code. Uh, this makes us do the commands are all being pushed up to the cloud, as well as the chat messages. But simple is not crazy, and you promised me crazy. Maybe a little bit of crazy. We, we need crazy. It's not crazy enough for us. I mean, that was fun. It was fun. OK, it's not crazy. Yeah. Let's do something crazy. Let's run the game in one location. right? So normally in a Firebase world, 
Each client is connected to Firebase. It's sending up data, it's receiving data, but it's responsible for rendering the game either on your Android device, your iOS device, your mobile device, your desktop web. But the client is responsible for getting the data and rendering it and handling the game logic. We wanted to do something a little different. We're going to run the game in one location. So all the command commands come, it's rendered in one place, and you can see uh, how everyone is collaborating together. It's important to note that we're also not building a game. Like this, this session is not building a game using Firebase. Game is just what we happen to choose because we thought it would be fun and interesting and kind of easy to follow along. Um, but you can imagine this sort of collaborative environment where people are sending in signals constantly to do edit data, whatever you have, uh, would be applicable to a wide variety of platforms. And we're going to run this in something called Google Compute Engine. So Google Compute Engine is our virtual machine offering. And we chose Windows as our flavor of virtual machine. So Google Compute Engine is pretty cool. We have data centers around the world where you can run your VMs. And you can have custom machine types. This means that you're not locked into 2, 4, 6, sorry, 2, 4, 8, 16, right, powers of 2. You can pick 14 CPUs. You can pick 10 CPUs. And the same thing with memory. We're also uh, very proud of our billing. So we do sub-hour billing, which means if you use 25 minutes of time, you pay for 25 minutes. We don't round up to an hour. We also give you sustained use discounts. So there's no reserved instances or things like that that makes everything complicated. You use it, you get a discount, which is nice. But my favorite part is just how consistently fast they are. You can spin up like 1,000 Linux VMs in like five minutes. And because of our isolation in our data centers, you don't have that uh, noisy neighbor problem that you have in a lot of clouds. So let's take a look at how you would create a virtual machine on Google Compute Engine. So first, you're going to navigate to our UI. You're going to go to Compute Engine, which has the virtual machine functionality. We'll click Create Instance. So this will bring up a dialog with information we can fill out about our VM. Uh, for example, name. I'll name mine My Windows VM. And then below that, we've got different geographic zones and regions. So we've got zones and regions in Europe, Asia, and the United States. I'll choose the US. I want two CPUs, 7.5 gigs of RAM, and then I'll choose my operating system. So we've got a wide variety of operating systems you can choose from. In this case, I'll choose Windows Server 2012 Data Center Edition, because why not? Now, thanks to the power of sped up video, uh, our virtual machine is almost instantly created. It's not quite that fast in real life. Um, but there's this RDP button over here, which I feel like I should mention. You click it, and we actually have a Chrome browser extension that lets you remote desktop into your Windows virtual machine without having to install any software or set up any configuration. And look at that. Immediately, we're in our virtual machine. And we also have an SSH in the browser functionality for your Linux distributions. One other thing I want to point out about the UI uh, is this link at the bottom that says equivalent REST or command line. So it's really nice to use the UI to click around and say, I want this OS and drag and slide. I want this much RAM and this much CPU. But if you need to do that in a repeatable programmatic manner, so say you have an application that's spinning up servers or spinning down servers, or you've got a script, uh, clicking that will actually give you an HTTP POST request that you can send into the Google Cloud Platform API. And it's pre-configured with all of the settings that you just used in the UI. And the same thing with the gcloud command line command. So of course, uh, Google Compute Engine is not the only place we have to run your code. We have something we like to call the computing continuum. continuum. So on the far left, we have, of course, infrastructure as a service. Now, this is Compute Engine, raw Linux and Windows VMs, right? So you can SSH in, you can RDP in, you get full access. You can run anything you want. This is what you traditionally think about as you think VMs. But as you move up that spectrum, you get Container Engine. Now, how many people here are playing with Docker or Docker containers? Fair amount. Uh, so Container Engine is very similar to how we run everything at Google, right? Containers. So instead of having to SSH into the machine and manually manage it, you get a Kubernetes API uh, for a cluster. And Kubernetes is an open source container management system. So this lets you manage Docker applications on your cluster. You can say how many you want, scale them up, it'll keep them up, things like that. So you're managing applications and microservices, microservices instead of actually the raw infrastructure itself. And as we move up that spectrum, we get App Engine. So with App Engine, you just write your code, upload it, and boom, right? We worry about all that infrastructure stuff. We scale it for you. We do security patches. We make sure it's up and running. So again, this lets you focus on your application logic and building a great app and without having to worry about all the operation stuff underneath. 
And then finally, we have Cloud Functions, which are currently in alpha. So these are what we like to call event-driven programming models, right? So something happens in the cloud, and it triggers a function to run. Again, serverless computing. So something in Firebase triggers a function, or like PubSub, cloud storage, what have you, right? So these can trigger uh, little functions to run and do something without you having to worry about the infrastructure. So now that we've got our code running on a server, how do we connect it to Firebase? You're probably familiar with Firebase client SDKs for Android, for iOS, for web. And if you use a technology stack, such as Java or JavaScript on the server, you can use the same SDKs to connect to Firebase. But if you have a tech stack or a language that's not one of those, uh, we have some third-party SDKs. So we've got Python, PHP, Ruby, Clojure, Perl, Go, and C Sharp. So these are third-party SDKs. Uh, they're not supported by Google officially, so your mileage may vary. Uh, but I encourage you to check them out. But if you're not happy with one of those, or you've got a tech stack that's not represented here, Firebase is a REST API. So anything that can make an HTTPS REST request post, uh, you can use to access Firebase functionality, which is awesome. Yep. So in our case, we're going to be using Node.js. And we're going to be using something called Robot.js, which is pretty cool. So it lets you take Node.js code and translate it into keyboard commands, right? So in this case, we're going to connect to Firebase. We're going to use the same type of connection that we use on the client and go to the command subtree. And every time we get an up, down, left, or right, all we're going to do is send a keyboard command to our game, right? So our game can be any game off the shelf. We're just going to send it keyboard commands. And it's already Firebase enabled. Pretty cool. And we're going to live stream everything to YouTube. So YouTube Live gives us the ability to encode our Windows desktop, the entire desktop. So whatever is happening on it, we can actually live stream to YouTube. So that's what we'll use to show our game. And as a bonus, we can actually embed this YouTube video in our game. So as you're playing it and you're seeing the character respond to your commands, uh, you see it respond to everyone else's commands. They're all watching the same YouTube stream. And as a bonus, free bandwidth from Google Cloud Platform to YouTube. It's all happening within the Google network, so you don't pay for ingress or egress charges, which is really nice. So if we take a look at our architecture, we have the clients, again, speaking directly to Firebase, pushing up those chat and those command messages. And then we have our Node.js process running on our Windows VM. And now this is going to be taking those commands and relaying it to the game, right? And then we're going to take the whole screen and encode it and send it up to YouTube Live. Pretty cool. Cool. But cool is not crazy. I mean, it's pretty crazy. A huge multiplayer, simultaneous live know. stream game. Uh, it's not, not crazy good. enough no, for you? No. Okay. I need more. Let me think. You know what I've always thought? Typing is boring. So what if we get rid of the keyboard? What if we get rid of buttons? What if you could control this game with the power of your mind? Wait, wait, what? Just kidding. We don't have a mind reading API. But we have the next best thing, which is Cloud Speech API. You've probably seen similar technology uh, in Android and in Chrome, where as you talk, it's transcribing your spoken word into text. We talked a lot yesterday during the keynote about Google Assist. So this is the same text, uh, speech to text technology that, use, that powers all of that at Google using machine learning. And it's just an API request, an HTTP POST request. Um, so any technology stack, server, client, browser, what have you, can take advantage of Cloud Speech API. So like Brett said, it's a simple post request. In this case, we're going to just base64 encode our audio and then send it up, right? That's pretty much all you have to do. And you get back the transcript. In this case, how old is a Brooklyn Bridge? 98% confident. How old is the Brooklyn Are you asking me how old the Brooklyn Bridge is? Am I asking you? I don't, I don't know. It's 146 years old. Thank you. I, I know. did not need to know that. So it's looking a lot better. We didn't magically become designers, uh, but we took advantage of material design to, to kind of relay out and reorganize our app. Colors look better. The design looks better. You'll notice there's no D-pad at all. There's no way to control this, except by clicking that button and speaking the command. So instead of pressing up, pressing down, pressing left, pressing right, you'll actually say out loud, up, down, left, right, and the game will respond and send those commands up through Firebase. So looking at our architecture, we, again, don't use any servers for the Cloud Speech API. Our clients talk directly to the Cloud Speech API, get that transcript, send it up to Firebase, and then, again, our Node.js application running on Windows is going to relay those commands to our game and then live stream everything to YouTube. But oh. come on. That's like a little bit more crazy, like voice. You can't be satisfied. Can't be satisfied. So how do we make this no. even crazier? Um, what if? What if our game got so popular it was played around the world? Wait, what do you mean, what if? I'm sorry. 
Yes. When our game gets so popular it is played around the world, well, not everyone speaks English. So let's introduce、uh, multilingual support for our app. It would be awesome if I could verbally speak in my native tongue, and it would instantly be translated into the native tongue of everyone else who is playing this game in real time. And conversely, as they spoke in their native tongue, it would show up on my screen in my language. I think that's pretty crazy. So, for that, we use the Google Translate API. You've probably used the Google Translate app or been to translate.google.com on the web where you can type text. So, Spanish, we get translated to English. I can paste in some French, translate it to Japanese. Super easy, super convenient. And now we've made that available through the Google Cloud Platform as an API for you to use that same machine learning technology in your applications. So, again, it's a simple HTTP request. In this case, we just send up the string and the target language, which is Espanol. And we get back the translated text, and we can automatically detect the source language for you, which is really nice. Awesome. So, we have a lot more machine learning APIs. One I like to talk about is the Cloud Vision API. With this, you get the same power that Google Photos has, right? So, you send up a photo, and you can get very detailed information like what's、uh, emotion detection, object detection, OCR,、uh, uh, all these kind of cool stuff, again, with a simple REST API call. And of course, if you're using TensorFlow today, you can use cloud machine learning to train on our clusters, right? So you can get the power of CPUs, GPUs, and TPUs that we have in Google Cloud to train your, big,、uh, your machine learning models. And believe me when I say there's more coming soon. Sounds exciting. So here's our architecture as it stands now. Again, we've got clients, we've got tablets, desktop, mobile. They are transcribing your spoken word and then translating it if necessary using the Translate API, syncing both chat and commands using Firebase, both to our server, which is running Node.js, but also potentially every other client that's logged in using Firebase.、Uh, it's live streamed everything to YouTube so people around the world can watch it. So, so, yeah, why don't we do a little demo? Let's show you this game that we built so you can see these APIs in action. I'm going to be playing on my desktop, and Sandeep will be playing on his phone. So, first, I'll demonstrate the chat portion. So, let's see. Hello, and welcome to Google I.O. And look at that. Almost instantaneously on the screen, you can see hello, and welcome to Google I.O. Almost as soon as I was finished talking.、Um, let's see it, how fast it syncs through Firebase. Sandeep, you want to reply? Sure. Everyone here is so cool. Well, you're just pandering now. <laughs> But you can see almost instantaneously it showed up on my chat box. Everyone here is so cool.、Uh, now let's try a different language.、So、let me switch from English down to Espanol. And you can see again, almost instantaneously, it translated it all into Spanish. And if I click on it, I can see it in the original. I'm not that great at Spanish, so let me switch back to English. Wait, I took Spanish in high school. So, you're the resident expert? Oh, yeah. All right. Ready? ¿Dónde está la biblioteca? <laughs> And you can see it translate the classic Spanish 101 phrase, where is the library, on my screen in real time using Firebase. Pretty cool. Nice. So, you want to play the game? Let's play the game.、Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start it. This is my Windows remote desktop、uh, on the left. So, I'll click start and then explain the game. So, the point of the game is we're trying to get the red dot, which is in the bottom left corner, to the finish line, which is the blue dot in the top right corner. And we're going to do this by verbally issuing commands to, to the game simultaneously to control the character. And we have five minutes in which to do that. So, let's give it a whirl. Let's do it. Up, right. Up, right, right. Up. 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 Right, right, up, up. Right. There we go. Up, up. Up, left, left. Left? What are you doing? I don't know. Up, up. Up. Right, right,、left. right. Ugh.、Oh. Uh, up? <laughs> oh my God, we, we, we suck at this. We really are not good at this game,、oh、but、God. it's all right. I think that was fun. <laughs> But, you know, fun is not crazy. Uh oh. Yeah.、Um, I don't like where this is headed. Oh, you like where this is headed. We're going to make it crazy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, get out your phone and play. This includes you on the live stream.、Uh, it's going to ask for geolocation. Just hit yes. I'll get into why later. Of course, if you're not comfortable, you can hit no.、Uh, but, get out your phone. Come on, let's all get it out. We're going to make it loud in here. 
This is not going to work, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> this is definitely going to be crazy. All right. So we're going to restart the game and give the whole world five minutes to get Mr. Red Dot to Mrs. Blue Dot. Five minutes. All right. All right. Is, we're going to give anyone, everyone anyone, a few seconds. Is anyone on? Raise your hand if anyone at all is on. These so three people you right might have there. noticed that the UI looks a little bit different. Uh, we have a hold to speak button. Uh, you press it down, you speak, let it go, it'll transcribe your text. Some devices don't allow uh, browser support for the microphone, uh, so we have a D-pad. But uh, yeah, we can't build a native app in time and push it into the App Store. I know what. So unfortunately, PR said no uh, live chat. Blame PR. It was because I was swearing a lot in rehearsals, and they thought, you know, yeah. yeah. They didn't trust us. All right, so I think most people are ready to go. We're going to give everyone five minutes. Three, two, one. Whoa. What is this? <laughs> oh my god. Wow. This is amazing. <laughs> Holy. <laughs> <laughs> no! Come on, you're so close! I love it. There's trolls in every crowd. <laughs> All right, who's trolling with laughter? Come on! It's beautiful. You still have four minutes. Chaos. This is chaos. <laughs> All right, come on. You can do it! Oh, we're never going to get out of this little... Uh-oh. <laughs> Come on, oh, use the left. speech API. So use many people hitting left. This is amazing. It is. Oh! oh. Got out. <laughs> so remember, hold down and let go. <laughs> oh, so close. This is intense. Oh my God. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh. oh. Almost. Almost. <laughs> oh! Whoa! It, oh! Wait! Oh my gosh! It's in the corner. How did that even happen? Come on, so close! <laughs> oh, it's right there! It's oh right there! Oh my God! The, the <laughs> oh! Our v, our VM is being overwhelmed. We should have used a bigger one. I know, right? Jeez. Oh, this is amazing. I don't even know what's going on. I'm like lost. Oh, we have any tips for them? Okay. Everyone stop except one person. How about that? <laughs> yeah, that will never work. Oh, we're so far down now. Oh my god. This is crazy. I don't even know what's going on. Like, who else is using the speech API? Who got it to work? I think we just overwhelmed the Wi-Fi yeah, with quite a like, few. audio files. Oh, do, we, do we just give up? Look, it just like stopped. So I wrote this game in Adobe Flash. Let's blame Flash. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that was ridiculously crazy. Oh my god. Round of applause for everyone. Yeah. That was amazing. That was crazy. <laughs> that was crazy. Awesome. But... But what? Come on, one more thing, just for me, just old a, time's sake. Just a little bit little more bit crazy. A little bit more crazy. A little bit more crazy. Okay. So we'll do something a little bit more crazy. Um, and we're going to talk about big data. So at Google, we love big data. It's in our DNA. We've been doing it since day one. And we have a ton of tools to let you interact with, process, and analyze big data. I'm going to talk about BigQuery. So big da BigQuery is our data analytics warehouse tool. Well, what does that mean? What that means is you can upload gigabytes, terabytes, and petabytes of data into BigQuery and query it just using essentially SQL, the same SQL you already know. And it's a managed service, so you don't have to worry about scaling your infrastructure. You don't have to worry about replicating the data. You don't have to worry about backups. You don't have to worry about how much RAM or CPU. We take care of it all for you. You just upload your data, and as soon as it's ingested, it is immediately ready to query. So queries that used to take hours and days can now be done literally in seconds. Pretty cool. So again, thank you guys for enabling that metadata, uh, that geolocation. So basically, we collected some metadata from the client. We uh, used Google Maps to do some reverse geocoding to get your city and your state. Uh, and then we collected like browser type and device type, right? Simple metadata. Of course, in your applications, you might uh, do like IoT data, uh, like temperature sensors coming in, or like maybe like how many people click the red button versus the green button, things like that. 
So again, uh, thank you guys for enabling that. And all right, so here's the code, uh, how we got it into Big Table, uh, BigQuery. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, first, we require the gcloud client library. So gcloud is a client library that wraps a lot of the Google Cloud Platform functions in a nice sort of node-friendly style. Uh, we've got these available for Ruby, Python, Java, and Go. Um, so rather than having to make all the HTTP requests yourself, you can use this library in a manner that's familiar with, to you in those languages. After we uh, require gcloud, we're going to reference BigQuery. And then off of BigQuery, we're going to reference our data set name. And our data set name is just our database name, essentially. Uh, and then we'll reference, reference the table specifically. So uh, we've got this child added listener. This is the same child added listener we saw earlier. This is the app that's running on the Windows VM. So as the commands are coming in, it's getting a notified through child added. It's going to relay those keystrokes into the game, as you saw. And then after that, it's just going to do a table.insert into BigQuery. And it's going to use snapshot.val. That's directly the JSON payload that comes in from Firebase. So this is the payload that has the command, uh, and then, for example, city state of where, you, of where you executed the command. Yeah, we didn't have to transform that Firebase data at all. Yes, it's very useful. And then after that, uh, you can do any sort of post-processing that you want. So once it's in BigQuery, it just looks like any old IP uh, database. Uh, you have you know, columns and rows, and you can write some SQL. So this is the web UI. And of course, we have an API so you can programmatically interact with it as well. All right, speaking of interacting, um, let's take a look at the data that we just inserted into BigQuery. So as y'all were playing, we were actually putting that data into BigQuery. So as I uh, type this out, it's live data. So I'm going to do a select star. I know it's bad form, but it's less typing on stage. Um, and then let's see. Let's do order by timestamp descending. Whoops. And then let's run that and see what kind of data we get. All right, so we see, OK, so we've got a lot in Mountain View, uh, but then also in Utah, California and Utah. Shout out. All right, good job, Utah playing along. Awesome. Um, and again, it's just SQL. So let's see what were the most common commands that people issued. So I'm just going to do a count. OK, if left wins, I'm like lost faith in humanity right now. <laughs> There's a troll in every crowd. So I'm just going to group by command and run that. And you can see that, Ooh. wow. <laughs> So you can see that number one was right, uh, and then number two was up, which actually sort of makes sense in the context of the game, right? Like we're starting in the bottom left corner of the game, and we're trying to get to the top right. So most commands would either be right or up. Uh, and you we can have see the trolls, the, of course, down yeah. and left. Come on, guys. Who is on team left? Come on. Yeah, this guy here. He left. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. I have a couple of other saved queries, so we can take a look at that data. Again. As soon as you ingest the data into BigQuery, it is immediately available to query. So let's see, what kind of devices were people using? Uh, let's see. Let's run this. Another query is, oops. All right, there we go. OK, so most people were on their phone. We got about 1,200 clicks from desktop, and then a few people on tablet. So that's cool. pretty cool. Go uh, tablets. Go tablets. Are you on team tablet? I don't have a tablet. <laughs> uh, and then let's see by city. So I'm just going to do just another group by city and see, what, see where we got. Let's look. Wow, so 46. Wow, look at all these cities. Let's like go through them. Wow, that's let's awesome. Hit, let's hit next and like let's. Yeah. Let's so are we on five rows of time? All these cool cities. Kalamazoo. Wow. Seattle. Look at that. Thanks to everyone on the live stream for playing along. By the way, that's awesome. We got a really good international audience. This is really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. So you can see that data came in live, right? Like we couldn't make this up if we tried. Auckland. We nice. probably could though, but we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's wow. Shout out to all the guys in the live stream. Thank you so much. Yeah. And of course, everyone here as well. Uh, so one thing I want to point out, you might be looking at this query, and you see it says 1.9 seconds elapsed. And you might be thinking, you know, for a few hundred or a few thousand rows, it's actually not that fast. And you're right, it's not. So BigQuery is not designed to be super performant over small data sets. It's designed to be super fast over huge data sets, so like on the gigabyte scale. Um, so don't use it as your SQL database, but if you want to dump a lot of data into it and query it, so for example, logs data. So people will sometimes take their web server logs, stream it into BigQuery. Um, you can query massive amounts of data in just a few seconds really, really easily. In fact, where this product came from at Google um, is we needed to analyze all of our ads data, right? And as you can imagine, ads data and ads log data at Google is tremendous data set, humongous. And it was taking hours and hours and hours just to run simple queries. Uh, so we developed a technology that eventually became BigQuery and is now available for you to use. Yep. 
So you can really query terabytes of data in seconds. Literally in seconds. And you can imagine this game, you know, we played for like two minutes, and we already generated all that data. Now, if this game was running for like 24 hours a day, like an, uh, seven days a week, you can just imagine how much data we're going to be generating, right? And a normal database is going to be overwhelmed with that amount of data. So BigQuery is definitely where you want to store this type of data. So of course, that's not the only big data tool we have at Google. Uh, we have Cloud Data Proc. And this is our managed Spark and Hadoop cluster offering, right? So you can get a fully bootstrapped cluster in about 90 seconds. So if you're already running Spark or Hadoop and you want to move to the cloud, this is exactly built for you. And then we have Cloud Data Flow. And this is what we consider our next generation of MapReduce. So with one API, you can do batch, streaming, and ETL. We've open sourced this as Apache Beam. And when you run on our cloud, we do all the operations for you, right? The auto scaling, the instances, things like that, which is really nice. And for all the data analysts out there, we have Cloud Data Lab. This lets you do exploration, visual analysis with uh, IPython or Jupyter uh, open source notebooks. And it's tied directly into our machine learning and big data tools. So here's our final architecture. Uh, we've got our web browsers, again, running on tablets. As you saw, desktop, mobile. They're all listening to verbal speech using the Cloud Speech API, translating back and forth from multiple languages if necessary, syncing everything in real time through Firebase to every other client and to our server, which is running our game and our Node app, live streaming everything to YouTube, and inserting all that data into BigQuery, where it is av immediately available for you to query and see what your users are up to. But you know what was really crazy? What's really crazy? You know what was really crazy? The whole thing was we, crazy. Well, yeah. But we built that whole thing in like a week. It actually was pretty right? crazy. That was yeah. pretty crazy. It just showed the power of Firebase and Google Cloud and how it makes building amazing applications that much easier. So if you want to learn a little bit more, please check out Firebase at its new home, firebase.google.com, and of course, Google Cloud Platform at cloud.google.com. We also have two really cool YouTube channels, uh, the Google Developers Channel. How many of you are subscribed to the Google Developers Channel already? Awesome. And of course, the Google Cloud Platform channel, uh, where we have a ton of cloud content coming out all the time. And if you're interested in learning more about cloud, we've got a lot for you to interact with here at I.O. Uh, tomorrow, our colleague Felipe Hoffa is doing a session on big data. So if you are, Felipe is actually over here in the corner. Uh, if you are at all interested in big data, we just hit the, just the very tip of the iceberg of big data offerings in Google Cloud. Check that out. He's going to talk a lot about our big data offerings over the elections 2016 data set. That sounds scary. Yeah, no way I'm touching that. So. Uh, that is in stage five tomorrow at 11. Be sure to check that out. And please uh, stop by the code labs. We've got a bunch of code labs for you to get your hands on Google Cloud Platform, actually like, interact with it, write sample apps, and build things. Are we getting played off the stage? Uh, <laughs> Um, so if you go to the Code Labs, any, any machine you see, hop on. We've got the Cloud Code Labs. Uh, we've got a sandbox, sandbox, which is right out here through the left. Firebase and Google Cloud are right next to each other. Yes, we have this cool like, emotion photo booth, so you can make different emotions, and it detects it, and it kind of colorizes your photo uh, depending on your emotion. And we actually have interactive BigQuery exhibit, which is a lot of fun. And then finally, tomorrow at 9 AM, we have office hours at the office hours tent. So we'd love to hear what your questions are about cloud, uh, what you're doing with cloud now, and then any sort of interesting projects you might have for us to uh, talk about and see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs>
Instead, think more generally about how much space you have to work with. This can come in three different flavors, width, height, and smallest width. Width is super important and should be the basis for breakpoints in designing and building your UI. For example, 600 dp in width is the first point where you could consider having a side-by-side -side summary and detail level view. Any lower and you won't be giving each level a full attention it deserves. Height is less common when designing a responsive UI, but keep in mind that something like a vertically scrolling container is going to be difficult to use if you can only see one or two elements at a time due to a constrained height. Smallest width, unlike height or width, is designed to be rotation insensitive as it's just the smaller of the two values. This gives you a better idea of how much space is available and is an easy way to ensure that your app remains consistent as the device is rotated. You don't want to force your user to relearn your navigation structure every time they rotate their device. This is particularly important in the multi-window world. When your app is resized, your width, height, and smallest width are going to be updated. You might be going from full screen on a tablet down to what amounts to a portrait-oriented phone worth of space. Here's where a good responsive UI can make for a smooth transition. There are a number of common patterns you might consider when building that responsive UI, such as revealing previously hidden content as the screen size grows, transforming your navigation pattern or switching from a list to a grid, dividing your screen into multiple sections side by side, reflowing specific elements, expanding the size or margins of individual elements, or even changing the position of specific elements like a floating action button. Check out the blog post for more details on designing a responsive UI and specific patterns you can use to build better apps. Hey there, Polycasters, Rob here. So before coming into the studio, we tweeted out a question to see what folks wanted to see in the next episode of Polycast. And a lot of folks wrote in and said they wanted to know how to lazy load Polymer elements to improve the performance of their apps. So that's exactly what we're going to cover today. Now to do that, we're going to start off over here at the Polymer docs. And we're going to go down to the API reference. And some folks might not even realize that we, we have an API reference, but it's, it's kind of hidden down here in the sidebar for the documentation. You can go click on that. And that's going to take you to this sort of uh, kind of classic Polymer doc layout, if, if you've seen this before on other elements. And this is where you can find all of the properties and methods of the Polymer object itself. So a lot of really cool stuff inside of here. This is also where, for instance, like the Polymer templatizer documentation is. So if you wanted to create your own uh, version of DOM if or DOM repeat, you could use templatizer to do that. Just a helpful tidbit there. But what we're interested in here is this Polymer base object. And Polymer base is sort of the base prototype for all Polymer elements. And it's where we hide interesting like methods and properties and stuff like that. The one I'm into is called import href down here. We can hit the embiggen button to make it larger. And so what import href is going to do, it's going to give us the ability to dynamically load an HTML import at runtime. It's got a few arguments that it takes. The first argument is we're going to give it an href, so basically just a path to some component or some uh, HTML import that you want to pull in at runtime. And then it wants callbacks for on success, on error. And lastly, it takes an option, which specifies whether or not you want the link tag to have an async attribute on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use import href, and I'm going to build sort of a sample application. This is the app that I have thrown together. It is called Polymeal. It's a social network for foodies. And I guess people that like uh, stir fry, because um, there's a lot of pictures of stir fry. And uh, you can either go to the sort of the, the browse section, and you see here that I've got all sorts of yummy photos, or you could go to the activity feed, and you could see maybe like I'd be posting status updates from all the cool, awesome restaurants that I am eating at, right? Now, the main thing to take away from this is that these two sections have very, very different content, right? This one is, is a whole bunch of cards with some paper buttons on it. Right? And this activity feed is instead just sort of these like little, little status blurb things. So there's no reason to load all of this, uh, all these card elements if the user is just starting off in the activity feed. Right? It would just make more sense to load that at runtime to kind of like uh, reduce the bandwidth for our total application. So to do that, we're going to use import href over here in our code editor. So this is my X app element that I have started off with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an X app element. Inside of XAP, I will chuck in a little iron pages here. And inside of uh, iron pages, we'll have sections 
for the different bits of our app that we are interested in. So I've got a Browse section and an Activity section. And we've also got the PageJS router loaded into XApp as well. So if we go down to the JavaScript definition, we can see that I've got kind of a, a basic route stubbed out. And what I want to do is when the route changes to either the Browse section or the Activity section, I'm going to call Polymer's import href method, load in my element definition. Once that's loaded in, I will then tell Iron Pages to switch over to that section. Now, the first thing I want to do, though, since we're starting off just at like slash, uh, right now what we're doing is we're actually just loading a shell that looks kind of like this, right? We don't have, uh, you know, we're not hitting either the Browse or the Activity section, so the users kind of got, you know, nothing to look at. So we'll start off by redirecting them, page redirect over to the Browse section. So this way we just have kind of like a nice starting point. I'm going to write another handler for Browse, so page slash Browse. And you'll notice here that I'm using uh, ES6 fat arrow functions. That just makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to deal with the scoping of the this value inside of these handlers. So I'll say uh, page.browse. And what I first want to do is see if the element has already been loaded. Has this page been loaded before? Because if it has, there's no reason to import it again. So we'll call Polymer's isInstance method. And this is something that I don't even think it's, it's well documented. It might seriously not even exist anywhere in our docs. But I spoke with our tech writer. This is a thing. You can use it to sort of check to see if an element is an upgraded Polymer element. So because both our browse element and our activity element have IDs, we can reference them using automatic node finding. And we could say this.$sign.browse. So if this is already a Polymer element, let's just go ahead and return. No reason to do anything. No, no importing or anything like that is needed. Uh, but we will set the selected value to browse. And then what that's going to do is that's going to tell our iron pages up here to switch to that section. So you can see we're, we're binding its selected attribute to that property. Okay. Now, if the element has not been loaded, if it hasn't been upgraded yet, now we're going to import its definition. So we'll call uh, polymer.base.importhref. And we're going to pass it a path to the HTML import for the browse section that we want to load. So elements slash xbrowse slash xbrowse.html. And then we'll give it a success handler to run. So we're going to say, all right, cool, the element loaded in. Let's now set the selected state to browse. That'll tell Iron Pages to update. And now we can return, exit our, our route here. We should be good to go. If we go back and we look at our application now and we refresh the page, it should redirect to the Browse section, and it should start loading in all of those cards. Awesome, right? Uh, now we need to do the same thing for the Activity section. So I can just grab this entire route right here and uh, do, some, do some dangerous copy and paste work here. And we're just going to go through, and any place where it says Browse, we'll just flip it out for Activity. Activity. Thank you, spell check. So when we go to slash Activity, we're going to check to see if the activity element is upgraded. If it is, return. If it's not, import it. Let's go give that a look. So refresh the page. And we see our browse section looking good. We go to the activity section. And boom, we got our status feed showing up right there. Now, there's still a lot of unanswered questions to this. I kind of showed you the, the quick and dirty version of using import href. But what we didn't talk about was, you know, do we need to vulcanize these things into different bundles? And if so, how do we exclude common dependencies? Or can we just use HTTP2 to maybe like server push all the things or multiplex stream all of our dependencies? So there's still a lot of things that uh, remain to be worked out. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those in an upcoming episode of Polymer. But today, for what we've done here, if you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Otherwise, you can always ping me on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Otherwise, you can ping me on a social network at Take two. I'll keep all the, the fun stuff up here, top two thirds of the screen. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. 
And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. Let's be honest, you're an awesome engineer with an awesome app and you are using threading to the max. Sadly though, managing all those individual threads and assigning work between them is causing you to lose your hair. My name is Colt McCandless and please, don't join the bald club. Instead, use the thread pools class, which is an ideal primitive for breaking up lots of work into little buckets. See, historically, it was commonplace that applications would use a dedicated thread model. Uh, that is, one thread that only deals with database rights, while a separate thread only handles streaming of music, and a third one only handles networking. Uh, these setups are okay because the amount of work per thread isn't that large, and it's okay to handle this work in sequential order. But there reaches a point where this model starts to fall over. Uh, say, for example, that you've got 40 bitmaps to decode and each decode takes like four milliseconds or something. Uh, putting all of this work on a single dedicated thread is a bad idea, since it'll take 80 milliseconds total to get all that work done in a sequential fashion. On the other hand, if you created 10 threads and let each one decode four bitmaps, then you'd end up only taking 16 milliseconds total. But then, of course, you run into the problem of how to properly pass the work around between those threads, schedule that work, and then managing of those threads. Before you start stressing out about writing all that code, don't worry. This is exactly what thread pool executor primitive is for. Uh, basically, this class will just let you spin up a number of threads and toss blocks of work to execute on it. Thread Pool Executor handles all of the heavy lifting of spinning up the threads, load balancing work across those threads, and even killing those threads when they have been idle for a while. Uh, basically, it handles all the heavy lifting of super parallel processing on your behalf. All you have to do is split up the work. But there's a small caveat here. How many threads should your thread pool have? I mean, technically speaking, you have the ability to create as many threads as you want, but that's not ideal. See, CPUs can only execute a certain number of threads in parallel. Once you get above that number, then the CPU has to start deciding which threads get the next free block of processor time based on how important they are. Which means that if you keep eventually adding threads, you'll hit a break-even point where your computation isn't getting any faster, even though the number of threads that you have has increased significantly. And it's also important to note that each of these threads aren't free. Uh, each thread costs you about 64k of memory in minimum, and that adds up quickly, especially in situations where the call stacks can start growing pretty large. As such, your app needs to find a sweet spot between the number of cores and the point of diminishing return with the number of threads. Thankfully, once again, the thread pool executor class has got you covered. When creating your thread pool, you can specify the number of initial threads and the number of maximum threads. As the workload in the thread pool changes, it'll scale the number of alive threads to match. Oh, and a quick note, the value returned from get available processors may not reflect the number of physical cores in the device. Now, see, some devices have CPUs that will deactivate one or more cores depending on the system load to save battery. So if your device has two CPUs, but one of them is asleep, this value could return one. And of course, thread pools won't solve all of your threading problems. As mentioned earlier, unless you're dealing with lots and lots of work packets all the time, this thing's kind of overkill. It's best to use things like handler threads or async task loaders for specific types of work blocks and only throw the massive computing problems at the thread pool. And for you power users out there, remember that render script might be a better alternative to large scale parallel work on Android devices, but that's a whole separate set of videos that we haven't gotten into yet. And don't forget that SysTrace is an amazingly powerful tool that lets you visualize how work is flowing through the threads in your application. It's a great way to validate that things are working as intended and also see all the other crazy threads that are being worked on by other parts of your app. 
And that's the trick with performance, isn't it? I mean, you can make assumptions, but things don't always work the way you think, which is why you need to check out the rest of the Android Performance Patterns videos. And don't forget to join our Google Plus community to ask a lot of hard threading questions as well. So keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, Perf matters. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right. And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. That could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah. And it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important, because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance your service worker to then use the AppShell model. And if you are using the AppShell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good, we've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paint on repeat visits. Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server-side rendering has on this, uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the AppShell model in mind, with server-side rendering in mind, you will get like, a really good first paint, even in like, Safari and um, like, mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have Service Worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, OK, well, should I be using the application shell model on all of my applications? Um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This, this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know, a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox. and It's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know, we, we way too much to explain in just one video. But we wrote up. Uh, a Pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up, and I just read it. So you it's you fine. just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how I wrote. Pretty much. <laughs> Impact. Um, that's worth checking out. That's the format. Of this it's show a mediocre already. article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out. Yep. Learn more about AppShell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yep. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like, really quickly um, that we're working on. So go check that out. Yeah, build a weather app. Hey, 
Hey gang, did you know you can send notifications to iOS devices using Google Cloud Messaging? Well, you can. Why would you ever want to do that? Maybe that's a better question. Let's find out the answer on this episode of Route 85. So, notifications. They're a great way for you to engage with your users. They let your customers know you have important new information for them. And when used responsibly, they can be a great way to keep users coming back to your app but they're not super fun to implement. There's a lot of steps required to set up notifications in the first place. You need logic on both the client and the server. And if you're developing a cross-platform mobile app, and most of you are these days, you have to do this for Android and for iOS. And uh, I'm not just talking about two sets of client logic either. It turns out sending notifications to iOS and Android devices requires different logic on the server too. See, if you've done any notifications work in the past, you're probably used to talking to APNS, that's the Apple Push Notification Service, to deliver notifications to iOS devices, and to GCM, that's Google Cloud Messaging, to deliver notifications to Android devices. And while sending notifications through these two services is similar, they each have slightly different features, use different protocols, accept different message payloads, and return different responses, all of which means that you gotta keep track of what kind of device each of your users has and use two completely different code paths to send a notification. Or do you? Well, well, no, no you don't. You see, one pretty great feature about Google Cloud Messaging that a lot of people don't know about is that GCM can relay to APNS any notifications you wanna to send to an iOS device. Now granted, you'll need to do some setup work like upload your APNS certificate to GCM and make sure your client sends its device token to the GCM service. But once you've done that, you can use GCM to send all of your notifications, no matter what platform your target device is, and GCM will deliver your notifications to the correct device using the appropriate service. What all this means is that you don't need to care about what device your user has anymore. You just, has, you just have to write and maintain one code path, and as we all know, less code means less room for mistakes. But it's not just about using less code. By using GCM to handle your messaging for you, you can take advantage of some of the other nice features that GCM offers to developers, like topics. Topics allow your app to subscribe to notifications about any particular topic that you or your users want to. For example, let's say you've got a weather app and I, as a loyal weather fan, want to be notified whenever there's extreme weather happening in my zip code. Well, in the old way of doing this, you'd probably need to set up a database where you keep track of each one of your users and their devices and their zip codes and do this whole select users where blah 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 query, then loop through the results and send notifications to each device that you get back from this database query. But with topics, none of that's necessary. Instead, your app simply tells GCM that you're interested in subscribing to, say, the weather 94043 topic. Then, next time there's rain in California, for us that, that counts as extreme weather. Oh my gosh, there's something coming down from the sky! I don't know if it's water or if it's acid! I can't go out! I don't know how to drive anymore! Yeah, that seems about right. So yeah, with topics, your server simply tells GCM to send notifications to all devices subscribed to the weather 94043 topic. And I will get notified along with all other devices subscribed to that topic. So there's no database required. Go ahead and throw it out. Oh, uh, as long as you weren't using it for anything else, I guess. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. GCM has other useful features too, like upstream messaging, which allows your app to communicate to your server through GCM. This can be helpful in cases where you might want some lightweight communication from your clients to your server, but don't feel like dealing with the hassle of setting up and maintaining a full-blown server open to the entire world. Or read receipts, where in some, but not all, situations, you can be notified that a user has received your message, something you can't normally do through APNS alone. Oh, and in case you're wondering, all this is free, as in please send us zero dollars, uh, and it's using much of the same infrastructure that Google uses for its own apps, so it'll probably scale for yours. So there's a lot to learn when it comes to notifications, and I encourage you to get started here with our Google Cloud Messaging documentation for iOS. We also have a couple of sample applications for you to look at. There's Friendly Ping, our cross-platform chat app powered entirely through Google Cloud Messaging, as well as the GCM Playground, which lets you easily experiment with sending calls through the GCM service. And keep watching Route 85. Maybe you'll see another Google Cloud Messaging video pop up in the future. If only we had, we had some way of letting you know when that happened. Well, I'm stumped. So what if I told you there was a way you could compress nearly any stream of data by a factor of 10x or more? Wouldn't that be something you'd be interested in? Yeah, I thought so. Let's find out more on this episode of Route 85.
So I want you to take a look at this array of numbers here. Imagine that we wanted to send this array of integers from a server to your user's device. Looks like just a bunch of random numbers, right? Well, that word random is actually the key to compressing these in an incredibly efficient manner. As you probably know, a random number generator isn't truly random. Supply a random number generator with the same seed, and you'll get the same results out every time. And we can take advantage of that fact to recreate that list of integers using a random number generator. You see, all I need to do to regenerate that array on a device is to supply three parameters. The seed for an agreed upon random number generator, an upper bound to apply to these results, and the length of the list. I simply supply those numbers to a method that looks a little like this, and I can recreate that original number stream. Just like that, I've built my array of 30 integers using just two integers and an int 32. That's a 92% compression rate. Now granted, finding that initial seed did take some work, but you know what? That work can happen in the cloud, so it doesn't really matter. What's important is that on the device, I'm able to decompress that number stream in order and time. And then of course, once you start looking around, you can see that there's a ton of data you can compress this way. I mean, need to compress a text string? Well, what's a string but a stream of encoded integers? Once I have my stream of integers, I simply figure out what seed I need to generate them, and voila, I've compressed my string down into just three numbers. It's a pretty amazing savings, right? Anybody with the username of stidjexmisdizixgoodquibpubpa will be singing your praises in their reviews. And uh, my gosh, if you think about it, an image is really just a stream of numbers broken out into uh, several channels. Take a look at this image here, and you can see how, using our random number generator, I've been able to replace it with just three sets of integers for the red, green, and blue channels, respectively. Now, once again, finding the right seed can take some time, and I haven't found the perfect seed just yet. So if you look at the results carefully, you can see that this is not quite a lossless compression scheme. But I think you'll agree that for this kind of savings, these trade-offs just might be worth it. Anyway, I hope you consider using this technique the next time you have data that needs to be compressed. Remember, the more efficient you are with your user's data, the more they'll love you. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to check out other episodes of Route 85. And uh, remember that, as my coworkers on the Android team like to say, perf matters. All right, thanks guys. I think we're done. Uh, who let him into the studio again? I just, I couldn't say no to Elijah Wood. But that's... Elijah Wood. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine. And we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. 
to get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Welcome to the Googleplex. This is an incredible place with lots of great stuff being worked on every single day. Before I worked here, I always wondered what it would be like to come to the Googleplex, meet up with a Googler, and have coffee with them, and just chat about what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. And today we're going to do exactly that. Welcome to Coffee with a Googler. I'm Lawrence Moroni, and I'm here in New York City to meet with Roman Nurek. And Roman Nurek is one of our material design gurus here at Google. So material design, tell me, what, what's it all about? Oh, Lawrence, what is material design? Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's actually a, a video uh, okay. with a bunch of the original designers that created material design, and they get asked the same question, and they don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a complex kind of thing. There's a lot of things going on. Um, I guess at the most basic level, it's it's a design language, okay. it's a design system. Um, it's it covers visual interaction and motion design. I feel like most design systems, design languages, are treated as just visual languages. Like right. here are the colors you should use and so on. But okay. you know, material is is much more than that. It it really kind of covers the the model, the underlying physical model of a UI. Okay. So it basically tries to establish. This, this physical environment within which your apps should live, on a phone, on a tablet, on a computer, um, basically any sort of screen. Um, and then it, it basically establishes this physical environment in a set of basic rules and principles. Um, and I like to think of it along these kind of four basic axes or four basic principles. And that's uh, tangible surfaces, or okay. kind of the material metaphor. Okay. We could talk about what material is at some point. Um, also, bold graphic design, this idea that you know, we, should, we should take some of the best design ideas from the print world and see how that can help us you know, make really great apps on, you know, on digital devices. Right. Right. Um, and the third is meaningful motion, basically how all these things, how um, the surfaces and the, the ink on that surface, the, the, the graphic design stuff, how that all kind of you know moves in a consistent way mm -hmm. to help communicate what's going on, and the fourth thing, which is to me one of the most important things, is um, is adaptive design, which is how can we take all these these first three things and make sure that they work consistently and coherently across different devices, phones, okay. tablets, and everything else. Now you have a video, right, of some really good examples yeah. of material design being used. So shall we shall we roll that? Let's roll it. So some pretty excellent examples yeah. there, but it's like, you know, how does somebody reach that level? And for someone like me, I'm a developer, and my design skills are non-existent. So if I if I want to become somebody who can build apps with those kind of design, how how do I get started? And well, how do yeah, I learn this stuff? It's a it's a great question. Um, I think first of all, I just want to, I guess, recognize some of those apps are they're doing amazing jobs, and they have they have yeah. large teams. They, some of them right. actually have very small teams. Uh, some of those apps are. You know, created by one person. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely reach that level of quality from these amazing showcase apps, regardless of your team size. Okay. Um, but I'd say for the developers and designers out there that are just getting started, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great Udacity course that okay. uh, me, uh, Nick Butcher, um, also from, uh, from the Google team here, um, and James Williams from Udacity put together. Um, and that's available at udacity.com slash Google. Right. Um, and there's also a bunch of amazing resources on design.google.com, uh, which will kind of tell you about how to come to Android if you're doing iOS stuff, okay. for example, or 
how to kind of get started understanding what material design is. There's obviously the, the entire material design guidelines are there. Okay. So um, I'd say that the, the first thing, the, the Udacity uh, course, is probably the, the best kind of first step in getting started. Um, but there's, there's a whole lot of resources okay. out there, and we link to others from the Udacity course. Okay. And Udacity courses, if you're not familiar with them, they are very Socratic in how they teach, right? It's, it's short videos and then challenging you to do something, and then a short video and then getting you to do something. And it's a good way that someone can incrementally learn rather than be thrown into a like, huge design doc or something yes. like that, right? So. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, there's a very clear progression. We specifically designed that course so that you can kind of start with some of the basics, the most elementary basic things about a screen, like what is a pixel, mm -hmm. what is a density independent pixel, and then you kind of ramp all the way up to how do I make everything work on phones, tablets, and so on. Right, and I have to assume that a design course is well designed, right? Uh, we have some <laughs> we have some very nice color choices in our in our slides or our tablet drawings, so cool. hopefully. <laughs> so 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 back to material design again. It's like why why material? What is it that? So material goes back to that first principle. Right. Um, so the, this idea of uh, tangible surfaces, this idea that you know everything on a you know. On, on your screen and your device exists on a, on a surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think of them as pieces of paper. Um, so basically you can think of um, a, basically a sheet of material or um, the word material representing one of those pieces of paper. And the reason we don't just call it paper is because it actually is, it's a lot more than just paper. In the real world, paper, you know, once you rip it up, you can't really just you know, put it back together and right. paper can't go from being you know, a circle to a square or to a mm -hmm. rectangle. Um, and so we like to think of our digital pieces of material or sheets of material um, as kind of a, a smarter paper, a more kind of, you know, a still a constrained paper. You can't just do anything. You can't, it can't just, you know, do all sorts of crazy things. But it is a physical thing that exists inside of this kind of, you know, environment, this, this right. kind of like faux environment. But it, it is something that, that has a lot of thought put into it. And so the word material, you know, to me really means the, the sheets of paper that everything in this world exists on. But for me, the, the main thing, you know, to think about, the, the reason that motion is so important in material design is that, you know, motion should always have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to, you know, like, you know, just do a, like a flip of a button or like a double rotation or something just to kind of draw attention. Every, every time something moves, it attracts our attention. And so it needs to be really thoughtful and, and really kind of carefully planned out. And so in material, we use motion, or we kind of use just enough motion to convey the change in some object's state, or you know, try to get a little bit of attention, but you know, just enough motion, not too little, not too much. I understand Android Studio has some templates to allow developers to at least get started with uh, building material design into Absolutely. Apps. So one of the one, one of my philosophies for a long time has been, you know, we can write about, you know, a material design. We can write about a thing. Um, mm -hmm. We can make suggestions about that thing, and we can try to teach people about that thing. But one of the best ways to get, you know, the thing into people's hands, uh, you know, in this case, material design, is to actually just, you know, build it into the tools. Just mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, as a developer that's just getting started, even just on Android. Um, if I just go to file, new project, or new app, right, I should be able to get the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. And so in, you know, in Android Studio now, we're actually seeing um, new templates uh, for material design. So you could do file, new project, and then your default activity templates are going to come with material design in them. Okay. So it's going to use the material theme. Um, it's going to use some of the, some of the latest uh, support libraries for material design. So things like the Android Design Support Library, things like App Compat. Cool. And so you're you're just going to get a lot of great stuff for free right off the nice. bat. Nice. So for someone like me, I'm I'm a coder, not a designer, <laughs> and so but so I can use Android Studio, get the, the effectively the scaffolding done for me in exactly. these templates, and then learn from something like the Udacity course. Exactly. I, I definitely suggest you know, even before you do the Udacity course, file new project, right? Just look yeah. around the code, um, see what you get. Um, I think that that's a great way to get started. I always valued as a, as a kid and you know growing up learning programming and stuff. I always valued experimentation. Mm -hmm. So definitely experiment with that. Um, but as soon as you kind of you know uh, you know hit some sort of you know if you if you hit an obstacle or something, obviously take a look at the guide and the reference and all that. But the Udacity course is a great way to say you know what let me just kind of see what Google thinks is the right way to kind of approach okay. understanding this this uh, okay. system. 
Awesome. Well, thanks, Roman. This, this has been a whole lot of fun. And I've learned more about material design <laughs> in the last five minutes than I'd had in, in a year beforehand. So This is fun. I, and so I, can, I can always talk about this stuff. So, <laughs> They've um, told me that about you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> it's cool. It's been I'm, awesome. Last and I'm, I'm going to check out that Udacity course, and I recommend that you do so too. And if you're an Android developer, take a look at those templates. If you have any questions for me about this, or if you have any questions for Roman about material design or other aspects of building for material design, just please drop us a line in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. Uh, for more great episodes of Coffee with a Googler and for more great videos on developer topics, please tune to the Google Developers channel on YouTube. Thank you. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables one for training, and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. 
Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now, let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Pop quiz, hotshot. You've got 48 milliseconds of work to do, but only 16 milliseconds per frame to get it done. What do you do? My name is Cole McCandless, and while threading on Android can help cure your performance woes, it can also end up creating some huge problems, if you don't understand how it's all working under the hood. So let's take a few minutes and make sure we're all on the same page. <laughs> See, a thread by default does three things. It starts, it does some works, and as soon as that work is done, it terminates. Now, by itself, that's not too useful. Instead, what you want is a thread that sticks around for a while so you can feed it packets of work to operate on. But to do that, you need a little more scaffolding. First, since threads die when they run out of work, you need to have some sort of loop running on the thread to keep it alive. Just make sure to put it in an exit condition so you can terminate that loop later. In addition, you'll need some sort of queue that the loop can pull blocks of work from to execute on. And of course, you'll need some other thread that creates work packets and pushes them into the queue for execution. Now, if you've ever tried to write this setup yourself, you know it gets a little gnarly to get all of that machinery working correctly. Thankfully, though, Android has a set of classes to do all that for you. For example, the looper class will keep the thread alive and pop work off a queue to execute on. And rather than always inserting work at the end of that queue, the handler class gives you the control to push work at the head, the tail, or set a time-based delay that'll keep some work from being processed until that time has passed. And don't forget that units of work in Android are explicitly defined as intents or runnables or messages, depending on who's issuing them and who who's consuming them. And then the combination of all these things together is called a handler thread, which lets this look like this. Yeah! Pretty nifty, huh? So let's look at how you can use this in your application. When the user launches your app, Android creates its own Linux process. Alongside with this, the system creates a thread of execution for your application called the main thread, which at its core is just a handler thread. This main thread handles processing of events from all over your app. Uh, for example, callbacks associated with lifecycle information, or callbacks from input events, or even events that are coming from other applications. And most important is that these callbacks can trigger other work that runs on the thread too, like making a change to the UI will create work packets that allow the UI to be redrawn. 
Basically, this means that any block of code your app wants to run has to be pushed into a work queue and then serviced on the main thread. The takeaway here is that with so much work happening on the main thread, it makes a lot of sense to offload longer work to other threads as to not disturb the UI system from its rendering duties. And this is how the entirety of Android's threading model works. Now, lots of packages of work being passed around between threads and worked on as needed. So, with all this in mind, some of Android's threading classes make a little bit more sense. Uh, see, each threaded class is intended for a specific type of threading work, so picking the right one for your needs is really important. Uh, for example, the async task class is ideal for helping you get work on and off the UI thread in the right way. Handler threads are great when you need a dedicated thread for callbacks to land on, and thread pools work best when you can break your work up into really small packets and then toss them to a bunch of waiting threads. And intent services are really ideal for background tasks or when you need to get intent work off the UI thread. And like everything else, there's not a silver bullet here, but knowing which primitive is best for what situation can save you a lot of headaches. Now, if you ever want more insight into how your app is leveraging threading, make sure you spend some time getting comfortable with SysTrace. It's a fancy tool that'll school you on how that mumbo jumbo is working underneath the hood. And if you're looking to get schooled more, make sure you check out the rest of Android Performance Patterns videos. And don't forget to join our Google Plus community for more tips and tricks on threading. So keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. Hey there, Polycasters. Rob here. Welcome back to the show. Uh, as we've been working on Polymer, one of the probably biggest requests that comes in from developers is, when are we going to get a CDN for Polymer and for web components? Because it's kind of a pain in the butt every time you want to sort of like hack on an idea and you've got to use Bower and install a bunch of packages and wait for everything to download just so you can, you know, play with stuff. So recently, the Polymer team has put out a brand new project, which is called PolyGit. It is a development CDN, which I'll, I'll talk about what that word means uh, in just a second. Uh, but basically, it is a CDN that includes Polymer, all the Polymer elements, and the Web Components polyfill. So if you want to hack around using something like JSBin and Polymer, you can totally do that. So if you go to the website polygit.org, you see that it bills itself as the Polymer Magic Server. And what it's actually doing under the hood is it's just using GitHub's raw Git CDN and extracting things from there and pulling them into you know, JS bin or, or wherever you want to use the CDN. So what I want to do here is just sort of like show you some examples of how you can use the CDN, how you can configure it to actually pull in your own packages as well, and, uh, and basically just get hacking really quick. So, uh, over on jsbin.com, I've already set up this little sample bin. And the main thing to notice here is I'm using this base tag right here. And if you're not familiar with a base tag, uh, in HTML, a base tag or a base element, it just allows you to set a URL. And then any sort of subsequent URLs that you use, like for script tags or imports, they will all be relative to that base. So what we're saying here is we want the base URL to be polygit.org slash components. This components directory is where Polymer and all the Polymer elements and all that good stuff lives. And from here on out, if we have any relative URLs, it'll just pull stuff from, from that directory. So I'm pulling in web components JS. It's coming from that directory. I can import polymer.html. That'll also come from that directory. And so since we've got all this working off of our CDN, now we can actually sit here if we want. And we can just create our own Polymer element right on JSBin. So I'm going to do that right out of DOM module here. I'll give it an ID of like X foo. And I'll give it a template that just says like, hello from X foo. And I'll also give it a little script tag. And inside of here, we will call the Polymer constructor. And we're going to say it is an X foo element. And then the last thing we want to do is we want to just make sure that we use our X foo tag somewhere in the page. And now you can see it showing up over there in our output. So this is really great if you're you know, hanging out on the Polymer Slack channel, you, you run into a bug or some issue, and you're not quite sure how to explain it to folks. You can just go throw together a JS bin using PolyGit and then share that JS bin with people so they can help you get unstuck. Now, I also mentioned that all the Polymer elements that we built are included in this CDN as well. So what you can also do if you find maybe a, a bug or an issue with something like paper tabs is you can go over here and you can just write an HTML import for paper tabs. So instead of just Polymer. I'll also pull in paper tabs. 
And then you can just start using that element in your page here. So I'll say I want a set of paper tabs. And then inside of here, I will write out maybe like two or three paper tabs. So we'll say this first tab is called foo. Second one is going to be called bar. And the last one will be baz. Foo bar baz. And there we go. Now over here in our output, I've got these three paper tabs working just as I was expecting. And you know, if I had some issue, I could then take this. I could save this JS bin. I could go file a GitHub issue and, and point the engineer at this particular JS bin. And that way, it's going to help them triage that issue a lot faster and help them debug the actual uh, problem that you're running into and hopefully get things fixed. Now, one of the coolest things about PolyGit is that it is configurable. So not only uh, does it pull in Polymer and the elements that that team has created, but you can add your own GitHub repos to it as well. So if you go back to the polygit.org website, you scroll down here to the bottom, you can see that there is this sort of uh, interesting configuration syntax. And it might look a little weird when you first see it. It took me a few times kind of working through it to understand what it's doing. Uh, but basically, what you want to do is when you are defining that base URL, you can configure it by saying, oh, I would also like to include this component. And this component might live like inside of some particular org. And maybe you want a particular version, like version 1.2.3. Or maybe you want a branch, right? Maybe you want like the, the master branch. That's some good handwriting right there. Uh, or maybe you want just the, the latest tag. So if you include an asterisk, instead of pulling a particular version or a branch, it'll just give you whatever the latest tag happens to be. So to show you an example of that, I've uh, again got a little JS bin here. And I'm just going to paste in a better URL here. So what I've done is I've configured Polygit to pull in two additional dependencies. Uh, the first is the marked markdown JS library, which is in the chjj org on GitHub. And I've told it to grab the latest tag. Now, I've also told it to pull in the mark dash down element, which is something that I wrote myself. That lives in the Rob Dodson org on GitHub. And again, I've just told it to pull in the latest tag there. So now both of those are available in that CDN components directory. So I can just go ahead and write an HTML import to pull in the markdown element. And then over in my body, I can just start using it. So I can have a markdown tag. And we'll just drop in like a hello world for the header there. And we can see we're getting this sort of like huge H1 rendering over there in the output. So if you're working on an element or a project or something like that, and you want to show that to folks on JSBin, you can absolutely do that uh, using PolyGit as well. Uh, the one caveat there is that it has to have been published for at least one hour for it to be picked up by the raw Git uh, caching CDN. Um, but once it's been published for about an hour, it should be available to you on PolyGit. Now, the, the last thing I want to mention here is at the very beginning of the show, we said that this is a sort of development time CDN. And what I mean by that is it's not a CDN that you want to use for production. And the reason is because we're not doing any sort of like vulcanization or anything like that uh, to optimize the elements that we're sending down. Instead, you're getting an individual dependency for everything that you import, which is actually pretty expensive in terms of HTTP requests. So it's great for uh, development time. It's great for hacking on ideas. But when you get to the point where you want to launch something into production, you still want to use a package manager like Bower. You still want to use a process like Vulcanize to make sure uh, you're sending down the absolute smallest payload possible. But you know, if, you, if you just want to mess around with some ideas, it's perfect for that. So that about covers it for today. If you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Uh, or you can always hit me up on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hello, I'm Timothy Jordan, and you're watching the day two live stream of Google I.O. 2016. Stay tuned for more sessions on all four live stream channels today and tomorrow. We'll also be on the ground as usual, behind the scenes, finding the coolest and most innovative things to share with you right here on the live stream between sessions. And if you want us to track down somebody with your questions, use the hashtag AskDevShow. There's something really satisfying about getting your app to look great on your device. 
But just because there's over 11,000 other Android devices out there doesn't mean you need to build 11,000 other layouts to make a great looking app. Not if you're using responsive UI principles. You may have noticed that I'm not Ian or Joanna. My name is Mike Denny, a design advocate on the Google Design team. First things first, thinking about specific phones and tablets is only going to get you into trouble. There's a wide spectrum of devices and not that much difference between the largest phone and the smallest tablet. Instead, think more generally about how much space you have to work with. This can come in three different flavors, width, height, and smallest width. Width is super important and should be the basis for breakpoints in designing and building your UI. For example, 600 dp in width is the first point where you could consider having a side-by-side -side summary and detail level view. Any lower and you won't be giving each level a full attention it deserves. Height is less common when designing a responsive UI, but keep in mind that something like a vertically scrolling container is going to be difficult to use if you can only see one or two elements at a time due to a constrained height. Smallest width, unlike height or width, is designed to be rotation insensitive as it's just the smaller of the two values. This gives you a better idea of how much space is available and is an easy way to ensure that your app remains consistent as the device is rotated. You don't want to force your user to relearn your navigation structure every time they rotate their device. This is particularly important in the multi-window world. When your app is resized, your width, height, and smallest width are going to be updated. You might be going from full screen on a tablet down to what amounts to a portrait-oriented phone worth of space. Here's where a good responsive UI can make for a smooth transition. There are a number of common patterns you might consider when building that responsive UI, such as revealing previously hidden content as the screen size grows, transforming your navigation pattern or switching from a list to a grid, dividing your screen into multiple sections side by side, reflowing specific elements, expanding the size or margins of individual elements, or even changing the position of specific elements like a floating action button. Check out the blog post for more details on designing a responsive UI and specific patterns you can use to build better apps. Hey there, Polycasters, Rob here. So before coming into the studio, we tweeted out a question to see what folks wanted to see in the next episode of Polycast. And a lot of folks wrote in and said they wanted to know how to lazy load Polymer elements to improve the performance of their apps. So that's exactly what we're going to cover today. Now to do that, we're going to start off over here at the Polymer docs. And we're going to go down to the API reference. And some folks might not even realize that we, we have an API reference, but it's, it's kind of hidden down here in the sidebar for the documentation. You can go click on that. And that's going to take you to this sort of uh, kind of classic Polymer doc layout if, if you've seen this before on other elements. And this is where you can find all of the properties and methods of the Polymer object itself. So a lot of really cool stuff inside of here. This is also where, for instance, like the Polymer templatizer documentation is. So if you wanted to create your own uh, version of DOM if or DOM repeat, you could use templatizer to do that. Just a helpful tidbit there. But what we're interested in here is this Polymer base object. And Polymer base is sort of the base prototype for all Polymer elements. And it's where we hide interesting like methods and properties and stuff like that. The one I'm into is called import href down here. We can hit the embiggen button to make it larger. And so what import href is going to do, it's going to give us the ability to dynamically load an HTML import at runtime. It's got a few arguments that it takes. The first argument is we're going to give it an href, so basically just a path to some component or some uh, HTML import that you want to pull in at runtime. And then it wants callbacks for on success, on error. And lastly, it takes an option, which specifies whether or not you want the link tag to have an async attribute on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use import href, and I'm going to build sort of a sample application. This is the app that I have thrown together. It is called Polymeal. It's a social network for foodies and I guess people that like uh, stir fry, because um, there's a lot of pictures of stir fry. And uh, you can either go to the sort of the, the browse section, and you see here that I've got all sorts of yummy photos. Or you could go to the activity feed, and you could see maybe like I'd be posting status updates from all the cool, awesome restaurants that I am eating at, right? Now, the main thing to take away from this is that these two sections have very, very different content, right? This one is, is a whole bunch of cards with some paper buttons on it. Right? And this activity feed is instead just sort of these like little, little status blurb things. 
So there's no reason to load all of this, uh, all these card elements if the user is just starting off in the activity feed, right? It would just make more sense to load that at runtime to kind of like uh, reduce the bandwidth for our total application. So to do that, we're going to use import href over here in our code editor. So this is my X app element that I have started off with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an X app element inside of X app. I will chuck in a little iron pages here. And inside of uh, iron pages, we'll have sections for the different bits of our app that we are interested in. So I've got a browse section and an activity section. And we've also got the page.js router loaded into XApp as well. So if we go down to the JavaScript definition, we can see that I've got kind of a, a basic route stubbed out. And what I want to do is when the route changes to either the browse section or the activity section, I'm going to call Polymer's import href method, load in my element definition. Once that's loaded in, I will then tell Iron Pages to switch over to that section. Now, the first thing I want to do, though, since we're starting off just at like slash, uh, right now, what we're doing is we're actually just loading a shell that looks kind of like this, right? We don't have, uh, you know, we're not hitting either the browse or the activity section. So the user's kind of got, you know, nothing to look at. So we'll start off by redirecting them, page.redirect over to the browse section. So this way we just have kind of like a nice starting point. I'm going to write another handler for browse. So page slash browse. And you'll notice here that I'm using uh, ES6 fat arrow functions. That just makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to deal with the scoping of the this value inside of these handlers. So I'll say uh, page.browse. And what I first want to do is see if the element has already been loaded. Has this page been loaded before? Because if it has, there's no reason to import it again. So we'll call Polymer's isInstance method. And this is something that I don't even think it's, it's well documented. It might seriously not even exist anywhere in our docs. But I spoke with our tech writer. This is a thing. You can use it to sort of check to see if an element is an upgraded Polymer element. So because both our browse element and our activity element have IDs, we can reference them using automatic node finding. And we could say this.$sign.browse. So if this is already a Polymer element, let's just go ahead and return. No reason to do anything. No, no importing or anything like that is needed. Uh, but we will set the selected value to browse. And then what that's going to do is that's going to tell our iron pages up here to switch to that section. So you can see we're, we're binding its selected attribute to that property. Okay. Now, if the element has not been loaded, if it hasn't been upgraded yet, now we're going to import its definition. So we'll call uh, polymer.base.importhref. And we're going to pass it a path to the HTML import for the browse section that we want to load. So elements slash xbrowse slash xbrowse.html. And then we'll give it a success handler to run. So we're going to say, all right, cool, the element loaded in. Let's now set the selected state to browse. That'll tell Iron Pages to update. And now we can return, exit our, our route here. We should be good to go. If we go back and we look at our application now and we refresh the page, it should redirect to the browse section. And it should start loading in all of those cards. Awesome, right? Uh, now we need to do the same thing for the activity section. So I can just grab this entire route right here and uh, do, some, do some dangerous copy and paste work here. And we're just going to go through. And any place where it says browse, we'll just flip it out for activity. Activity. Thank you, spell check. So when we go to slash activity, we're going to check to see if the activity element is upgraded. If it is, return. If it's not, import it. Let's go give that a look. So refresh the page. And we see our browse section looking good. We go to the activity section. And boom, we got our status feed showing up right there. Now, there's still a lot of unanswered questions to this. I kind of showed you the, the quick and dirty version of using import href. But what we didn't talk about was, you know, do we need to vulcanize these things into different bundles? And if so, how do we exclude common dependencies? Or can we just use HTTP2 to maybe like server push all the things or multiplex stream all of our dependencies? So there's still a lot of things that uh, remain to be worked out. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those in an upcoming episode of Polymer. But today, for what we've done here, if you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Otherwise, you can always ping me on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Otherwise, you can ping me on a social network at Take two. I'll keep all the, the fun stuff up here, top two thirds of the screen.
We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. Let's be honest, you're an awesome engineer with an awesome app and you are using threading to the max. Sadly though, managing all those individual threads and assigning work between them is causing you to lose your hair. My name is Colt McCandless and please don't join the bald club. Instead, use the thread pools class, which is an ideal primitive for breaking up lots of work into little buckets. See, historically, it was commonplace that applications would use a dedicated thread model. Uh, that is, one thread that only deals with database rights, while a separate thread only handles streaming of music, and a third one only handles networking. Uh, these setups are okay because the amount of work per thread isn't that large, and it's okay to handle this work in sequential order. But there reaches a point where this model starts to fall over. Uh, say, for example, that you've got 40 bitmaps to decode and each decode takes like four milliseconds or something. Uh, putting all of this work on a single dedicated thread is a bad idea, since it'll take 80 milliseconds total to get all that work done in a sequential fashion. On the other hand, if you created 10 threads and let each one decode four bitmaps, then you'd end up only taking 16 milliseconds total. But then of course you run into the problem of how to properly pass the work around between those threads, schedule that work, and then managing of those threads. Uh, yeah. Before you start stressing out about writing all that code, don't worry. This is exactly what thread pool executor primitive is for. Uh, basically, this class will just let you spin up a number of threads and toss blocks of work to execute on it. Thread pool executor handles all of the heavy lifting of spinning up the threads, load balancing work across those threads, and even killing those threads when they have been idle for a while. Uh, basically, it handles all the heavy lifting of super parallel processing on your behalf. All you have to do is split up the work. But there's a small caveat here. How many threads should your thread pool have? I mean, technically speaking, you have the ability to create as many threads as you want, but that's not ideal. See, CPUs can only execute a certain number of threads in parallel. Once you get above that number, then the CPU has to start deciding which threads get the next free block of processor time based on how important they are. Which means that if you keep eventually adding threads, you'll hit a break-even point where your computation isn't getting any faster, even though the number of threads that you have has increased significantly. And it's also important to note that each of these threads aren't free. Uh, each thread costs you about 64k of memory in minimum, and that adds up quickly, especially in situations where the call stacks can start growing pretty large. As such, your app needs to find a sweet spot between the number of cores and the point of diminishing return with the number of threads. Thankfully, once again, the thread pool executor class has got you covered. When creating your thread pool, you can specify the number of initial threads and the number of maximum threads. As the workload in the thread pool changes, it'll scale the number of alive threads to match. Oh, and a quick note, the value returned from get available processors may not reflect the number of physical cores in the device. Now, see, some devices have CPUs that will deactivate one or more cores depending on the system load to save battery. So if your device has two CPUs, but one of them is asleep, this value could return one. And of course, thread pools won't solve all of your threading problems. As mentioned earlier, unless you're dealing with lots and lots of work packets all the time, 
this thing's kind of overkill. It's best to use things like handler threads or async task loaders for specific types of work blocks and only throw the massive computing problems at the thread pool. And for you power users out there, remember that render script might be a better alternative to large scale parallel work on Android devices, but that's a whole separate set of videos that we haven't gotten into yet. And don't forget that SysTrace is an amazingly powerful tool that lets you visualize how work is flowing through the threads in your application. It's a great way to validate that things are working as intended and also see all the other crazy threads that are being worked on by other parts of your app. And that's the trick with performance, isn't it? I mean, you can make assumptions, but things don't always work the way you think, which is why you need to check out the rest of the Android Performance Patterns videos. And don't forget to join our Google Plus community to ask a lot of hard threading questions as well. So keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right. And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. That could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah, and it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important, because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance with service worker to then use the AppShell model. And if you are using the AppShell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good. We've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paints on repeat visits. Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server side rendering has on this. Uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the App Shell model in mind, with server-side rendering in mind, you will get like, a really good first paint, even in like, Safari and um, like, mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have Service Worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, OK, well, should I be using the application shell model on all of my applications, um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This, this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know, a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox, and it's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know, we, we way too much to explain in just one video, but we wrote up uh, a Pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up, and I just read it. So you you just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how I wrote it. Pretty roll. much. <laughs> Impact. 
um, that's worth checking out. That's the format of this It's show, a mediocre maybe. article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out. Yep. Learn more about App Shell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yep. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like really quickly um, that yeah. we're working on. So check that out. Yeah, build a weather app. Hey, gang. Did you know you can send notifications to iOS devices using Google Cloud Messaging? Well, you can. Why would you ever want to do that? Maybe that's a better question. Let's find out the answer on this episode of Route 85. So notifications, they're a great way for you to engage with your users. They let your customers know you have important new information for them. And when used responsibly, they can be a great way to keep users coming back to your app. But they're not super fun to implement. There's a lot of steps required to set up notifications in the first place. You need logic on both the client and the server. And if you're developing a cross-platform mobile app, and most of you are these days, you have to do this for Android and for iOS. And uh, I'm not just talking about two sets of client logic either. It turns out sending notifications to iOS and Android devices requires different logic on the server too. See, if you've done any notifications work in the past, you're probably used to talking to APNS, that's the Apple Push Notification Service, to deliver notifications to iOS devices, and to GCM, that's Google Cloud Messaging, to deliver notifications to Android devices. And while sending notifications through these two services is similar, they each have slightly different features, use different protocols, accept different message payloads, and return different responses, all of which means that you got to keep track of what kind of device each of your users has and use two completely different code paths to send a notification. Or do you? Well, well, no. No, you don't. You see, one pretty great feature about Google Cloud Messaging that a lot of people don't know about is that GCM can relay to APNS any notifications you want to send to an iOS device. Now, granted, you'll need to do some setup work, like upload your APNS certificate to GCM, and make sure your client sends its device token to the GCM service. But once you've done that, you can use GCM to send all of your notifications, no matter what platform your target device is, and GCM will deliver your notifications to the correct device using the appropriate service. What all this means is that you don't need to care about what device your user has anymore. You just, has, you just have to write and maintain one code path, and as we all know, less code means less room for mistakes. But it's not just about using less code. By using GCM to handle your messaging for you, you can take advantage of some of the other nice features that GCM offers to developers, like topics. Topics allow your app to subscribe to notifications about any particular topic that you or your users want to. For example, let's say you've got a weather app and I, as a loyal weather fan, want to be notified whenever there's extreme weather happening in my zip code. Well, in the old way of doing this, you'd probably need to set up a database where you keep track of each one of your users and their devices and their zip codes and do this whole select users where blah 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 query, then loop through the results and send notifications to each device that you get back from this database query. But with topics, none of that's necessary. Instead, your app simply tells GCM that you're interested in subscribing to, say, the weather 94043 topic. Then, next time there's rain in California, for us that, that counts as extreme weather. Oh my gosh, there's something coming down from the sky. I don't know if it's water, if it's acid. I can't go out. I don't know how to drive anymore. Yeah, that seems about right. So yeah, with topics, your server simply tells GCM to send notifications to all devices subscribed to the weather 94043 topic. And I will get notified along with all other devices subscribed to that topic. So there's no database required. Go ahead and throw it out. Oh, uh, as long as you weren't using it for anything else, I guess. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. GCM has other useful features too, like upstream messaging, which allows your app to communicate to your server through GCM. This can be helpful in cases where you might want some lightweight communication from your clients to your server, but don't feel like dealing with the hassle of setting up and maintaining a full-blown server open to the entire world. Or read receipts, where in some, but not all, situations, you can be notified that a user has received your message, something you can't normally do through APNS alone. Oh, and in case you're wondering, all this is free, as in, please send us $0, uh, and it's using much of the same infrastructure that Google uses for its own apps, so it'll probably scale for yours. So there's a lot to learn when it comes to notifications, and I encourage you to get started here with our Google Cloud Messaging documentation for iOS. We also have a couple of sample applications for you to look at. There's Friendly Ping, our cross-platform chat app powered entirely through Google Cloud Messaging, as well as the GCM Playground, which lets you easily experiment with sending calls through the GCM service. And keep watching Route 85. Maybe you'll see another Google Cloud Messaging video pop up in the future. 
If only we had, we had some way of letting you know when that happened. Well, I'm stumped. So what if I told you there was a way you could compress nearly any stream of data by a factor of 10x or more? Wouldn't that be something you'd be interested in? Yeah, I thought so. Let's find out more on this episode of Route 85. So I want you to take a look at this array of numbers here. Imagine that we wanted to send this array of integers from a server to your user's device. Looks like just a bunch of random numbers, right? Well, that word random is actually the key to compressing these in an incredibly efficient manner. As you probably know, a random number generator isn't truly random. Supply a random number generator with the same seed and you'll get the same results out every time. And we can take advantage of that fact to recreate that list of integers using a random number generator. You see, all I need to do to regenerate that array on a device is to supply three parameters. The seed for an agreed upon random number generator, an upper bound to apply to these results, and the length of the list. I simply supply those numbers to a method that looks a little like this, and I can recreate that original number stream. Just like that, I've built my array of 30 integers using just two integers and an int 32. That's a 92% compression rate. Now granted, finding that initial seed did take some work, but you know what? That work can happen in the cloud, so it doesn't really matter. What's important is that on the device, I'm able to decompress that number stream in order and time. And then of course, once you start looking around, you can see that there's a ton of data you can compress this way. I mean, need to compress a text string? Well, what's a string but a stream of encoded integers? Once I have my stream of integers, I simply figure out what seed I need to generate them, and voila! I've compressed my string down into just three numbers. It's a pretty amazing savings, right? Anybody with the username of stidjexmisdizixgudquibpubpa will be singing your praises in their reviews. And uh, my gosh, if you think about it, an image is really just a stream of numbers broken out into uh, several channels. Take a look at this image here, and you can see how, using our random number generator, I've been able to replace it with just three sets of integers for the red, green, and blue channels, respectively. Now, once again, finding the right seed can take some time, and I haven't found the perfect seed just yet. So if you look at the results carefully, you can see that this is not quite a lossless compression scheme. But I think you'll agree that for this kind of savings, these trade-offs just might be worth it. Anyway, I hope you consider using this technique the next time you have data that needs to be compressed. Remember, the more efficient you are with your user's data, the more they'll love you. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to check out other episodes of Route 85, and uh, remember that as my coworkers on the Android team like to say, perf matters. All right, thanks guys. I think we're done. Well, who let him into the studio again? I just, I couldn't say no to Elijah Wood. But that's... Elijah Wood. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine. 
and we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Welcome to the Googleplex. This is an incredible place with lots of great stuff being worked on every single day. Before I worked here, I always wondered what it would be like to come to the Googleplex, meet up with a Googler, and have coffee with them, and just chat about what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. And today we're going to do exactly that. Welcome to Coffee with a Googler. I'm Lawrence Moroni, and I'm here in New York City to meet with Roman Nurek. And Roman Nurek is one of our material design gurus here at Google. So material design, tell me, what, what's it all about? Oh, Lawrence, what is material design? Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's actually a, a video uh, okay. with a bunch of the original designers that created material design, and they get asked the same question, and they don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a complex kind of thing. There's a lot of things going on. Um, I guess at the most basic level, it's, it's a design language, okay. it's a design system. Um, it's, it covers visual interaction and motion design. I feel like most design systems, design languages, are treated as just visual languages, like right. here are the colors you should use and so on. But you know, material is, is much more than that. It, it really kind of covers the, the model, the underlying physical model of a UI. Okay. So it basically tries to establish this, this physical environment within which your apps should live, on a phone, on a tablet, on a computer, um, basically any sort of screen. Um, and then it, it basically establishes this physical environment in a set of basic rules and principles. Um, and I like to think of it along these kind of four basic axes or four basic principles. And that's uh, tangible surfaces, or okay. kind of the material metaphor. Okay. We could talk about what material is at some point. Um, also, bold graphic design, this idea that you know, we, should, we should take some of the best design ideas from the print world and see how that can help us you know, make really great apps on, you know, on digital devices. Right. Right. Um, and the third is meaningful motion, basically how all these things, how um, the surfaces and the, the ink on that surface, the, the, the graphic design stuff, how that all kind of you know, moves in a consistent way mm -hmm. to help communicate what's going on. And the fourth thing, which is to me one of the most important things, is, um, is adaptive design, which is how can we take all these, these first three things and make sure that they work consistently and coherently across different devices, phones, okay. tablets, and everything else. Now, you have a video, right, of some really good examples yeah. of material design we being used. So shall we, shall we roll that? Let's roll it. Some pretty excellent examples yeah. there, but it's like, you know, how does somebody reach that level? And for someone like me, I'm a developer, and my design skills are non-existent. So if I if I want to become somebody who can build apps with those kind of design, how how do I get started? And well, how do it, I learn this stuff? That's a it's a great question. Um, I think first of all, I just want to, I guess, recognize some of those apps are they're doing amazing jobs, and they have they have yeah. large teams. They, some of them right. actually have very small teams. Uh, some of those apps are. You know, created by one person. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely reach that level of quality from these amazing showcase apps 
regardless of your team size. Okay. Um, but I'd say for the developers and designers out there that are just getting started, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great Udacity course that okay. uh, me, uh, Nick Butcher, um, also from, uh, from the Google team here, um, and James Williams from Udacity put together. Um, and that's available at udacity.com slash Google. Right. Um, and there's also a bunch of amazing resources on design.google.com, uh, which will kind of tell you about how to come to Android if you're doing iOS stuff, okay. for example, or how to kind of get started understanding what material design is. There's obviously the, the entire material design guidelines are there. Okay. So um, I'd say that the, the first thing, the, the Udacity uh, course, is probably the, the best kind of first step in getting started. Um, but there's, there's a whole lot of resources okay. out there, and we link to others from the Udacity course. Okay. And Udacity courses, if you're not familiar with them, they are very Socratic in how they teach, right? It's, it's short videos and then challenging you to do something, and then a short video and then getting you to do something. And it's a good way that someone can incrementally learn rather than be thrown into a like, huge design doc or something yes. like that, right? So. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, there's a very clear progression. We specifically design that course so that you can kind of start with some of the basics, the most elementary basic things about a screen, like what is a pixel, mm -hmm. what is a density independent pixel, and then you kind of ramp all the way up to how do I make everything work on phones, tablets, and so on. Right, and I have to assume that a design course is well designed, right? Uh, we have some <laughs> we have some very nice color choices in our in our slides or our tablet drawings. So, cool. hopefully. <laughs> so 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 back to material design again. It's like why why material? What is it that? So material goes back to that first principle. Right. Um, so the, this idea of uh, tangible surfaces, this idea that you know everything on a you know. On, on your screen and your device exists on a, on a surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think of them as pieces of paper. Um, so basically you can think of um, a, basically a sheet of material or um, the word material representing one of those pieces of paper. And the reason we don't just call it paper is because it actually is, it's a lot more than just paper. In the real world, paper, you know, once you rip it up, you can't really just you know, put it back together and paper can't go from being you know, a circle to a square or to a mm -hmm. rectangle. Um, and so we like to think of our digital pieces of material or sheets of material um, as kind of a, a smarter paper, a more kind of, you know, a still a constrained paper. You can't just do anything. You can't, it can't just, you know, do all sorts of crazy things. But it is a physical thing that exists inside of this kind of, you know, environment, this, this right. kind of like faux environment. But it, it is something that, that has a lot of thought put into it. And so the word material, you know, to me really means the, the sheets of paper that everything in this world exists on. But for me, the, the main thing, you know, to think about, the, the reason that motion is so important in material design is that, you know, motion should always have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to, you know, like, you know, just do a, like a flip of a button or like a double rotation or something just to kind of draw attention. Every, every time something moves, it attracts our attention. And so it needs to be really thoughtful and, and really kind of carefully planned out. And so in material, we use motion, or we kind of use just enough motion to convey the change in some object's state, or you know, try to get a little bit of attention, but you know, just enough motion, not too little, not too much. I understand Android Studio has some templates to allow developers to at least get started with uh, building material design into apps. Absolutely. Perhaps. So one of the one, one of my philosophies for a long time has been, you know, we can write about you know, uh, material design. We can write about a thing. Um, mm -hmm. We can make suggestions about that thing, and we can try to teach people about that thing. But one of the best ways to get you know the thing into people's hands, uh, you know, in this case, material design, is to actually just you know build it into the tools. Just mm -hmm. make sure that you know, as a developer that's just getting started, even just on Android, um, if I just go to File, New Project, or New App, right? I should be able to get the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. And so in, you know, in Android Studio now, we're actually seeing um, new templates uh, for material design. So you could do file new project, and then your default activity templates are going to come with material design in them. Okay. So it's going to use the material theme. Um, it's going to use some of the, some of the latest uh, support libraries for material design. So things like the Android Design Support Library, things like AppCompat. Cool. And so you're, you're just going to get a lot of great stuff for free right off the nice. bat. Nice. So for someone like me, I'm, I'm a coder, not a designer. <laughs> and so, but, so I can use Android Studio, get the, the, effectively the scaffolding done for me in exactly. these templates, and then learn from something like the Udacity course. Exactly. I, I definitely suggest, you know, even before you do the Udacity course, 
file new project, right? Just look yeah. around the code, um, see what you get. Um, I think that that's a great way to get started. I always valued as as a kid and you know growing up learning programming and stuff. I always valued experimentation. Mm -hmm. So definitely experiment with that. Um, but as soon as you kind of you know uh, you know hit some sort of you know if you if you hit an obstacle or something, obviously take a look at the guide and the reference and all that. But the Udacity course is a great way to say you know what let me just kind of see what Google thinks is the right way to kind of approach okay. understanding this this uh, okay. system. Awesome. Well, thanks, Roman. This this has been a whole lot of fun, and I've learned more about material design <laughs> in the last five minutes than I'd had in in a year beforehand. So this is fun. I, and so I can much. I can always talk about this. Stuff. So <laughs> they've um, told me that about you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> it's cool. It's been I'm, awesome. Lawrence. And thanks. I'm going to check out that Udacity course, and I recommend that you do so too. And if you're an Android developer, take a look at those templates. If you have any questions for me about this, or if you have any questions for Roman about material design, or other aspects of building for material design, just please drop us a line in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. Uh, for more great episodes of Coffee with a Googler and for more great videos on developer topics, please tune to the Google Developers channel on YouTube. Thank you. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called Iris. Iris is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables one for training, and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. 
Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Quiz, hotshot. You've got 48 milliseconds of work to do, but only 16 milliseconds per frame to get it done. What do you do? My name is Cole McCandless, and while threading on Android can help cure your performance woes, it can also end up creating some huge problems, if you don't understand how it's all working under the hood. So let's take a few minutes and make sure we're all on the same page. <laughs> See, a thread by default does three things. It starts, it does some works, and as soon as that work is done, it terminates. Now, by itself, that's not too useful. Instead, what you want is a thread that sticks around for a while so you can feed it packets of work to operate on. But to do that, you need a little more scaffolding. First, since threads die when they run out of work, you need to have some sort of loop running on the thread to keep it alive. Just make sure to put it in an exit condition so you can terminate that loop later. In addition, you'll need some sort of queue that the loop can pull blocks of work from to execute on. And of course, you'll need some other thread that creates work packets and pushes them into the queue for execution. Now, if you've ever tried to write this setup yourself, you know it gets a little gnarly to get all of that machinery working correctly. Thankfully, though, Android has a set of classes to do all that for you. For example, the looper class will keep the thread alive and pop work off a queue to execute on. And rather than always inserting work at the end of that queue, the handler class gives you the control to push work at the head, the tail, or set a time-based delay that'll keep some work from being processed until that time has passed. And don't forget that units of work in Android are explicitly defined as intents or runnables or messages, depending on who's issuing them and who's consuming them.
combination of all these things together is called My name is Colt McCandless, and while threading on Android can help cure your performance woes, it can also end up creating some huge problems, if you don't understand how it's all working under the hood. So let's take a few minutes and make sure we're all on the same page. <laughs> See, a thread by default does three things. It starts, it does some works, and as soon as that work is done, it terminates. Now, by itself, that's not too useful. Instead, what you want is a thread that sticks around for a while so you can feed it packets of work to operate on. But to do that, you need a little more scaffolding. First, since threads die when they run out of work, you need to have some sort of loop running on the thread to keep it alive. Just make sure to put it in an exit condition so you can terminate that loop later. In addition, you'll need some sort of queue that the loop can pull blocks of work from to execute on. And of course, you'll need some other thread that creates work packets and pushes them into the queue for execution. Now, if you've ever tried to write this setup yourself, you know it gets a little gnarly to get all of that machinery working correctly. Thankfully though, Android has a set of classes to do all that for you. For example, the looper class will keep the thread alive and pop work off a queue to execute on. And rather than always inserting work at the end of that queue, the handler class gives you the control to push work at the head, the tail, or set a time-based delay that'll keep some work from being processed until that time has passed. And don't forget that units of work in Android are explicitly defined as intents or runnables or messages, depending on who's issuing them and who who's consuming them. And then the combination of all these things together is called a handler thread, which lets this look like this. Yeah! Pretty nifty, huh? So let's look at how you can use this in your application. When the user launches your app, Android creates its own Linux process. Alongside with this, the system creates a thread of execution for your application called the main thread, which at its core is just a handler thread. This main thread handles processing of events from all over your app. Uh, for example, callbacks associated with lifecycle information, or callbacks from input events, or even events that are coming from other applications. And most important is that these callbacks can trigger other work that runs on the thread too, like making a change to the UI will create work packets that allow the UI to be redrawn. Basically, this means that any block of code your app wants to run has to be pushed into a work queue and then serviced on the main thread. The takeaway here is that with so much work happening on the main thread, it makes a lot of sense to offload longer work to other threads as to not disturb the UI system from its rendering duties. And this is how the entirety of Android's threading model works. Now, lots of packages of work being passed around between threads and worked on as needed. So, 
With all this in mind, some of Android's threading classes make a little bit more sense. Uh, see, each threaded class is intended for a specific type of threading work, so picking the right one for your needs is really important. Uh, for example, the async task class is ideal for helping you get work on and off the UI thread in the right way. Handler threads are great when you need a dedicated thread for callbacks to land on, and thread pools work best when you can break your work up into really small packets and then toss them to a bunch of waiting threads. And intense services are really ideal for background tasks or when you need to get intent work off the UI thread. And like everything else, there's not a silver bullet here, but knowing which primitive is best for what situation can save you a lot of headaches. Now, if you ever want more insight into how your app is leveraging threading, make sure you spend some time getting comfortable with SysTrace. It's a fancy tool that'll school you on how all that mumbo jumbo is working underneath the hood. And if you're looking to get schooled more, make sure you check out the rest of Android Performance Patterns videos. And don't forget to join our Google Plus community for more tips and tricks on threading. So keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. Hey there, Polycasters. Rob here. Welcome back to the show. Uh, as we've been working on Polymer, one of the probably biggest requests that comes in from developers is, when are we going to get a CDN for Polymer and for web components? Because it's kind of a pain in the butt every time you want to sort of like hack on an idea and you've got to use Bower and install a bunch of packages and wait for everything to download just so you can you know play with stuff. So recently, the Polymer team has put out a brand new project, which is called PolyGit. It is a development CDN, which I'll, I'll talk about what that word means uh, in just a second. Uh, but basically, it is a CDN that includes Polymer, all the Polymer elements, and the Web Components polyfill. So if you want to hack around using something like JSBin and Polymer, you can totally do that. So if you go to the website polygit.org, you see that it bills itself as the Polymer magic server. And what it's actually doing under the hood is it's just using GitHub's raw Git CDN and extracting things from there and pulling them into you know, JS bin or, or wherever you want to use the CDN. So what I want to do here is just sort of like show you some examples of how you can use the CDN, how you can configure it to actually pull in your own packages as well, and, uh, and basically just get hacking really quick. So uh, over on jsbin.com, I've already set up this little sample bin. And the main thing to notice here is I'm using this base tag right here. And if you're not familiar with a base tag, uh, in HTML, a base tag or a base element, it just allows you to set a URL and then any sort of subsequent URLs that you use, like for script tags or imports, they will all be relative to that base. So what we're saying here is we want the base URL to be polygit.org slash components. This components directory is where Polymer and all the Polymer elements and all that good stuff lives. And from here on out, if we have any relative URLs, it'll just pull stuff from, from that directory. So I'm pulling in web components.js. It's coming from that directory. I can import polymer.html. That'll also come from that directory. And so since we've got all this working off of our CDN, now we can actually sit here if we want. And we can just create our own Polymer element right on JSBin. So I'm going to do that right out of DOM module here. I'll give it an ID of like x foo, And I'll give it a template that just says, like, hello from xfoo. And I'll also give it a little script tag. And inside of here, we will call the Polymer constructor. And we're going to say it is an xfoo element. And then the last thing we want to do is we want to just make sure that we use our xfoo tag somewhere in the page. And now you can see it showing up over there in our output. So this is really great if you're you know, hanging out on the Polymer Slack channel, you, you run into a bug or some issue, and you're not quite sure how to explain it to folks. You can just go throw together a JS bin using PolyGit and then share that JS bin with people so they can help you get unstuck. Now, I also mentioned that all the Polymer elements that we built are included in this CDN as well. So what you can also do if you find maybe a, a bug or an issue with something like paper tabs is you can go over here and you can just write an HTML import for paper tabs. So instead of just Polymer, I'll also pull in paper tabs. And then you can just start using that element in your page here. So I'll say I want a set of paper tabs. And then inside of here, I will write out maybe like two or three paper tabs. So we'll say this first tab is called foo. Second one is going to be called bar. And the last one will be baz. Foo bar baz. And there we go. Now over here in our output, I've got these three paper tabs. 
working just as I was expecting. And you know, if I had some issue, I could then take this, I could save this JS bin, I could go file a GitHub issue and, and point the engineer at this particular JS bin. And that way it's going to help them triage that issue a lot faster and help them debug the actual uh, problem that you're running into and hopefully get things fixed. Now, one of the coolest things about PolyGit is that it is configurable. So not only uh, does it pull in Polymer and the elements that that team has created, but you can add your own GitHub repos to it as well. So if you go back to the polygit.org website, you scroll down here to the bottom, you can see that there is this sort of uh, interesting configuration syntax. And it might look a little weird when you first see it. It took me a few times kind of working through it to understand what it's doing. Uh, but basically, what you want to do is when you are defining that base URL, you can configure it by saying, oh, I would also like to include this component. And this component might live like inside of some particular org. And maybe you want a particular version, like version 1.2.3. Or maybe you want a branch, right? Maybe you want like the, the master branch. That's some good handwriting right there. Uh, or maybe you want just the, the latest tag. So if you include an asterisk, instead of pulling a particular version or a branch, it'll just give you whatever the latest tag happens to be. So to show you an example of that, I've uh, again got a little JS bin here. And I'm just going to paste in a better URL here. So what I've done is I've configured PolyGit to pull in two additional dependencies. Uh, the first is the marked markdown JS library, which is in the chjj org on GitHub. And I've told it to grab the latest tag. Now I've also told it to pull in the mark dash down element, which is something that I wrote myself. That lives in the Rob Dodson org on GitHub. And again, I've just told it to pull in the latest tag there. So now both of those are available in that CDN components directory. So I can just go ahead and write an HTML import to pull in the markdown element. And then over in my body, I can just start using it. So I can have a markdown tag. And we'll just drop in like a hello world for the header there. And we can see we're getting this sort of like huge H1 rendering over there in the output. So if you're working on an element or a project or something like that, and you want to show that to folks on JSBin, you can absolutely do that uh, using PolyGit as well. Uh, the one caveat there is that it has to have been published for at least one hour for it to be picked up by the raw Git uh, caching CDN. Um, but once it's been published for about an hour, it should be available to you on PolyGit. Now, the, the last thing I want to mention here is at the very beginning of the show, we said that this is a sort of development time CDN. And what I mean by that is it's not a CDN that you want to use for production. And the reason is because we're not doing any sort of like vulcanization or anything like that uh, to optimize the elements that we're sending down. Instead, you're getting an individual dependency for everything that you import, which is actually pretty expensive in terms of HTTP requests. So it's great for uh, development time. It's great for hacking on ideas. But when you get to the point where you want to launch something into production, you still want to use a package manager like Bower. You still want to use a process like Vulcanize to make sure uh, you're sending down the absolute smallest payload possible. But you know, if, you, if you just want to mess around with some ideas, it's perfect for that. So that about covers it for today. If you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Uh, or you can always hit me up on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hey there, Polycasters. Rob here. So before coming into the studio, we tweeted out a question to see what folks wanted to see in the next episode of Polycast. And a lot of folks wrote in and said they wanted to know how to lazy load Polymer elements to improve the performance of their apps. So that's exactly what we're going to cover today. Now to do that, we're going to start off over here at the Polymer docs. And we're going to go down to the API reference. And some folks might not even realize that we, we have an API reference, but it's, it's kind of hidden down here in the sidebar for the documentation. You can go click on that. And that's going to take you to this sort of uh, kind of classic Polymer doc layout, if, if you've seen this before on other elements. And this is where you can find all of the properties and methods of the Polymer object itself. So a lot of really cool stuff inside of here. This is also where, for instance, like the Polymer templatizer documentation is. So if you wanted to create your own uh, version of DOM if or DOM repeat, you could use templatizer to do that. Just a helpful tidbit there. 
But what we're interested in here is this polymer base object. And polymer base is sort of the base prototype for all polymer elements. And it's where we hide interesting like methods and properties and stuff like that. The one I'm into is called import href down here. We can hit the embiggen button to make it larger. And so what import href is going to do, it's going to give us the ability to dynamically load an HTML import at runtime. It's got a few arguments that it takes. The first argument is we're going to give it an href, so basically just a path to some component or some uh, HTML import that you want to pull in at runtime. And then it wants callbacks for on success, on error. And lastly, it takes an option, which specifies whether or not you want the link tag to have an async attribute on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use import href, and I'm going to build sort of a sample application. This is the app that I have thrown together. It is called Polymeal. It's a social network for foodies. And I guess people that like uh, stir fry, because um, there's a lot of pictures of stir fry. And uh, you can either go to the sort of the, the browse section, and you see here that I've got all sorts of yummy photos, or you could go to the activity feed, and you could see maybe like I'd be posting status updates from all the cool, awesome restaurants that I am eating at, right? Now, the main thing to take away from this is that these two sections have very, very different content, right? This one is, is a whole bunch of cards with some paper buttons on it. Right? And this activity feed is instead just sort of these like little, little status blurb things. So there's no reason to load all of this, uh, all these card elements if the user is just starting off in the activity feed. Right? It would just make more sense to load that at runtime to kind of like uh, reduce the bandwidth for our total application. So to do that, we're going to use import href over here in our code editor. So this is my X app element that I have started off with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an X app element. Inside of XAP, I will chuck in a little iron pages here. And inside of uh, iron pages, we'll have sections for the different bits of our app that we are interested in. So I've got a browse section and an activity section. And we've also got the page.js router loaded into XAP as well. So if we go down to the JavaScript definition, we can see that I've got kind of a, a basic route stubbed out. And what I want to do is when the route changes to either the browse section or the activity section, I'm going to call Polymer's import href method, load in my element definition. Once that's loaded in, I will then tell Iron Pages to switch over to that section. Now, the first thing I want to do, though, since we're starting off just at like slash, uh, right now what we're doing is we're actually just loading a shell that looks kind of like this, right? We don't have, uh, you know, we're not hitting either the browse or the activity section, so the users kind of got, you know, nothing to look at. So we'll start off by redirecting them, page redirect over to the Browse section. So this way, we just have kind of like a nice starting point. I'm going to write another handler for Browse, so page slash Browse. And you'll notice here that I'm using uh, ES6 fat arrow functions. That just makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to deal with the scoping of the this value inside of these handlers. So I'll say uh, page.browse. And what I first want to do is see if the element has already been loaded. Has this page been loaded before? Because if it has, there's no reason to import it again. So we'll call Polymer's isInstance method. And this is something that I don't even think it's, it's well documented. It might seriously not even exist anywhere in our docs. But I spoke with our tech writer. This is a thing. You can use it to sort of check to see if an element is an upgraded Polymer element. So because both our browse element and our activity element have IDs, we can reference them using automatic node finding. And we could say this.$sign.browse. So if this is already a Polymer element, let's just go ahead and return. No reason to do anything. No, no importing or anything like that is needed. Uh, but we will set the selected value to browse. And then what that's going to do is that's going to tell our iron pages up here to switch to that section. So you can see we're, we're binding its selected attribute to that property. Okay. Now, if the element has not been loaded, if it hasn't been upgraded yet, now we're going to import its definition. So we'll call uh, polymer.base.importhref. And we're going to pass it a path to the HTML import for the browse section that we want to load. So elements slash xbrowse slash xbrowse.html. And then we'll give it a success handler to run. So we're going to say, all right, cool, the element loaded in. Let's now set the selected state to browse. That'll tell Iron Pages to update. And now we can return, exit our, our route here. We should be good to go. If we go back and we look at our application now and we refresh the page, it should redirect to the Browse section, and it should start loading in all of those cards. Awesome, right? 
Uh, now we need to do the same thing for the activity section. So I can just grab this entire route right here and uh, do, some, do some dangerous copy and paste work here. And we're just going to go through, and any place where it says browse, we'll just flip it out for activity. Activity. Thank you, spell check. So when we go to slash activity, we're going to check to see if the activity element is upgraded. If it is, return. If it's not, import it. Let's go give that a look. So refresh the page. And we see our browse section looking good. We go to the activity section, and boom, we got our status feed showing up right there. Now, there's still a lot of unanswered questions to this. I kind of showed you the, the quick and dirty version of using import href. But what we didn't talk about was, you know, do we need to vulcanize these things into different bundles? And if so, how do we exclude common dependencies? Or can we just use HTTP2 to maybe like server push all the things or multiplex stream all of our dependencies? So there's still a lot of things that uh, remain to be worked out. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those in an upcoming episode of Polymer. But today, for what we've done here, if you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Otherwise, you can always ping me on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Otherwise, you can ping me on a social network at I'll we'll keep all the, the fun stuff up here, top two thirds of the screen. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So, what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, Check out the documentation available right here. Let's be honest, you're an awesome engineer with an awesome app and you are using threading to the max. Sadly though, managing all those individual threads and assigning work between them is causing you to lose your hair. My name is Colt McCandless and please, don't join the bald club. Instead, use the thread pools class, which is an ideal primitive for breaking up lots of work into little buckets. See, historically, it was commonplace that applications would use a dedicated thread model. Uh, that is, one thread that only deals with database rights, while a separate thread only handles streaming of music, and a third one only handles networking. Uh, these setups are okay because the amount of work per thread isn't that large, and it's okay to handle this work in sequential order. But there reaches a point where this model starts to fall over. Uh, say, for example, that you've got 40 bitmaps to decode, and each decode takes like four milliseconds or something. Uh, putting all of this work on a single dedicated thread is a bad idea, since it'll take 80 milliseconds total to get all that work done in a sequential fashion. On the other hand, if you created 10 threads and let each one decode four bitmaps, then you'd end up only taking 16 milliseconds total. But then, of course, you run into the problem of how to properly pass the work around between those threads, schedule that work, and then managing of those threads. Uh, yeah. Before you start stressing out about writing all that code, don't worry. This is exactly what thread pool executor primitive is for. Uh, basically, this class will just let you spin up a number of threads and toss blocks of work to execute on it. Thread pool executor handles all of the heavy lifting of spinning up the threads, load balancing work across those threads, and even killing those threads when they have been idle for a while. Uh, basically, it handles all the heavy lifting of super parallel processing on your behalf. All you have to do is split up the work. But there's a small caveat here. How many threads should your thread pool have? I mean, technically speaking, you have the ability to create as many threads as you want, but 
that's not ideal. See, CPUs can only execute a certain number of threads in parallel. Once you get above that number, then the CPU has to start deciding which threads get the next free block of processor time based on how important they are. Which means that if you keep eventually adding threads, you'll hit a break-even point where your computation isn't getting any faster, even though the number of threads that you have has increased significantly. And it's also important to note that each of these threads aren't free. Uh, each thread costs you about 64k of memory in minimum, and that adds up quickly, especially in situations where the call stacks can start growing pretty large. As such, your app needs to find a sweet spot between the number of cores and the point of diminishing return with the number of threads. Thankfully, once again, the thread pool executor class has got you covered. When creating your thread pool, you can specify the number of initial threads and the number of maximum threads. As the workload in the thread pool changes, it'll scale the number of alive threads to match. Oh, and a uh, quick note, the value returned from get available processors may not reflect the number of physical cores in the device. Now, see, some devices have CPUs that will deactivate one or more cores depending on the system load to save battery. So if your device has two CPUs, but one of them is asleep, this value could return one. And of course, thread pools won't solve all of your threading problems. As mentioned earlier, unless you're dealing with lots and lots of work packets all the time, this thing's kind of overkill. It's best to use things like handler threads or async task loaders for specific types of work blocks and only throw the massive computing problems at the thread pool. And for you power users out there, remember that render script might be a better alternative to large scale parallel work on Android devices, but that's a whole separate set of videos that we haven't gotten into yet. And don't forget that SysTrace is an amazingly powerful tool that lets you visualize how work is flowing through the threads in your application. It's a great way to validate that things are working as intended and also see all the other crazy threads that are being worked on by other parts of your app. And that's the trick with performance, isn't it? I mean, you can make assumptions, but things don't always work the way you think, which is why you need to check out the rest of the Android performance patterns videos. And don't forget to join our Google Plus community to ask a lot of hard threading questions as well. So keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right? And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. That could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah. And it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of 
just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance with Service Worker to then use the AppShell model. And if you are using the AppShell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good, we've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paint on repeat visits. Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server-side rendering has on this, uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the AppShell model in mind, with server-side rendering in mind, you will get like, a really good first paint, even in like, Safari and um, like, mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have Service Worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, OK, well, should I be using the application shell model on all of my applications? Um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This, this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know, a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox. and It's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know, we, we way too much to explain in just one video, but we wrote up uh, a pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up, and I just read it. So you you just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how I wrote Pretty much. <laughs> Impact. Um, that's worth checking out. That's the format of this It's a mediocre ID. article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out, yep. learn more about AppShell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yep. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like, really quickly um, that we're working on. So go check that out. Yeah, build a weather app.
please take your seats. The program will begin shortly. Welcome to the 2016 Google Play Awards. Please welcome Purnima Kochikar, Head of Apps and Games BD, Google Play. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Welcome to the first ever Google Play Awards. Since we announced this program about a couple weeks ago, there has been incredible excitement from the developer community and the press from all around the world. This would not be possible without you and your work. So give yourself a big round of applause. Looking back at how much we have accomplished together since, the, since we launched Google Play, it's pretty amazing. And the momentum isn't letting up. Your apps and games now reach a billion users every month through Play, and they're driving 65 billion downloads in 2015 alone. Pretty amazing, isn't it?
Each day, my team and I have the privilege of working with you to help you build successful mobile businesses. And each day, you use the platforms and tools we provide to create apps and games that amaze and inspire us. Tonight, we take the time to celebrate you and the great work you have done over the last year. Tonight, we honor 10 examples of outstanding achievement. So, let's get the show started, shall we? All right. Standout Indie. Please welcome Bob Meese, Head of Games BD, Google Play. Hi everyone, this is a, a lot of fun. What a great crowd tonight. Thank you. All right, so Indies provide fun, deep, and meaningful experiences spanning games of all genres. They prove that developers of any size can succeed on Android. I judged the first Google Play Indie Festival last month, and it reminded me how much I love games in the games industry. We're thrilled to support this community, and it's so important to us. We have the Indie Corner, which we recently launched, which is a dedicated collection of indie games that we promote on the Play Store. Let's look at the nominees. Standout indie nominees are Alpha Bear, Alto's Adventure, Fast Like a Fox. Atsume, Kitty Collector. Prune. Standout Indie. All right. All right, are you ready? The winner of the first ever Google Play Award is Alpha Bear. of Google Play Game Services. All right, great. All right, for the next award. So Google Play Game Services fuel increased competition on Google Play that help create a great community of gamers. With features like multiplayer and leaderboards, they help keep gamers engaged and keep them coming back for more. All of the nominees in this category integrated multiple Google Play game features that enhance the overall user experience. Let's take a look at the nominees. Best use of Google Play game services nominees are Sea Battle 2, Table Tennis Touch, Tap Ventures. Power Madness 2. Zombie Highway 2. Best 
first use of Google Play game services. All right. For the next one, applause for all the nominees. All right, cool. And the winner is Table Tennis Touch. of material design. Please welcome Larissa Fontaine, Head of Apps BD, Google Play. So having recently finished a home improvement project, I used even more new apps than I usually do, which is kind of a lot. And it was incredible that with the adoption of material design, how quickly I was able to navigate and find recommendations and ideas in well-designed apps. They were enjoyable, intuitive, and helped me find exactly what I was looking for without having to hunt and peck. And it's not just home improvement apps. Over one million apps have adopted material design elements in just the last two years since we announced them. This year's nominees represent first-class material design implementations across many categories. And the nominees are... Best use of material design nominees are... Bring. Fabulous. Robin Hood. To Doist. Vivo. Best use of material design. And the winner is. Robin Hood. Startup. I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> Similar to our focus on indies, this year we're putting startup developers front and center. And as we've talked about a couple times over the last two days, we've launched an early access program for apps that are still in beta to connect developers with a community of early adopters to get great feedback early in your development. We are consistently amazed with the incredible funnel of fresh and unique experiences coming from lean teams. And this group of nominees represent incredible startups from across the ecosystem. And the nominees are... Standout startup nominees are... Dub Smash. Musically. Robin Hood.
verse. Standout Startup. And the winner is Hopper. Families app. Please welcome Ben Galbraith, Head of Developer Relations, Developer Product Group. Last May, we launched a dedicated family section in the Play Store. We did this to help developers surface their apps and games to parents and to provide a unique discovery experience based on age and popular characters. As the father of eight young children, all one wife, all one at a time, this section <laughs> is enormously popular in our household. We love these apps. Let's take a look at the nominees. Best Families app nominees are Card Wars Adventure Time, Lego Jurassic World, My Very Hungry Caterpillar. Think Rolls 2. Toka Nature. Best Families App. And the winner is... Think Rolls 2. The most innovative category highlights the apps and games that bring the wow moments, that demonstrate something truly new and unique. Now this could, form, this could come in the form of new controls for a game based on the latest sensors, or it could be deep personalization that gives you an intimate, emotional connection to the experience. In whatever form it comes, innovation can transform something ordinary into something immersive all on a mobile device that fits in the palm of your hand. And the nominees are? Most innovative nominees are Fabulous Fast Like a Fox New York Times VR News. This War of Mine. Most Innovative. The winner is New York Times VR. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Early adopter. Please welcome Samir Samat, VP, Product Management, Google Play. I, I'm, I'm, I'm only realizing now that many of you did not get the memo on the appropriate dress code for this evening's attire, uh, and, and you're forgiven, however. Uh, but I wanted to look my best in honor of some of the greatest developers in the world. Uh, and, and <laughs> one, of my, one of the favorite parts of my job is watching developers take a new design or a nascent technology and create experiences that are truly changing people's lives. The apps and the games that they create offer a service piece of functionality or an entirely new experience that is truly inspiring and amazing. Being an early adopter is really hard. It means challenging the status quo. It means pushing your team in different directions. These are all things that we at Google truly admire in this year's nominees. Let's take a look. Early adopter nominees are Glide. Mechanic Escape Minecraft Story Mode World Around Me Sumper Adopter. And the winner this year in the early adopter category is World Around Me. Given how popular Android devices are around the world, we often get asked by developers, how do I make a successful entrance into a new market? And many people think that localizing an app just means taking the app from one language to another. But it's so much more than that. For an app to feel truly successful in a different country, users there need to believe that it was built for them. This is all about colors and character choices and contextual relevance as well as language. It's really hard to do. And so this year we wanted to honor a set of developers that exemplify what great localization looks like. And the nominees are, let's take a look. Go Global nominees are Dragon Ball Z Dokken Battle. Freeletics Bodyweight. Memrise. Music Smash. Pokemon Shuffle Mobile. Go Global. And the winner this year in the Go Global category Pokemon Shuffle Mobile.
please welcome Jamie Rosenberg, VP Google Play. Hi, everyone. It's incredibly humbling, just looking out at this room, it's incredibly humbling as a reminder to see how far our Android developer community has come since we first launched the platform back in 2008. We're now at the final two award categories of the night, best app and best game. The nominees in these categories are true examples of the amazing work being done by all of you and our Android developers all over the world. First, the award for best app. Whether you're looking for a recipe, ideas for a home remodel, or ways to stay informed or entertained, the nominees in this category make your day more productive and more fun. They serve their users in different ways, but what they all have in common is great design, intuitive user experience, and broad appeal. Let's take a look at the nominees for best app. Best app nominees are BuzzFeed News, Colorfy, for best app is House. Best game. I'll have to try that one at home later. <laughs> so this year's nominees for best game give everyone a reason to be a gamer. From big screen characters to small screen heroes, from puzzles to clans to battles. These nominees connect and delight users everywhere and they're also a ton of fun. They also tend to showcase the very best of what an Android device can do. So let's take a look at the nominees for best game. Best game nominees are Alpha Bear, Clash of Kings, Clash Royale. Marvel Future Fight. Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. Best Game. And the winner of the Google Play Award for Best Game is Clash Royale. <laughs> Please 
welcome back to the stage, Purnima Kochikar. All right, one more huge round of applause for all the nominees and the winners, please. Make some noise. With so many amazing apps and games, it was an extremely difficult task for the panel to pick the nominees and the winners. Thank you for constantly pushing the boundaries to show us what's possible. I hope you had a good time tonight. Yeah. Oh. And I hope you're energized to go out and use the new tools and features that we announced all through I.O. to create new apps and games. <laughs> My team and I are eagerly waiting to see what you will create next. It's constantly, we are constantly amazed, and it's what makes our jobs fun every day. But first, it's time to go out and have some fun. Please join us for after hours happening all around the venue. Good night, and thank you.